Mayor Savage, the meeting is streaming. You can call the meeting to order on your call. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you all. It is uh, May the 3rd, and we are beginning our uh, council meeting right now. I would first like to acknowledge that we're in Mi'kma'ki, the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people, um, and the Peace and Friendship Treaties signed uh, centuries ago are important today, and we honor those. We are all treaty people. I'd like to just make sure we have everybody from council that we need. I'll begin today with the Deputy Mayor. Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Hi, good afternoon. Coming to you live from, uh, I'm here at City Hall. All right. Councillor Deagle Gammon. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, colleagues, staff, members of the public that are here, all set. Good stuff. Councillor Hensby. Councillor Hensby with us. Maybe he's making his way back from something. Yeah. Councillor Kent. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I am here and ready to do. Awesome. Councillor Purdy, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Good to see you. Councillor Austin. I'm here, Mr. Mayor, ready to go. Awesome. Councillor Mancini. Afternoon, Mr. Mayor and colleagues. Uh, let's get her going. Councillor Mason. Hello, good morning, colleagues, Mr. Mayor. Ready to get going. Awesome. Councillor Smith. Hello, colleagues, Mayor. Happy to be here, here from District 8. All right. Councillor Cleary. Good morning, uh, Your Worship. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, staff and public. Uh, ready to go. All right. Yes, good morning to you, too, at 2 o'clock. Councillor Morse. Good afternoon, everyone. Ready to go from Clayton Park. Thank you. Great. Councillor Cuddle. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, here at City Hall representing District 11. Very well. Councillor Stoddard. Sorry about that. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor. Sitting in District 12. Ready to go. Thank you. All right. Councillor Blackburn. Hello, good afternoon, everybody from uh, beautiful, sunny District 14. Councillor Russell. Uh, good afternoon, everyone uh, representing Lower Sackville, but coming to you live from my personal office here at uh, Council Chambers. Thank you. Councillor Outfit. All from sunny Bedford Whitworth. All right. We have our CAO back with us, Councillor uh, Mr. Dubay. Good afternoon to you. Right. Councillor Hensby, thank you. Uh, CAO, uh, Mr. Traves in the legal seat. We see you. All right. Okay, folks, so we have a treat, first of all, um, and that is to have a special presentation from our poet laureate. So uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Sue with us. And uh, Sue Goyette is the poet laureate for the Halifax Regional Municipality. Thank you for uh, joining us again. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. I will turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Mayor Savage. And hello, everyone. I'm in the beautiful province of Quebec visiting my elderly mom who's in the hospital. And it's uh, a privilege to see all your faces. I have written a poem especially this day and for this season called the future season wintering to green and i thank you in advance for listening with your open hearts thank you here we are in a field of long grass that has passed its first yellow and before the new green of the original recharge the season's gorse is cleaning our hearts of snowdrifts we recognize this melt as renewal Somewhere online, we're shown to cut milk cartons for milkweed seeds that need to be put outside to vernalize. The seeds must be free of the white silk called the coma. Does any of this sound familiar? The chaos is real and the heartbreak and the deep grief for a planet worn out by mistrust and more money. If blown on softly, green pushes past itself. This idea of pushing past ourselves is terrifying. 
Failure has so many sharp clamps and fear so many unsheathed shadows. A fleet of imperious clouds claiming the right of way moved in front of our sun. The cold and dismal loneliness for its easy warmth is one way to describe this time. It's remarkable that green isn't tired or hasn't run out of sap. That its radiance remains potent and is pushing past itself. Gertrude Stein named this reiteration of pushing past itself, not repetition, but insistence. In other words, this poem is insisting on moving past its ordinary self for this extraordinary time. The chaos, it is stunning how real the green remains, how it moves past itself, a blossom unfurled, and yet so full of potential it can imagine itself into apple or pear. A poem pushing past itself can become a mirror we can lean into so close we fog its words with our breath. It can invite us to free ourselves from the soft silk called the coma and describe the cold we've been in, we've been germinating in. This vernalization accelerates flowering. In a close enough future, a bear will sit beneath an apple tree this poem grew. It will occasionally bump the tree when it needs more apples. This will mark the beginning of a new and lasting season, a season when everyone has enough of what they need. This, of course, is a metaphor, and the legacy of this abundance for everyone is a translation of green, greening into the action this poem is asking you to grow into. The season we are in now, of course, is a sort of COVID cocoon. Cocoons, as you know, are filled with imaginal cells, meaning we could be transforming into anything. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you very much. We wish you the best in uh, Quebec with your mother and uh, best wishes with all your family. And thank you for that uh, beautiful poem. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day, everyone. All right. That's a pretty good scene set of folks. So um, I will see if we have anybody with community announcements and acknowledgements. Councillor Purdy. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and colleagues. And um, just sporting. Um, Councillor Hensby gave me this Crosby uh, jersey because I guess it's the uh, playoffs for the NHL this week. And our favorite son of Cole Harbor, Sidney Crosby, there is playing this week. So I uh, just want to give a shout out to him and his team, the Pittsburgh Penguins. And also, I would like to uh, also talk about two things coming up in District 4 this month, May 10th at one o'clock at the Coal Harbor Fire Hall for all seniors. We have uh, MLA, Laura Lee Nickel and I are co-hosting a senior tea for our seniors. And we are going to have a Sandra Paris, the RCMP officer, talk about senior fraud safety, which is a very pertinent topic nowadays. So uh, we'll be serving some muffins and tea and coffee. And we're just really looking forward to seeing all our seniors come out and get some really good information. On Saturday, May 14th, we are hosting a community cleanup competition. So we have five locations across District 4, and we are competing to see who can clean up the most garbage. And there's going to be little prizes. I'll be going around handing out water. I've got little grabbers that I can share, too, which is much easier on the back. So if you're interested, contact me. I'll get you set up in one of the groups. And uh, just looking forward to a good May. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I am pleased to um, share with folks that might be interested that on May the 8th, that's this, uh, this Sunday, we will be hosting here in Eastern Passage a really a huge community cleanup um, in partnership with uh, Scotia Shoreline, uh, Scotian Shores. Angela Riley is a, is a a dynamo when it comes to uh, shoreline cleanups, but it'll be all throughout the uh, the district. I also want to share as well that I'll be hosting a, a seniors tea that will be at Horizon Recreation Center on May the 18th, and uh, they can look in the beacon or see some of the notices around uh, for more information on that. And last but not least, um, want to make sure that my mom uh, knows that 
I wish her a happy Mother's Day. It's my goal to get down there, but I may not get there on Mother's Day. And happy Mother's Day to everyone out there who has that privilege and honor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hensby. Well, first, first of all, Councillor can't beat me to the Mother's Day wishes. So happy Mother's Day, Mom, and to all mothers out there. Uh, this is also environment. This is also emergency preparedness week. So I want to encourage everybody to be uh, ready for the upcoming storm weather from hurricane season from June to December. So get prepared. Look for emergency preparedness tips on our website. Also, this Saturday, the 7th of uh, May, there's going to be a joint emergency management jamboree at the Fortis Lake Shopping Center uh, from 10 o'clock till uh, 1, in regards to all of our, surf our first responders and the community emer emergency management. So come on out to uh, get some information from our first responders. Uh, also, coming up on May the 7th, Lake Echo Alliance are, are doing a community cleanup. The Lake Echo area. So, if anybody wants to participate, please contact Lake Echo Alliance and meet them at the community center at nine o'clock. And on the following Saturday, May the fourteenth, is going to be uh, a, a beach cleanup at Marconi Beach, starting at uh, ten o'clock until noon. So you can register at down of the Hellnex Surf School just before Martinique Beach for that. And uh, and let's go Bruins! Let's cheer on Brad Marsh on the Boston Bruins in the Stanley Cup uh, race this year. Thank you. A point of order, uh, Mr. Mayor? No, it's not a point of order. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Russell, we're not going to get into NHL debates. Councillor Russell. Uh, thank you very much. I, uh, I did enjoy the, uh, the first game last night wearing my Sackle Flyers uh, jersey. So I do appreciate, uh, do appreciate the, the effort that uh, the Toronto put in despite the result. Um, this weekend is uh, there are two interesting things happening in, in Lower Sackville. The first one is that the Sackville Rivers Association is having their annual spring duck run on Saturday. Uh, there is still an opportunity to uh, to sponsor a duck or a quack pack, um, either personally or corporately. So uh, you can visit uh, sackvillerivers.ns.ca for more information on that. I look forward to seeing you on Saturday. Um, uh, at, the, uh, at their duck run on Saturday, also a little bit later on, Sakawa has built a, a new uh, clubhouse on the shores of First Lake and they are having their grand reopening. Um, I'm planning on being there and, and I uh, look forward to, to seeing you there as well. It, uh, it should be a, a really good time. Uh, the building is a phenomenal location. Half of it is, is built for uh, training of the kids who are training there. And the other half is a community center. The top half is the community center uh, with the best view of First Lake that's available. Um, on May 11th, there is a joint AGM. The Friends of First Lake and the Sackville Lakes Park and Trails Association is having uh, their joint AGM. Our own Emma Wati, our water quality uh, expert, is going to be there as the guest speaker. So I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing Emma at, uh, at that joint AGM. And uh, sort of a sad, sort of a happy note, uh, I have previously been talking about there being 17 apartment buildings that are under some stage of development or, or uh, uh, planning in Lower Sackville. That number is now down to 16 because one of them was completed and opened on April 1st. Uh, so we now have a brand new apartment building open. Um, the bad news is that as soon as it opened, it filled up. There is one vacancy left, as I understand it. And if you are interested in an apartment in Lower Sackville, that one is available uh, at Murex Realty, M-U-R-E-X Realty .ca, $1,200 for a single bedroom apartment, uh, lower than the average in HRM. Uh, and that is what I have for today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. I would just like to wish Quentin Hill a great first week as our council support manager here at City Hall. Um, he's been my council uh, coordinator since uh, I first started here in 2020, and uh, I'm happy to share him uh, with all the other councillors and I look forward to a new uh, council coordinator uh, coming on board very shortly. I'd also like to wish my mama a happy Mother's Day. She's uh, in uh, East Hans, and so have a great one, mom. And hey, happy Mother's Day to all of the moms, all the stepmoms and the grandmothers, the aunts. I mean, 
I'm just so happy. I love Mother's Day, mostly because I get flowers, but <laughs> and chocolate. Um, want to let everybody know that Hubbard's Farm Market is going to open, yay, this Saturday. So that's May 7th. Looking forward to that. May 28th, we've got the Bay Expo happening this year. So happy to finally have that back up and running. Usually have about 500 people that come out. We'll be at the Estabrook Center this year, May 28th, starting at 11 o'clock. And also just to, uh, I wanted to thank everybody for um, getting out there and pitching in and cleaning up our communities. The community cleanups, there have been so many and everyone's out there doing such a great job. So thank you so much to our community members, but also to HRM staff who are also pitching in and, and helping helping um, to make sure that uh, the garbage is getting picked up. And so I just want to give a shout out to our solid waste folks. And the last thing I want to mention is I'm going to be holding a community meeting in Hubbard's with our parks and recreation staff and invite folks to come out to the shore club, seven o'clock. Uh, we're looking forward to having a conversation about all the great things and recreation activities and parks and um, all, all everything park and recreation related in Hubbard. So look forward to seeing you all there on May 30th at the shore club. Thanks so much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, yes, continuing the uh, busy Saturday in Lower Sackville in between the uh, uh, the uh, duck run and the grand opening of uh, Sakawa, I'm going to be out at the uh, Berry Hill Community Cleanup. It starts at 1030 in the morning and uh, everybody is going to uh, meet at Lori Lively Park, get our supplies and then meet back at uh, one o'clock for a pizza party. So uh, thank, to, thank you so much to the uh, great community neighbors there that have set this up and uh, to uh, the local businesses that have provided uh, some prizing as well for the participants. Looking forward to seeing you on Saturday morning out in Berry Hill. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Diego Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, this Thursday, May 6th, a very gentlemanly uh, MLA, Larry Harrison and I are going to be at the Myers Grant uh, Community Hall and we're gonna have a pizza party and a conversation with youth around the role of politicians and what that means in the world. And we're gonna get grilled by 10, eight year olds up to about 12 year olds. So I can't wait for that to happen. And then on Saturday evening, there's a student production of the Adams Family happening at the Muscadabit Valley Bicentennial Theater. So uh, the mayor and I are gonna be in attendance. So hopefully people might uh, come out and say hello and support the youth. Um, it's lovely to have the musical back. And so we're all happy for that. Happy Mother's Day, oh my goodness, to all those in this world and to those who have left who are always in our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I know something would be uh, dreadfully wrong if my mother uh, broke her streak and was watching council right now. So I won't say anything uh, nice to my mom, but to all the other mothers who may be watching, uh, happy Mother's Day. Uh, Spencer House Senior Center will be hosting on Friday, May 6th, a uh, Mother's Day uh, celebration, 10 a.m. You can come with your mother or si significant mothering figure by and uh, share with them some of your best memories. Uh, there'll be Mother's Day lunch at noon, a raffle at 12 30 and 1 p.m uh live music with tony quinn you can call the center to reserve your spot 421-6131 that's 902-421-6131 also a reminder the spencer house annual general meeting is tomorrow wednesday at 1 p.m uh you have to uh register in advance to attend uh that's so that's may 4th 1 p.m uh the uh, spencer house annual general meeting again call 902-421-6131 to register thank you mr mayor Thank you, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, two quick announcements. One, as Councillor Mason said, I, I, I will give my mom a shout out as well, but I know that she is not watching Council. She's probably, she's probably processing many of your travel claims at the moment. So if you do get an email from, from Mary Smith telling, her to, telling you to process your travel claims, just tell her that Councillor Smith said you don't have to. And I also want to give a quick uh, thank you to Mustafa uh, and Tebi, who is actually one of the recipients for our volunteer award, uh, and, his, and his sons and his family who volunteer at the mobile food market. They invited me to uh, enjoy Eid with them last night at their home. And uh, it was a, a great evening to spend time with them and their family. Uh, they came to Canada in 2016 and moved in the district about a year and a half ago. And Mr. Mayor, one of his daughters, her dream is to become the Prime Minister of Canada. 
so that we can welcome more people from around the world into Canada. And what she asked is, is for her birthday, which is on Wednesday, that uh, she could meet the prime minister. And I told her, well, we probably can't make it happen on Wednesday, but I know some friends who, if he comes in town, will most likely be able to uh, get you a little handshake. So we'll keep that in, in your back pocket for, for future visits if, if you do have the prime minister in town. Good idea. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Outhit. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, last weekend, the Bedford Residents Association, and I was happy to please to, to uh, participate in it. I did our cleanup along the Bedford Highway. Uh, West Bedford had their great West Bedford uh, cleanup, and the Peerless Subdivision also had their cleanup. So I'm very uh, appreciative to all those folks who got together to make uh, District 16 look a little better. And just letting folks know that behind the scenes, Bedford Days Committee is working very hard to back to uh, a full in-person Bedford Days this year in Rouge and Blanc, and that uh, schedule will be coming to folks shortly in my newsletter. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cuttle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, yeah, I'd like to give a shout out to all the community groups that are organizing cleanups this month. Um, it feels like there's a cleanup every day for every every day of the weekend from now until June. And um, it makes a real difference in our communities. And I, I wanna say thank you. Um, I also wanna let everybody know that the Graves Oakley Rugby Clubhouse is having its official opening on Thursday, May 5th this week. This project has been a long time coming. It's at Graves Oakley Park in Spryfield. Um, it's the largest football club in Atlantic Canada. There's men's teams, women's teams, um, there's mini teams and youth rugby teams. So if anybody is interested in getting involved in, in rugby, um, this is an excellent place to, you know, check out the programs and what they have on offer. And I also want to thank all the sponsors and volunteers that made this project possible and invite everybody out to Spryfield to visit the Graves Oakley Rugby, Tars Rugby Clubhouse. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, thank you. I'll just mention a couple of things. Uh, the deputy mayor and I were at an event on uh, Sunday to kick off Asian Heritage Month in uh, HRM, and it was fabulous. The, our folks at HRM were involved in the organization of it, and uh, we welcome many people uh, of Asian heritage to our community. It's a very good story, but let's not forget that we have had uh, people come to our executive committee in recent months to talk about the rise of anti-Asian uh, sentiment and hate in our community. So we need to be sure that we are vigilant for that. And May being Asian Heritage Month would be a good month for us all to recognize and um, uh, support our residents of Asian heritage. I also want to acknowledge our friends um, in the Muslim community and the Islamic community uh, and the end of uh, Ramadan. Councillor Smith mentioned uh, a need celebration. I was at the uh, Uma Majid Mosque, uh, uh, yesterday there was thousands of people, thousands of people uh, out to uh, commemorate a nice afternoon and um, the breaking of the fast. It was very nice. So, and the other thing I'll mention is I'll be in Fredericton on uh, Thursday of this week because folks, that's where the East Coast Music Awards are and next year we're having them. So they're handing off the blue guitar to the next city, blue guitar. Uh, so I'll be there to take that from Mayor Kate in uh, Fredericton, and then Friday is the diff uh, different stage of different state of mind, which is uh, the mental health fundraiser. Uh, and we all appreciate Star Cunningham, who has come to our volunteer uh, recognition, like last week, uh, and uh, she'll be out in full force with her folks on that, raising money uh, for mental health. So, okay, there's a lot going on in the uh, community. Paul, uh, sorry, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for, uh, for mentioning the ECMAs. I just wanted to point out that Brad Reed is a uh, Lower Sackville native. Uh, and uh, uh, he is nominated for one of the ECMA awards. And I just want to wish all of the best uh, to Brad Reed. Uh, he is phenomenal. He plays basically every instrument that is known to man. Um, there might be a few that he doesn't, uh, but if you hold an instrument up to him, I have no doubt that he would be able to play it. He is absolutely fantastic. Best of luck, Brad. 
Thank you for that, uh, Councillor uh, Russell. Uh, okay, colleagues, the approval of the minutes is next. Budget Committee of April the 12th, Regional Council of April 5th and 12th, and the April 12th public hearing. Does somebody want to gulp all that? Please so move. I can move all of that. Move I by Councillor second Stoddard, seconded by Councillor Russell. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Carried. Okay, let's go to the approval of order of business. Um, Mr. Clerk, um, why don't you lead us off here? There are two added items from the clerk's office today. Information item 11, Proclamation Health and Safety Week, May 1 to 7, 2022. And an in-camera item, private and confidential in-camera report, legal advice. And uh, Ian, we have uh, talked about making uh, an item a committee of the whole discussion. Can we reference that here? That would be 15.1.9. That is correct, Mayor Savage. We do have a motion prepared that will allow for committee of the whole rules for the purposes of debate only for item 15.1.9. Uh, we can provide that wording of that motion when we get to that item. Counts, thank you very much. Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I would like to um, take information item number seven, please. Uh, put that forward to a future meeting. Okay. Thank you. That will be done. Does somebody want to... Oh, may, may I also, please? If, yeah, if it's consent agenda, we'll get to the consent agenda in a minute. No, no, it's okay. actually just an information item. Okay. I, I would like to move that uh, information item number nine, flood mitigation near John Stewart and Arklow Drive, Coal Harbor, be added to the next agenda, please. Okay. So that's an information item, uh, Councillor? Yes, it is. Number nine. Okay. Thank you. It will be done. <laughs> Anybody else? Does somebody want to move the order of business as amended? So moved, Mr. Mayor. Deputy Mayor. Seconded. Second. Councillor Kent. Yes. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. All right, consent agenda. Uh, we've had a couple of people indicate 15.1.7. Uh, Councillor Purdy and Councillor and the Deputy Mayor have both indicated the National Disaster Mitigation Plan will come off consent and put on the regular agenda. Is there anybody else? Does somebody want to move the consent agenda as amended? I so move. Moved by Second. Councillor Blackburn, seconded by Councillor Cuddle. Okay, then we will have a vote on this. On the consent agenda, beginning with District 6, Councillor Mancini. Uh, I approve. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. And Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Councillor Outhit. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. In favor. One, Councillor Dick Gavin. Voting in favor. Two, Councillor Hensby. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. And five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Thank you. Thank you, that, that carries. Uh, Ian, if I could, we, we had talked about perhaps on the agenda moving 15.1.9 to the end of the agenda uh, so that we can do all the other items first uh, and not go in and out of committee of the whole. Is it, can we still do that? 
Yeah, that will be fine. So we will just do a procedural motion to move uh, items 15.2.1, 15.2.2, 15.3.1, 15.4.1 uh, up ahead of that. Is the intention to do that before the in-camera items or after the in-camera items? I think we would do the uh, public uh, items and then committee of the whole and then go in camera would be my sense. When we get to that item, we'll provide, we'll do a procedural motion to move those items forward. Okay, but that would be the plan, colleagues, that we're going to, because we're looking to do committee of the whole on 1519, that we'll commence with the, and finish with the rest of the agenda. Is everybody okay with that? Sounds good. Okay. Business arising out of the minutes. I'll call for declarations. Oh, sorry. I'll just read what was uh, passed on consent. Um, 15 one four was an award, an RFP, insurance broker and insurance renewal. Passed on consent. 1515 is an increase the contract for the beautiful Graham's Grove washroom facility. Passed on consent. 1518 increase to the contract for the Lady Hammond Bridge construction. And 1521 from Audit and Finance is an increase to a project on the Woodside Ferry Terminal. Those are passed on consent. I'll call for declarations of conflict of interest. We have no motions of reconsideration or rescission. Consideration of deferred business, none. Tabled matters, none. We have no public hearings today. Correspondence, Mr. Clark. Correspondence has been received for items 15.16, 15.1.7, and 15.1.9. All correspondence has been distributed to all members of council. Thank you. Petitions, Councillor Stoddard. Hi. I have a petition, um, but staff was going to give me the re re -word, sorry, rewording of the petition. Wondering if we just uh, postpone this for a moment and I'll come back to it. Okay. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor, have you got a petition? Or? I do, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, so I would like to uh, table this peti petition on behalf of residents uh, entitled Change the Name of Coon Pond with 87 signatures. Now, this petition, which has been uh, delivered to the clerk's office, uh, came, it started from community members in Westwood and Upper Ten Talon, where Coon Pond resides. Uh, the community members in Upper uh, Hammonds Plains have noted uh, that this has been uh, uh, worrisome and troubling for them due to the um, historic racism within the community. I want to thank the staff at Halifax Archives for going back into the archives and looking at uh, previous uh, county minutes, which uh, indicated um, the origins of the name as being racist. And so, Mr. Mayor, I wish to put forward a motion um, for consideration that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrative Officer to provide a staff report to rename the body of water <laughs> currently known as Coon Pond in Westwood Hills subdivision in Upper Ten Talon, Nova Scotia. The report should include the necessary steps to follow the name change process of a provincial body of water with the province of Nova Scotia. I so move. Second. Thank you Second so by, much. Second by Councillor Mason. Thank you. I, I don't have uh, much more to say to that, but uh, you know, I, I look forward to uh, moving forward with community consultation led by the province of Nova Scotia to do a renaming of this pond and this body of water. Thank you. Thank you. That motion is on the floor. Are we ready for the question on that? <laughs> question. question. Okay, Ian. Beginning with District 7, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Clary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. Thirteen, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. Fourteen, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. Fifteen, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Councillor Oathead. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. 
Yes. One, Councilor Dagle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councilor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councilor Kent. In favor. Four, Councilor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councilor Austin. In favor. And six, Councilor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. Thank you. Terry, thank you. Councilor Stoddard, did you uh, have a petition? I do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do not have a petition for today. Uh, I might have one coming up in a future council meeting, uh, but there's nothing for today. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. We will move to 14.1. Uh, this is an informational item brought forward from April 12th. And this uh, was in the name of Councillor Mancini, the cost model and business case for Sobering Center. Councillor Mancini. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think it's actually uh, the mobile shower pilot one for it's today. The showers. Showers. And that's uh, the sobering center is for the next meeting. That's what's on the agenda. That's what I was prepared to discuss. Okay. Mobile shower pilot. 14.1 okay. mobile shower pilot, purchase of truck and shower trailer. Okay. Now we've got a mix up here then. 14.1, Councillor Mancini, mobile shower pilots. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and colleagues. Uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge and thank the, our staff that worked on this pilot project, along with the uh, amazing folks at uh, Mainland, Mainline uh, Needle Exchange. So my motion was, uh, in considering and, and interesting because later on in today's agenda, we have a very important item we're going to be discussing around homelessness. And so I brought forward a motion on piling a mobile shower program. Uh, I uh, witnessed this program in some other municipalities across the country in North America. And so the intent was to have a vehicle that would pull mobile showers and, and bring it to people where people are living rough and giving them an opportunity to uh, uh, do something as basic uh, that we all take for granted, uh, having a nice hot shower. Uh, so we had some complications in that because we couldn't get the mobile piece figured out. So what we ended up doing was uh, renting uh, a, a mobile sh uh, shower trailer that stayed in one spot. We chose the field next to the Dartmouth Village Library. So, you know, the pilot really didn't work out. We didn't get uh, many people, a lot of reasons. If you read the report, uh, the fact that we couldn't bring it to where the people were, the wintertime was a challenge. There was issues of privacy because it was an open field next to a library. People didn't feel uncomfortable not being able to transport people to the showers. Um, you know, and the recommendations are obvious then, you know, better communications. Uh, maybe the winter is not the greatest time to do the mobile shower, uh, bringing it to where the people are. And the biggest recommendation is rather the mobile shower as things stand today, maybe we should be using a brick and mortar building like our community centers and such that are, are some are, are available. But I understand also it was during the, the middle of our pandemic and not all of our uh, community centers were, uh, rec centers were open at, at the time. So the reason I've asked to bring this forward, because I think it may have some relevance to our discussion later on when we talk about the homeless crisis and uh, talking about uh, some of our uh, our, uh, our uh, municipal um, uh, campgrounds or, or parks. So my question for staff, uh, if they're here online, I'm not sure who's online here, if you could speak to the, uh, I see Scott's there, uh, if you could speak to the ability, do we have the ability or, uh, to truly have a mobile shower unit as I just described? I think the complication that we had was uh, water hookup uh, at the time, but uh, they do exist in other municipalities. And I still wasn't clear on why we couldn't have the trailer literally pulled up with water on site to be able to offer it. So, because I'm thinking about our conversation later on when we talk about uh, our, our parks and the possibility of allowing uh, uh, folks that are living rough to stay in those parks. It's got to be in mind, thank you. Scott uh, Sheffield. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Uh, in answer to that question, the short answer is no. The longer answer is that our hydrants and major am discharge was referred to as gray water. Uh, and that has been used already, uh, and it's kind of reused and, and used to pipe, pipe through the hydrants, so which is fine for fighting fires, but not fine for using for showering purposes. 
So uh, because of that, the fixed location was necessary to make sure that the hookup for shower purposes was clean, sanitary water that would not have health implications for those who were using it. Well, that makes perfect sense, uh, Scott. Thank you very much. So I, I brought it forward also, of course, just to keep in mind uh, when we make our decision later on, uh, this is an important element of it, right? Uh, again, we take it for granted. We take a shower, we, we clean ourselves each day, and uh, we, we don't think about it. But for those that are living rough, that is a real challenge. So as we have those conversations, we'll keep in mind. Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Scott. Okay. Um, we'll move to item 15.1, uh, uh, which is uh, second reading proposed bylaw C1200, Commercial Development Districts, second reading. Mr. Mayor, there's a question on the floor from Councillor Tegel Gammon for the previous item. Okay. Was that on the previous question? Uh, it, it was, Mr. Mayor. Um, I may be able to ask it in, in the, um, the next item around the homelessness, but my question really quickly, and, and I apologize for not being fast enough into the chat. Um, Scott, although the, the hydrants right now have the gray water, can a mobile unit still be used and hooked up um, if there is another source? It doesn't have to be a hydrant, does it? I my understanding from previous discussions with staff who worked on it directly, I did not, was that in order to, for that to happen, it has to be tested, in which case the, the, um, the time frame in order to do that really just doesn't mix with the mobility of it. Um, so uh, from that standpoint, it, it wasn't uh, a feasible option. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. All right, Councillors. Uh, item 15.1.1, uh, uh, Commercial Development Districts, what is your wish? I'd, I'd be pleased to move it, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Mason. I move that Halifax Regional Council adopt bylaw C-1200, the Commercial Development District bylaw as set out in attachment one of the staff report dated January 26, 2022, with an effective date of April 1st, 2023. I so move. I'll second. Second. Second by... Who second? Councillor Mancini, was it? And Councillor Cuddle. Cuddle beat him by a moment Cuddle. there. Uh, I, I don't really have anything much to say on this other than uh, glad to see it moving forward. We know it's not uh, the comprehensive soup to nuts solution that we may want to have for uh, small business and business in general, but it's uh, an important tool uh, that we've been trying to get in place for a number of years. So I'm glad mm -hmm. to see this here and I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Russell. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've had a good look at this report and thought about it uh, quite a bit. Um, it calls it assessment averaging, and it isn't. Uh, it is gradually raising uh, the tax to the maximum level. Um, but in doing that, to try and keep it revenue neutral, it is making up for the tax by raising the commercial tax of everybody else. And we have estimated uh, that the commercial tax for everybody else is going to be increasing by 1.6%. When we talked about the budget uh, last month, we voted to raise the average commercial tax rate by 5.1%. And this would be adding another approximately 1.6% to it. Um, and so with that, I simply cannot support this. Um, I, I don't think it would, uh, I, I appreciate uh, what we're trying to do to, uh, to help out the businesses um, and to look for a solution. And I appreciate all of the effort that has gone into uh, generating the data and the scenarios and, and everything else related to this. Um, but with the visibility of that and the recognition that we would be negatively impacting all of the businesses in order to uh, help those businesses that are expanding. Um, I'm sorry, I just can't support this one. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, had a, I had a look at this report as well, and I'm wondering if there's someone um, from finance who might be able to talk a little bit about 
how this will be implemented at the same time as the proposed tax zones that we're, that we're working towards implementing. Um, I saw a note in there that there's the potential that these might be able to coincide. And I'm just wondering how those would work together and what the implications might be. I see we have Andre McNeil with us. I, I can take uh, the first cut at that. I don't, uh, the executive director, Mike, Jerry might want to add a little more. Andre McNeil, senior financial consultant, finance and asset management. Yeah, to your question, yes, they're both planning on, on becoming uh, active uh, April 1st, 2023. So they would both come into force at the same time. The um, one, this one deals with the assessed value. So there would be an adjustment to the assessed value of the properties. And, and that would be shown um, with the final assessment or final tax bill that goes in September. So people would get a revised assessment uh, a taxable assessment if they're in the program, they would be able to see that. That taxable assessment would then have the new rates applied to it. So this essentially is, is what um, modifies the assessment. The other is on the rates. So they're, they work separately, but they would uh, become, they would take effect at the same time. Councilor Cuddle. All right, thank you, Andre. Thank you. Okay, colleagues. Question. Ready for the question. Beginning with District 8, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Clary. Yes. And Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. Against. 16, Councillor Oathead. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councillor Dable Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting no. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. And seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. We'll go to 1512. This is second reading on a proposed bylaw respecting tax deferrals, amendment of partial tax exemption. Councillor, who would like that one? I'll take it. Councillor Purdy. I move that Halifax Regional Council adopt the amendments to Administrative Order 10, the Partial Tax Exemption Administrative Order, as set out in Attachment 2 of the Staff Report dated February 17, 2022, and to adopt Bylaw T706, amending Bylaw T700, the Tax Deferral Bylaw, as set out in Attachment 4 of the Staff Report dated February 17, 2022. So moved. I'll second. second. I'll second that. I think I heard the deputy mayor on that first. Uh, anything on it, Councillor Purdy? Well, this this is just a really good response from staff to the very real rising cost of living for all of our residents, our our tax paying residents, uh, commercial. Oh. I'm sorry, uh, residential. So uh, this 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 is necessary. We need we need to do this. People are struggling. Uh, with the rising costs of heating oil and gasoline and food and now, you know, the property taxes. Um, so this is a way to help uh, mitigate some of the risk for our lower income homeowners. And I uh, really appreciate this, uh, this report. So thank you. Thank you. Seeing nobody else, uh, Councillor Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. I just have a quick question for staff. Um, with regards to the numbers in the household, Andre, uh, you know, I'm just wondering uh, how that works uh, when we're considering a family with young children. So, you know, if we're if we're setting a bar for the number of people that are in the household, um, but you know, there's five people, but three of those are under the age of five. 
I'm just wondering, you know, where is there leniency there to recognize um, the actual individuals that are living in that home in this circumstance to be to, to receive the uh, the tax deferral and be in that program? In in this case, the uh, the amount of the deferral or the exemption it doesn't change with the size of the family. So those low income cutoffs are just used for setting the threshold. And that allows the indexing to take place because those low income cutoffs are adjusted each year by SATSCAN. So the, the uh, threshold of 43,000 that we're setting this year by linking it to the four person household next year or the year after, you can automatically increase as the cost of living goes up. So that that's the feature that the uh, low income cutoff provides. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. I just needed to uh, to clarify that if, if it was, um, if the number of persons in the household was, you know, paramount to actually, yeah, so good. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Thank you, Andre. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. 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 Beginning with District 9, Councilor Cleary. Yes. And Councilor Morse. In favor. 11, Councilor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councilor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. 16, Councilor Otet. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councilor Degliown. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councilor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councilor Kent. In favor. Four, Councilor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councilor Austin. In favor. Six, Councilor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councilor Mason. For the motion. And eight, Councilor Smith. Four. Thank you. That carries, thank you uh, very much. Colleagues, we'll go to 1513. This is Development of Friendship Accords. And uh, I will go to uh, Councillor Mason, who's been uh, very active in our relationship with the Mi'kmaq and First Nations. Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council, one, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to explore establishing friendship accords with potential Indigenous partners guided by the SETI Stronger Together Toolkit as outlined in the staff report dated February 2nd, 2022 and two, direct the chief administrative officer to return to regional council seeking a resolution committing to the process of developing a friendship accord or accords should appropriate prospective indigenous partners be identified that wish to engage in a process with Halifax Regional Municipality. I so move. Second. 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 Councillor, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Mason. Well, I also don't have a lot to say in this. Uh, I think the report outlines it, uh, you know, the need for this. The reason I moved the motion in the first place to get this ball rolling is we are engaging in meaningful ways with the uh, First Nations communities and especially our Mi'kmaq uh, partners in ways that simply weren't happening at all, uh, you know, five and 10 years ago. And though that that's happening on a level uh, where, where we're engaging, for example, we had meetings in the last couple of weeks and they're ongoing around the uh, draft uh, culture and heritage priority plan, uh, and, and a whole host of other issues from uh, having an urban reserve being built in Shannon Park lands uh, to the new reserve lands that were additional reserves or historic reserves that are being opened up in the Hammonds Plains, uh, and all, all of the things that are going on in this community. And, uh, you know, best practice that we've seen FCM has been really involved in developing these guidelines is to uh, work to develop communications pro protocols and friendship accords with uh, for nation's partners so that you have identified channels of communication about specific issues and everything isn't a scramble to figure out who we got to talk to now so i i strongly support this and i strong and i and i hope the council will support it as well thank you mr mayor thank you councillor councillor hensby i thank you much mr mayor and i'm looking forward to the report to come forward i'm kind of curious about the court or accords you know are we looking at the different territories that there may be two different bands uh, re representing areas within the municipality now, so I don't be Millbrook or Spaganagony or whatever, but kind of curious, will it just be one accord, perhaps with each uh, of the bands or perhaps with a, with a Mi'kmaq Confederation or whatever uh, organization they want to uh, identify as their lead agency? 
Um, my concern, though, in regards to this coming forward, I hope there'll be opportunities for us to have dialogue on municipal issues of interest in regards, for instance, the uh, the process now for any crown land to be transferred to a municipality must go through its First Nation consultation. Once it goes into that process, we can't ask any questions about that process in regards to what input we can have, how long will it take. Uh, we have a situation now in Sheet Harbor with the Eastern Shore Lifestyle Center facility waiting to hear on confirmation of, of the process of will the municipality have an ability to, to utilize that land or, or not. It's been now almost two years since we announced the funding for the Eastern Shore Lifestyle Center, but we still don't have a clear direction on the property yet. So this is one example I think we need to look at in regards to how can we facilitate the discussion and dialogue and also see the betterment of the communities for all communities. As I know that the Millbrook band lands that we have in the Sheet Harbor area would greatly benefit from this new facility. And I'm looking forward to those opportunities and dialogue. And I hope that this the friendship accord will help and help, help us uh, to have that open dialogue about these processes. Thank you. Thank you for that. And those I'm sure will be covered in the report if it's successful, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. I'm really pleased to see this move forward uh, with both uh, Sebek and Agadic First Nation and Acadia First Nation in Hammonds Plains and doing amazing work, uh, you know, with uh, developing um, their commercial businesses there, um, housing units. Uh, I'm really pleased with Chief Deborah Robinson and her council at Acadia First Nation and the work that they're doing with the federal government to develop a, a new shelter uh, for women, um, uh, you know, sir basically surviving uh, with their families uh, and running from domestic abuse situations. And, you know, that uh, the work that uh, Katie First Nation, that council is doing is, is extremely important. And uh, also looking forward to Speg and Akadik and, and the work that they're doing in developing um, housing units uh, for community members. I did just want to mention in the report, um, it mentions uh, Wallace Hills 14A. And while Wallace Hills, uh, you know, Indian Brook 14A is uh, the name of, uh, you know, that the federal government has, has given um, that reserve uh, land. I just wanted to note that it is in Hammonds Plains. Uh, so I just wanted to let staff know that it would be um, good to have that included in that report. Other than that, I'm just so happy to move this forward and thank you so much for your work, uh, Councillor Mason. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Beginning with District 10, Council Morse. In favor of the motion. 11, Councilor Cuddle. In favor of the motion. 12, Councilor Stoddard. Thank you, Councilor Mason. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. 16, Councilor Outhit. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. I'm voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Thank you. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. And nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Mason. The next two items have passed on consent. 1514 was an RFP for insurance broker and insurance renewal services. 1515 is the Graham's Grove washroom facility. So we will move to 15, that passed on consent. 1516 is proposed amendments to Administrative Order 16 respecting fees for the use of solid waste management facilities. Councillor Mancini, are you taking us on this? Yes, Mr. Mayor, happy to do so. I'll put the following motion on the floor that Halifax Regional Council adopt the amendments to Administrative Order 16, solid waste fees, Administrative Order, as set out attachment B of the staff report dated April 14, 2022, with an effective date of July 1st, 2022. So moved. I'll second that. Second by Councillor Cuddle, Councillor Mancini. Mr. Mayor, thank you, Councillor Cuddle. So uh, not much on this. I mean, what we're talking about here is increasing the tipping fees for 
recyclables, uh, $30 to $45 per ton, and the organics from $75 to $90 per ton. The only question I have, and if staff have considered this, is is there any unintended consequence on the commercial side from this perspective? So, for example, if there's a new uh, development that's taking place, a new apartment building that's taking place, we're very concerned, as we know, we're in a housing crisis right now, and and uh, you know the rate, the high rent that, that are going on because we don't have enough units out there to lower the rates. Is there any discussion or any thought about the, this impact, this increase in fees? We may see these prices hidden into the rent so that the owners of these buildings uh, would recover this price. Andrew Philopoulos, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Andrew Philopoulos, Director of Solid Waste Resources. Uh, through you, Mayor, to the Councillor. Um, you know, Councillor, um, I can't speak to business models and how uh, costs, commercial costs, are passed along to uh, consumers or to renters, for example. Um, what I can say is that this came about during the budget cycle. Uh, as a um, as as an under, um, these commercial tip fees have not been increased for some time. Um, the costs that we are proposing here are in line, um, or uh, more cost effective than other comparables here in the province of Nova Scotia. That that's what I can share with respect to this uh, change. It is a, an increase the cost of business for sure. Thank you. Thank you for that, Andrew. You know, Mr. Mayor and colleagues, you know, I understand the the reason to increase the tipping fees, uh, but we do have to be careful when we make these decisions, we will have an un unintended uh, consequence, but uh, I'll support the motion that's on the floor. It makes sense and we haven't done it in a while as uh, suggested by Andrew. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Russell, I saw you had, yeah, Councillor Russell. Uh, thank you very much. I simply uh, want to acknowledge uh, that this is a decision that we have effectively already made. Um, it was part of the budget adjustment list that came forward a little while ago. So we've already spoken to the finances about this uh, and this is simply formalizing that motion. So I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the report that has come forward to provide the additional information. Um, I have every intent of, of supporting it. Um, I am curious, uh, Andrew, if we have noticed any you had mentioned that it had been a while since the tipping fees had increased. Um, have we noticed any increase in illegal dumping since that has happened or uh, that, that might be able to be directly attributed to this, not trying to look forward uh, based on this, but just trying to look back? Thank, thank you. Through the mayor to the councillor, great question. Uh, back in 2017, we increased um, the commercial tip fee for recycling from no cost to $30, $35 per ton. At that time, we saw no indication of uh, any impact to illegal dumping. Um, what we're finding today with illegal dumping is we're finding um, mixed garbage, uh, which this doesn't impact. We are finding a lot of construction and demolition debris, uh, which this does not impact. And at the end of the day, these tip fees we're talking about for effectively for diversion, um, are significantly uh, cheaper uh, than for garbage. So there's still uh, a lot of incentive uh, to divert. So I don't think there's any connection here to illegal dumping. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. Again, I will be supporting this. Thank you. Councillor Cuddle, I think I missed you uh, before. I apologize. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you, Andrew. I actually did read in the report your analysis on the illegal dumping and um, that there's no uh, notable impact on that, which is which is good to know because that is a major concern whenever we um, look at having fees for disposing of garbage. Um, I also note that um, garbage uh, below a certain threshold is doesn't have a fee associated with it. Um, so I think that we need to promote that for people who are looking to dump their um, compost and their uh, waste responsibly, that, uh, that 
that message is out there that the fee is not increasing. So people do do the right thing. Um, one of the questions I have is about the commercial compost. And I'm wondering what the main industries are that produce the commercial compost. And in particular, um, in that I'm wondering where restaurants fit in and if this is going to increase the cost to uh, the average restaurant. You know, we know restaurants have, um, many of them have been particularly hard hit through COVID. And um, I, I would like to get a sense of what, what the implications um, might be on that particular segment. Thank you through the mayor to the councillor. So for the restaurant sector, um, certainly solid organic material like food waste uh, would be collected and taken to our facilities by bylaw. We have flow control on organics, but it does not impact, uh, say, for example, liquid organic waste um, that you get from the grease and the oils, uh, which is not something that uh, we regulate or, uh, or manage. So, so again, certainly, um, uh, again, I'm, I, I, I'm not, uh, I can't speak to how these um, fees will translate into increases for business, how they'll go from like the hauler, say, to a business, but it is an increase in cost. So uh, we would assume that, that some or all of these costs would be passed along. All right. Um, thank you. And uh, just in regards to, you know, the, the part around, I think it was, I'm trying to find in the report, I think it was like 50 kilograms or less. Was that was that correct? There's no fee for that. That is uh, correct for the, I believe it is for the uh, recycling facility. For the recycling facility. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, that's just something I think as a municipality, um, we need to promote. Um, as part of our anti-litter and anti-illegal dumping campaign. Um, and also just information, not just about, um, you know, the fact that there aren't fees for, you know, smaller, smaller loads under 50 kilograms, but also where, where that um, waste can go to be responsibly disposed so that people can do the, can do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sorry, just trying to get my screen up here. So, so I know it's not, you know, a massive increase and um, we did discuss this in budget, but it's, it's just one more increase for a demographic in our city. And I'm wondering what the implications would be of deferring this at this time. So deferring this motion is. Well, I think I, I think the implications are fairly clear, but I mean, Andrew, do you have a, an answer to that? Thank you, Mayor. Through you to the councillor. So I mean, the the impact is budget, right? The the impact is um is roughly uh you know two hundred forty six thousand dollars is what we've forecasted by implementing this for July first, um and so that that would be the impact, councillor. It's, it's the impact on uh, our financial bottom line by $246,000. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think I can support this right now. We're, I, I am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council. Anybody else? Ready, Councilor Clary? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just actually following up on Councillor Purdy's question. So, uh, I mean, it's not just a matter of we have a hole of about 250 grand. We would, correct me if I'm wrong, we would have to go back and, and do something else to the budget because we can't intentionally, because essentially what we did when we passed the budget was pass a balanced budget. And if we don't have a balanced budget, we're actually offside legally uh, here in Nova Scotia. Like municipalities are not allowed to budget for deficit. And so if staff could just res respond to that, like we can't just say, oh yeah, we, we put it in the budget that we would collect this, but now we're not going to. We would actually 
correct me if I'm wrong, have to go back and redo the budget to fill in the hole to get to balance. I see Jerry has popped up. This is a budget question and he is the king of the budget. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Jerry Blackwood, CFO. Uh, yeah, to uh, Councillor Cleary's question. <clears throat> yeah, the, the fee increases were approved uh, per the budget that was, uh, that was uh, passed on April 12th. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, this is basically the housekeeping, the administrative piece to enact the fees that they they come into force, and uh, then we would collect the fees on them to to make our budget. Uh, if we deferred this, um, we would be you know we would be in a deficit position uh, with respect to our budget on uh, on solid waste fees. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Mayor. Okay, colleagues, you ready for the question? Question. Question. Beginning with District 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Councillor Oathit. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councillor David Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Permanent. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting no. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. A voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Clary. Yes. And 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. Thank you. Motion carries. Item 1517 was taken off consent. Um, it is the National Disaster Mitigation Plan, flood risk. Um, and uh, Deputy Mayor, you indicated First, I think you wanted to take it off. Do you wish to uh, put it on and speak to us? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council one, approve the draft guiding principles and cost sharing mechanisms set forth in staff report dated January 19th, 2022, as the basis for addressing the municipality's responsibility with respect to stormwater management projects. Two, direct the chief administrative officer to negotiate with Halifax Water to include the draft guiding principles and cost sharing mechanisms in a future formalized relationship document between the municipality and Halifax Water. Three, direct the chief administrative officer to develop an implementation plan for the 10 national disaster mitigation program projects set forth in the discussion section of the staff report dated January 19th, 2022, which considers opportunities within HRM Street Recapitalization Program, Halifax and the Halifax Water Capital Plan. Second. Awesome. Thank you so much, Councillor Blackburn. So uh, thank you, staff, uh, for bringing this forward. Um, I, I have a number of questions. And I think, you know, primarily, uh, I, I was just wondering uh, how we came about the 10 sites. And what are we going to do about the other um, 20 sites and whether or not there is a plan to incorporate those 20 sites um, into a uh, capital plan in the future. Um, the other thing I'm wondering is, you know, what is the timeline? Uh, because when it says a, you know, a, a future uh, agreement, I'm wondering how do, what, what kind of a process do we have, number one, to reach that agreement? What are our expectations to get uh, to that agreement and actually have that future formalized relationship with Halifax Water. We know it's taken uh, seven years now to get us to the point where we understand just ditch maintenance. So, you know, I, I, I recognize that this is cumbersome, that it's complex, uh, but I do think that uh, folks need to have a, a better understanding of what that timeline expectation is, um, as well as the fact that, you know, the, the work that we're doing with the AAA um, pathways is, is really important 
um, connectivity work. And so, you know, it, it, it's hand in hand when we see some of this work that's going to take place from a, from a capital project and investing in infrastructure. But I think we also need to think about our AT plan. And when we uh, do one thing, and it's really, really important from an in infrastructure perspective for stormwater and, and street recapitalization, I think we also need to recognize the need to create some of those uh, pathways and pedestrian walkways. Um, and, and so I'm just wondering where that sits in all of this, when I'm thinking about the work just of raising the road up at, of Hammond's Plains Road at Blue Water and mitigating this, the, the stormwater flooding that happens every single year there. We know it's been prioritized and thank you for having that in here. Uh, but I also have to recognize that we need to have pathways incorporated in this capital plan. So uh, Peter, I'm just wondering if you can speak to that. And, you know, just to, to get a better understanding of the definition of the roles. So when, when we look at the plan, uh, sorry, when we look at the, re the report and we talk about, you know, clearly defined roles for provincial, uh, federal and municipal uh, government in managing stormwater, I have to point out that the province doesn't have a stormwater plan. You know, we are the only municipality in all of Nova Scotia that actually has a stormwater plan. We're very grateful for that. And we're actively working on that. But stormwater knows no boundary. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, do we even have clarification on what that definition is for those roles within the other two levels of government? Um, so I think I'll stop there. But but thank you, uh, Peter. I appreciate the work that you're doing on this. Okay, Peter Duncan is with us. You're taking the questions, Peter? Can't hear you. I'm not hearing you, Peter. No. No, still not hearing you. You can hear us though. So I wonder if maybe you just need to redirect your mic um, or use a different uh, headset. Now we're going to be expecting a soliloquy from you, Peter. <laughs> Might we take a five minute recess? Peter, can you, can you speak now or? We're not hearing you. Yeah, it's not working, Peter. Can you try it without the headphones? Uh, Okay, maybe we uh, maybe we need to just take it. Speak, speak, Peter. No, okay. All right, let's just take five minutes, and uh, Peter can uh, check his uh, check his uh, technical capacity. So just. Uh, so Ian's in touch. Let's just take five minutes, colleagues. Um, come back at. Uh, Let's make it seven minutes, come back at 3.25. We will be putting up a holding screen until 3.25. Uh, I will come on and start the meeting back up and pass it over to you, Mayor Savage. Thank you.
Good afternoon. The time is now 325. We'll be taking on the holding screen. Have we got Peter? Does Peter's uh, sound good? Mary Savage, I'm just waiting for an update on that. We do have technical support with Peter. They are still working on his sound. I have are just you, got my update. Are you able to hear me, Mr. Mayor? Yes. I am actually in Ashley's office, so I, okay. I'm uh, ready, uh, yeah. ready to go. I saw her name. I was about to recognize her, so that's good. All right, let's just uh, wait till I get this notification that we're good to go from Ian. Mayor Savage, we are streaming. We do appear to have a quorum. You can continue the meeting on your call. Okay, so we're uh, looking at uh, item 1517. The deputy mayor put it on the floor and she had a question. And uh, Peter Duncan is with us to uh, answer that question. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, yes, thank you, Ms. Mr. Mayor, and I do a apologize for the technical issues. I'm in Ashley's office now, so I want to try to wing it from someone else's office, but I think uh, Deputy Mayor Lovelace, uh, through you, or through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Deputy Mayor, there were four questions, I think. Uh, the first one was, uh, Mr. Chair, how, how did we get the top 10 sites? Um, they were identified several years back. Um, by uh, what was at the time sort of a benchmark study we call the National, the National Disaster Mitigation Plan study that was carried out. And we went through and uh, really developed a, a short list of sites or areas prone to flooding um, out of literally thousands of files and went through um, a process of uh, identifying uh, criteria for the priorities and then applied the criteria, brought that to the then council, and to your point, developed a list of 30 sites and uh, really focused on the top 10 sites. So um, to answer your question, when do we get to the next 20? I think the next steps would be to approve the plan to implement, to do the next uh, round of work on the top 10 sites, and then um, I'm going to say a time frame of maybe two to three years, and then we begin to move forward to the next 20 sites. But, Mr. Mayor, looking all the time for opportunities that arise between now and then. Um, so just because you're done the sort of the next list of 20 doesn't mean that we're not going to uh, do anything with it. Um, regarding, I think the next question, Mr. Mayor, was on the future agreement. And what was the timeline for an agreement with Halifax Water? Uh, we do have agreement at the staff level, and it's my understanding that Halifax Water has already a approved or will soon be considering uh, the same guide, guidelines. Um, AAA pathways, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I couldn't agree more. And, um, you know, obviously, if we're going to raise the Hammonds Plains Road, um, we, we, we really need to understand what the road looks like in terms of, uh, you know, are there, are there uh, uh, bike networks? What does the intersection look like with Hammonds Plains Road? What does the new intersection uh, with the uh, Sandy Lake growth, growth area look like? So we really need to sort all, all, all that out um, and understand, at least at a preliminary functional level, what the Hammonds Plains Road itself is going to look like uh, through, that, through that area around Blue Water Road. And the definition of roles, I do apologize that we didn't really get into that in a lot of detail, de de and we probably in hindsight should have attached uh, to the staff report, the report that was tabled with the previous council that defined the roles and responsibilities and um, that we brought forward when we actually implemented the integrated stormwater management policy. Um, this staff report refers to that policy and it does describe how um, how the implementation plan flows from it, but it didn't go into a lot of detail on that. So, um, but I can I can I can certainly forward that to the deputy mayor if that's your uh, wishes. 
I would appreciate that because as these uh, provincial roads are downloaded to the municipality, we have a whole new set of issues with regards to stormwater management and uh, certainly mitigation of flooding uh, because of the fact that these these roads have not uh, and the stormwater system has not been maintained. So I, I, I think that it's important for us to recognize the role, especially now that we're entering that service agreement renegotiation with the province. This is an important opportunity for us to get ahead of the fact that we're we're going to continue to be having these uh, stormwater infrastructure and roads downloaded to the municipality. So, Peter, I appreciate it if you could send that off to me. And uh, yeah, that'd be great. And thanks so much for all your answers. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you, Deputy Mayor, for taking this off the consent agenda. I have been waiting for this report for a long time. So, there's no way I wanted it to get through on the consent agenda because we have some serious flooding issues in my district there. I noticed um, that it was ranked seven along with three others. So I'm assuming that means that all, all four of those um, uh, sites are kind of at the same level of risk. That's why they're all ranked seven. And a uh, question about the funding options there that we have um, like a third, third, third for some, for one of the options, the project type. And I'm wondering if it, like our area here in Pearl Harbor is a medium risk, I guess, according to the, to the report. So that gives it a three to five year implementation plan. So I was just wondering at what time frame during that three to five years, would the residents be made aware of the funding plan that, that a third of the cost they would be responsible for? Um, also wondering how it um, collaborates with the Portland Street Coal Harbor uh, recapitalization uh, project that is in the functional planning stage right now. And what would with that, be set to be aligned to kind of work together. And if that is the case, what would happen to our to our flood mitigation plans if the functional plan for the Portland Street Co Harbor Road um, project gets delayed by many years? Like how how long would we wait to implement this? Because I know our residents have been waiting for years for for help for their, their flooded basements and their flooded yards along this uh, Bissett run. And I think that's all I had. Okay, Peter? Uh, yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so the first, the first question was, why are there three projects all with the number seven ranking? And that is, that is true. They all score up, you know, relatively equal. So we have three that are, that are all at the same at the same pri priority, so to speak. Um, with regards to the time frame of when the residents might know, so I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage, Mr. Mayor, to talk about time frames until the actual, you know, implementation plan is worked out. But I will try to answer it at a high at a high level. Um, so the the resident share, if it's approved by council, will move, will, will be paid through an LIC, a local you know, improvement charge. So the normal, the normal process will be, will be uh, followed with uh, public meetings and so on and so forth. So that should look after itself. So um, the residents should not be sur surprised by anything. Um, and the medium term didn't really reflect, I'll, I'll, I will just mention through you, Ms. Mr. Mayor, that the fact that it was uh, a medium term term doesn't really reflect the priority per se. It more reflects the amount of time it's gonna to take to actually get the work done. Um, and with, with regards also to the functional plan, yeah, we are in full alignment with the functional plan de design. So, you know, my staff working on the functional plan understand that the stormwater work is there because um, the functional plan goes all the way out to the Bissett to the Bissett Road intersection. From an implementation point of view, Mr. Mayor, this need not wait. So you can't do the fun you, you you should not do any of the work to the surface of the road until you fix a storm sewer, but you don't have to wait to fix the storm sewer if you get, you know, say an outside source of funding or 
if there's another upper opportunity that comes up. So. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hensby. Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a couple of things of concern in this report. First of all, uh, this past winter came to my attention of a situation we have on the 207 Highway uh, by Lilac Drive, just near our fire station. This is going to be within the new territory we'll be assuming from the province this June. Uh, twice this winter, Highway 207 was overflowed with water. And one of those occasions is one of those freak winter storms where it rained and then it froze and we had an icy patch and, and, and people driving through was a uh, crushed ice um, blockade, I guess you could say, on the 207 highway. Uh, so I need to have this particular spot elevate <coughs> our attention. Uh, no, it's not on the report because it only came to light, uh, not, even, it's not even our territory yet, but it will be uh, coming this June. Um, but also in this, this discussion about a local improvement charge, I cannot understand why we even consider a local improvement charge for these these road improvements. These should be in the general tax rate or, or they're within their urban or whatever rate is we're going to be charging for these road services. But um, a local improvement charge for a, for a, a street elevation or stormwater improvement is for a quite a vast area, not, not a local improvement charge for a, a budding property. So I think that we need to reevaluate uh, how we're supposed to uh, try to regain any uh, cost to this. I'm hoping that we'll be getting federal and provincial infrastructure dollars through the uh, uh, National um, Disaster Mitigation Plan. There's infrastructure funding available for those things. So I'm hoping that we minimize this cost as much as possible to the municipal taxpayer by taking advantage of provincial and federal tax dollars. Thank you. But in regards to 207, I need to get that one on our list uh, come after June 1st. Thank you. Councillor Blackburn. Mm. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And just a, a quick uh, question for uh, Peter Duncan. I uh, just mentioned Blue Water Road earlier and uh, appreciate that being uh, recognized as a major location for flooding. And uh, just want to... Uh, you know, mentioned the uh, the current Sandy Lake environmental study that's going on that uh, will incorporate that area. I'm uh, just wondering if uh, if you're going to wait for that environmental study to finish up before starting the work uh, studying uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the wetland areas that surround Blue Water Road. Thank you. Uh, yeah, th uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um... So the environmental, I think you're referring to the McCallum study that's underway now? Cor yes, correct. Yeah. Thank well, you. So, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm actually not a whole lot aware of that. I know we plan to do our own landscape, you know, study and watershed study as part of the build out of the Sandy Lake growth growth area. Um, and then we'll follow it up with our infrastructure study. So, um, the short answer to your question, Councillor, through you, Mr. Mayor, is yes, we will have to wait to some extent because the infrastructure analyses will be informed by the landscape studies. So all Perfect. the and environmental work will have to be bundled, bun, bundled up. And once we understand what the landscape can handle in terms of the number of housing units, then that will inform the infrastructure studies. So Beautiful. There's, there's a lot of moving pieces there and there's a lot of things going, going on. So one they will, they will, one will, will inform the other. Yeah. Well, the good news is I don't think you'll have to wait too long because I think that study is due back like within a, a number of like a matter of days. It's sometime this month is my understanding. So good, uh, good to hear that it's on the radar. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Councillor Blackburn for, uh, for asking that. Uh, I was, that was going to be one of the ones that I had covered as well. Um, a couple of other ones. Uh, on uh, page six of the PDF, you have Sackville River's mitigation study at the top uh, showing as complete. I wasn't able to find that. I was able to find um, the Sackville River's floodplain map, but, but not the mitigation study. Um, so I might need some help looking for that at some point. Uh, the, the second thing is uh, I'm wondering about the public input plan. Um, I didn't see a community engagement section of this report, and I'm wondering about uh, uh, what community engagement would look like uh, in the development of uh, any of the uh, any of the plans that, that would be coming forward. Peter, 
uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So the Sackville River's, uh, uh, you know, mitigation study, um, that study is complete, but we haven't presented that to uh, council yet, uh, Mr. Mayor. So that's probably the reason why you can't find it. Um, we're, okay. we're going to, uh, we're shooting for a date in the fall. And um, okay. and that was, uh, it's, it's actually a fairly interesting study. It'll, you know, it'll tell us when we, when we do, you know, road renewal work in the, in, in up along the Little Sapphire River, if there's any structures that we have to raise up and to what elevation do we have to raise them to and so on. So um, we really focused on um, any of the infrastructure solutions in and around the Sackville area. Um, public consultation, no, there wasn't any consultation done in this report itself, but in the implementation plan, um, public consultation, I'm going to say will vary depending on what the implementation mechanism is. Um, you know, whether, whether, whether it's a, you know, whether we uh, have an, uh, if it's an infrastructure-based solution with a road recapitalization project, then obviously there won't be a lot of public input there. But if it's a if it's a solution that involves any kind of planning mechanism, like the Sackville River floodplain zoning, that that will have a very very extensive public uh, council consultation. So it it will it will vary depending on what the action is, Mr. Mayor. Okay, and, and do we know? Do we know how that might be impacted by direction from the province? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. In 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 what sense? Uh, like from from funding or? No, from the from the public consultation, from the involvement of uh, community councils or or uh, planning advisory committees or anything like that. Uh, yeah, so uh, through you, Ms. Mr. Mayor, so any of the public consultation will now follow uh, Bill 1, 187, I believe it is, or 187, 137, so, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Outhead. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Peter. And, and Peter, I appreciate you being here, and I always learn something from you. And I know I'm preaching to the choir when I bring up some of these issues, and I'm going to continue on from where... Uh, couple of my colleagues were because uh, Blue Water Road falls in District 16, as does Sandy Lake, and of course leads into District 13. And regardless of what happens with Sandy Lake, whether it's a thousand units or 6,000 units, and I hope it's a thousand, not 6,000, but regardless of what happens in that area and what's to be determined from the upcoming studies, the existing situation is not acceptable on a road that gets that much traffic and has that many residences, et cetera. And of course, we could make the same argument, Peter, of course, for the Bedford Highway. And as long as I've been on council, I know you and I and Dave Hubley and others have been talking about this. So my, my question is, and I, I know you're trying, you, you've said this, Peter, there's a lot of balls in the air and they're all trying to come together. We want the reports from McCallum. We want to, to continue on with the implementation of this. But how confident are you? Because I, I, I really think there's an opportunity here for federal and provincial funding, as we talked about, and but also to imp implement the CCCs here to help us improve the area before we see development, regardless of the amount of the development, whether it's a thousand units or 6,000. And in addition to the challenges we have now. So how do we make this? And, and Peter, your comment was, well, we really need to get this organized before we go forward, et cetera, et cetera. How do we make sure that happens? I mean, you're going to get direction from council today to go ahead and talk about implementation, but what direction do we need to give to make sure that Sandy Lake and some more developments off the Bedford Highway, et cetera, don't go ahead or go ahead in conjunction with triggers to this improvement of infrastructure. The province has indicated, for example, in Sunnyside, they don't want people living in floodplains. They don't want new buildings built in floodplains. But one would hope they'd also understand that you can't build new communities that how you get to the marine areas that flood. So how do we make sure that this does happen, Peter, uh, prior to development? additional development and hopefully with the opportunity of funding additional funding through the development the development fees CCCs etc um, yeah um, through you mr. mayor uh, thank you that's a great question um, and I think the answer to it is that what you've just described is the fundamental intent of an infrastructure master master you know master mm -hmm. you know an infrastructure master plan itself so 
we will, um, as part of the master plan process, decide what infrastructure is needed, when is the infrastructure needed, and how is it paid paid for, and that would that would uh, be in reference to both roads and storm sewer systems. And are we somewhat confident that this can happen quickly enough before the province? And I know you're on the team looking into this, and I take great comfort in that. But before the province orders us to start building in Sandy Lake, for example. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So, so the infrastructure master plan process would actually be part of the of the planning process. So it okay. it would be done at the same at the same time. All right, no, that, that makes sense. So you don't feel you need any further direction or concerns or anything. You feel that the process is going to uh, accomplish this. Um, yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. So if we if we move ahead uh, with the special planning area and the you know uh, build build out of the special planning area in Sandy Lake, uh, part of that process will be the CCC funding program, and that will, by def, def, definition and default, look at uh, you know what infrastructure do we need, when do we need it, and how how do we pay for it. Thanks very much, Peter. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm pleased to see this come forward. I um, in District Three, and certainly in the Eastern Passage area, where I see that the Shore Road is identified on the list. I'm really pleased to see that um, the uh, the sea level and the impact of of uh, the harsh environment is evident in much of the district, being on the coastline. Um, also, uh, you know, certainly climate change has taken a um, a heavy toll on many of the uh, folks down near the water, not only because of the, you know, the impact of sea level rising and, and storms as such, but that, that water goes downhill. <laughs> Anything above it, every bit of storm water is making its way down to the lowest spot and Shore Road is, uh, in particular, I remember when I was on council before, that many, many residents in the area have been flooded, have had, uh, we have infrastructure issues down in those areas, and um, subsequently have been denied insurance for many claims and, and such, and had to deal with that, um, that, that kind of impact and challenge. So my question here, to staff is I know that I've had conversations with you around more recently in this this uh, term with the impact of uh, flooding um, and uh, coastal erosion on shore road itself on the infrastructure of the road um, and I know that uh, it, you know good conversations that's identified of, of some of the undermining of that road what I'm unclear about in this um, report is that would there be efforts to look at the impact in and around the pri the properties that are down in those areas some you know Himmelman, Osborne, uh, Romkey uh, the, there's a, a number of streets in that area that I'm serious they it's it's been troublesome for them and very challenging with insurance purposes for flooding so are we talking potentially addressing two things at the same time or is this specifically roadways is it is it uh, or the stormwater management infrastructure in that area as well um, I do want to before we end, I get answers on that I do want to um, follow up on Councillor Hensby's uh, comments around the burden on taxpayers I I am concerned I I around any kind of uh, specific burden to the taxpayers and the residents who live in that particular area. The infrastructure down there, they inherited in many cases. Um, when they purchase, they are, uh, it, it has been, it ha as I said before, it has been problematic um, for decades. And I feel like they've already spent an awful lot already on dealing with this issue. It would be uh, I'd be hard pressed to support them continuing to be burdened um, specifically just because they happen to be the property owners in this particular area. So 
I, I support that. I'm, I'm concerned about that and look forward to hearing some of your answers related to our, our both areas of concern being uh, looked at. Thank you, Peter. Uh, yeah, uh, through you, Mr. Mr. Mayor, to the uh, councillor with regards to Shore, Shore Road. Um, yeah, so one of the recommendations of the, the NDMP study was to do just uh, do do further further uh, study, and uh, see if there's any further land land use controls that we can bring you know bring to bear there, um, outside of the stand, stand, standard ones that we have in the regional plan policies. Um, the the insurance issues are a loaded question. I might have to take that away. Um, but I will say that the area of Shore Road that is at greatest risk um, is being looked at. Um, environment and climate change has a applied for some federal funding uh, to do some naturalization of the shore, shoreline um, for for the section of Shore Shore Road that is at the highest highest risk. And I think that was in Shannon Minima's budget budget present presentation last month. Yeah, it was. I I, re, I recall that, and I guess I just for me, I wanted to just draw attention to we have two on two two issues related at, on that particular area. So I'd be happy to chat with you folks offline on this further, just to make sure we get it right. Um, is there potential for what you're talking about here to be looking at both? If the study comes back in relation to the planning and development, and potentially, you know. Uh, infrastructure that may need to be upgraded is that is that a whole different um, plan or is there anything in here that would be capturing that? No, I, I would uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. I would expect that. So once we get on and study shore, uh, shore Drive more um, over and above what we already know, um, that would be sort of the next phase, if if you will. Okay, good good to hear it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Peter, for being here. Uh, now I know that I'm going to have to make another meeting with you to ask more questions that are probably specific. But um, to my to our district, thanks for seeing Highway 2 on the list uh, from Holland Road to Miller Lake, because there is a, a lot of issues there that people are, are hoping to get some good attention to. Um, one of the, in the report, it says the Shubenacadie Lakes floodplain study and uh, similar to uh, Councillor Russell, I couldn't find it. And I know at the last meeting of the Collins Park Watershed Authority, there was a big question about where is that study? We can't wait to get our hands on it. So um, is that in the same place that it, it's in the pipeline, but not in our hands yet? Through uh, you, Mr. Mayor, that's actually in the exact same place. Um, the study's, the uh, study's done. Um, it's a big study. It's a really large uh, flood flood plain area. It's a really large watershed. Yes. Um, so the study's done, and we're quite excited. Actually, uh, we got to roll it out to some internal stakeholders, and we want to pre present it to uh, council. Yeah. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Councillor Cuttle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, um, and uh, thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, you know, flooding. I think you know we've seen a lot more flooding over the last couple of years in many neighborhoods. Um, and you know, looking at this report, these be long-standing issues in many of these places. And there's a trend that I'm seeing, um, particularly around Spryfield, where there's a lot of development happening, where we're seeing forest being cut down, land being blasted, and flooding that has never occurred before, all of a sudden occurring now on a regular basis, not only impacting public infrastructure, but impacting private property as well. And, um, you know, it becomes a bit of a, a lambeth of trying to figure out what to do about this. And so, you know, when I look at the mitigation strategy as a way of, you know, mitigating flood risk, I'm wondering what we're doing internally, being proactive about stopping these situations moving forward with the new development. So where you don't have an increasing list of, of flooding issues that we then have to go back and remedy. Um, and, you know, I don't, I, I don't know where that fits in this whole picture of, um, of flood, of flood mitigation. So, through you, Mr. Mayor, so I, I, I think your question 
is what are we doing on the new developments to protect to future what are we doing to future proof the new the new developments and um with you know from from a stormwater management point of view um through the integrated stormwater management policies and the new stormwater uh, design criteria that we've approved, we do account for the climate change impacts of more severe and more frequent storms. Um, the the other the other adaptation approaches that we need, I think, will really come out of environment and climate changes shop. Um, and to your point, uh, you know the 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 forest the forest fire hazards, right? Um, you know the more frequent, you know the more severe you know drought conditions. Um, and, and, and if there's any enhanced shoreline, you know, or shoreline protection mechanisms that we, that we need, that will all come out of the, uh, critical infrastructure analysis and the, uh, the, um, the hazard, the hazard mapping that, uh, environment and climate change will have underway this year and next. And, um, beyond that, Mr. Mayor, I'm kind of speaking on someone else's be a half, so I don't want to take that too far. But with but with with regards to the stormwater impacts, um, I'm quite confident that the new standards that we have, uh, they do in fact take into consideration the impacts of uh, climate climate change. Right, and and but a lot of that um, in terms of our power over that is only once um, there's some kind of development um, permit. Or agreement or concept initiated with the city, and prior to that, people can cut down trees and move earth without our permission, causing causing us issues that our taxpayers then need to need to fund. So I, I see there's some gaps in our overall approach to this, and I look forward to talking about this more with you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, colleagues, that's, I see nobody else on the board ready for the question on 1517. Thank you, Peter, for joining us. Question. Beginning with District 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Councilor Otit. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councilor Dagle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councilor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councilor Kent. In favor. Four, Councilor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councilor Austin. In favor. Six, Councilor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councilor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councilor Smith. Four. Nine, Councilor Clary. Yes. 10, Councilor Morse. In favor. And 11, Councilor Cuddle. In favor. Thank you. Okay, that passes, uh, colleagues. There is a motion in the chat line that perhaps somebody could read so we could move the other items ahead of item 1519. I can do that, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm Deputy Mayor, thank you. I move that Halifax Regional Council address items 15.2.2, 15.3.1, and 15.4.1 prior to item 15.1.9. I will second that, Councillor Russell. Seconded by Councillor Russell. Ian, I can just take a voice vote on that. That is correct, Mayor Savage. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, so 1518 was approved on consent, by the way, which was the Lady Hammond uh, Bridge. 1519, we'll come back to. 1521 was an increase on the Woodside Ferry Terminal upgrade, which passed on consent. 1522 is humanitarian relief efforts for Ukraine. Um, I will... Deputy Mayor, Deputy Mayor, do you just want to put that on the floor? Or? Sure, I could put that on the floor, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll speak to it if necessary. If it's not necessary, then I won't. 
Certainly. I move that Halifax Regional Council provide a $50,000 grant from the Operations Reserve Q421 to the Canada-Ukraine Foundation to support humanitarian relief efforts for Ukraine as a result of the invasion by Russia. Second. Second by Councillor Blackburn. Uh, wonderful. So I'll just speak very briefly to this. I think that uh, you know, it's important for uh, regional council and residents of Halifax, um, uh, you know, to to acknowledge uh, this egregious invasion and the humanitarian crisis uh, that has occurred uh, in Ukraine. And so I fully support this motion and thank you uh, colleagues for, for moving ahead with this. Okay. Ready for the question. Question. Beginning with district 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Councillor Odit. Yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councillor Dagle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor of the motion. And twelve, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, item 1531 comes from grants, less than market value, lease agreement for Needham Preschool and Daycare. Uh, so item 15.3.1, is this Councillor Daigle Gammon as uh, Chair of Grants? Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I am pleased to put the following motion that the Halifax Regional Council authorize the Mayor and Municipal Clerk to negotiate and enter into a less than market value lease agreement with Needham Preschool and Daycare for their premises located at Needham Community Centre, 3372 Devonshire Avenue, Halifax, and such lease agreement shall contain key terms and conditions substantially similar to those set out in Table 1 in the discussion section of the staff report dated February 22nd, 2022. I'll second that. Seconded by Councillor Cuttle. Anything on it, Councillor uh, David Gowan? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cuttle, for the second. So the, this daycare, um, preschool and daycare has been in existence since 1999. Um, they're in agreement with the terms of this uh, five-year lease at the less than market value. And so they've, they've been around since forever. In my early career, I remember following a lot of the innovation that have happened at this uh, center. There's been a lot of major strides in how we support children through an inclusion at this daycare. So I hope everyone uh, considers supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Mason. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to thank staff for bringing this and for making this change. So the policy uh, 10 or 11 years ago to my colleagues was uh, to move toward market rent for everybody in a municipal facility. And when I got elected and they pr proposed to do that at Spencer House uh, and uh, the uh, South End Community Daycare, that is a subsidized daycare uh, and part of the wraparound school uh, uh, kind of complex at St. Mary's Elementary, I fought like heck to get the policy reversed and we were successful. But Jennifer Watts and then Councillor Smith both have looked at me and said, Huh, because this had already gone up. So I'm glad to see it finally go back to where it should be. And I, I appreciate that work. And I apologize to Councillor Watson, Councillor Smith for uh, not being able to get it for them sooner myself. Thank you very much, colleagues. I absolutely support this. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and echo Councillor Mason's word and appreciate the work you did on this early on. Uh, and just to say one, I support this is being a past parent of Needham Baker Center with my daughter who went there for many years. Um, but also just, I mentioned this at grants and I'll mention it today. So understanding that new Needham will come online in the next few years if everything goes according to plan, finger crossed which means that Needham will be, the Needham Daycare hopefully uh, will be in a new space depending on uh, where things go in the future. So the only thing I just wanna say again to reiterate is I hope that when we do have the new Needham online and if Needham Center does decide that they won't, are going to be in the building that 
that we do. Uh, uh, I understand we have to look at somewhat of, of how the market works and it's going to be a new building and understand that we can charge more for new buildings, but also hope that we think about the affordability for the daycare and other folks that might uh, need those spaces. So just want to put that on on record as, as I hope when new game comes online, we can still keep it affordable for the new uh, folks in the new space. Thank you, Councilman. Okay, ready for the question, colleagues? Question? Beginning with District 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor? 16, Councilor Otet. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councilor David Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councilor Hensby. Armour Three, Councilor Kent. In favor. Four, Councilor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councilor Austin. In favor. Six, Councilor Mancini. So are you voting in favor of the motion? Seven, Councilor Mason. Enthusiastically for the motion. Eight, Councilor Smith. Four. Nine, Councilor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councilor Morse. In favor. 11, Councilor Cuddle. In favor. And 12, Councilor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, that carries. Um, we will go to 15.4 from members of council. In the name of Councilor Stoddard, Community Benefits Agreements, uh, Councilor um, Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and colleagues. This has been an interesting um, couple hours for me. Um, I do have to let you know that before I put 15.4.1 on the table, I have to amend the motion. I'm not sure exactly how that happens, but I have to amend the motion af after having conversations this afternoon with staff. So am I, am I okay to go ahead with the new motion? I'm not sure how this works. No? Um, <laughs> I think if you read the motion and then tell us your amendment, we'll, that, that would be the best way. So if you read the motion as it is and then just tell us your amendment. Certainly. The original motion is in the chat line for anybody that wants to see it. I have it, thank you. Um, I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the mayor to write to the Minister of Municipal pa Affairs and Housing requesting that the requesting the power to develop, enter into and enforce community benefits agreements to be added to the HRM charter. I so move. Thank I'll you. second that. Seconded by Councillor Russell and just tell us your motion. It may be very friendly, uh, Councillor Stoddard. Certainly. I move that Halifax Regional Council direct the Chief Administrator Officer to prepare a staff report from the Community Benefits Agreement and the next steps for development as part of HRM's planning and development strategies for African Nova Scotian communities. I so move. <laughs> yes, it's already. Okay. So Ian, just to be clear, is this, can this be considered a friendly amendment? There's two pieces I see now. One is the staff report and the other is the addition at the end, correct? Mayor Savage, that is correct. I, I think it was, should be an amended motion at this time as it does create a different action. Uh, I think that might be the best way of doing this. Okay, so the motion is amended. Is there a second for the amended motion? Seconded second. by Councillor Kent. Okay, Councillor Stoddard, the amended motion is on the floor. Go ahead. As, as Council has already reviewed the contents of this motion, I only wish to highlight that this motion is a win-win situation. Um, for all marginalized communities and developments. 
It brings the developments and communities together. It also allows the community to have a certain level of control over the impact of development and to ensure that the community receives benefit from the development. HRM could leverage the community benefits to meet policy goals and community economics, development, employment, and poverty re reduction and social inclusion in the lands we're planning. Lands they were planning, sorry, I so move. Okay. Thank you. Is that it for now, Councilor Stoddard? You're Yes, uh, I'm, I'm okay with that until we get the staff report. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and a uh, big thank you, Councilor Stoddard, for bringing this forward. Uh, last, well, before I got elected, this was, this was one of the pieces that, that I was uh, campaigning on in creating community benefits agreement and understanding we needed some other powers and changes around social the social um, policy lens and some planning rationale, it made sense to wait. Uh, and in when I was when I got reelected, I actually was going to bring this forward and I had discussions with some staff and they they said that because we're doing the road to economic prosperity and that it's one of the most likely one of the recommendations recommendations is going to be for us to develop uh, the community benefits agreement. I, I I didn't put that motion forward. So I'm happy to see it um here at, for us to to to, to deal with and, and hopefully get the province to agree that we do need um these agreements within our communities and you know for example if we would have had it for many big developments that happened in our city the community could have not only been engaged but also felt that they had some sort of ownership within those properties and, and not saying um they own units but they could have been community space, it could have been playground, it could have been whatever the community wants, because that's the purpose of community development agreements. So, so very happy to see this and hope that we do get the power so we can better engage our community. So definitely support this. Thank you, Councillor Hensley. Thank you much, Mr. Mayor. Um, in support of this initiative, uh, this is something we've been trying to do at Akuma Holdings in regards to some of the projects we've been dealing with the renovation of the old home, now known as Kinney Place. We're trying to employ as many local contractors as possible. We're encouraging our contractors to have sub-trades uh, from the community. Um, the line of concern, though, that I want to talk about in regards to back in the county days before amalgamation, we had some policies of contract compliance and contract set-asides. Where when we had significant projects within or near uh, an African Nova Scotia community, we wanted to make sure that those bidding on those projects either had some contract set aside or contract compliance where it involved the local community as well. Um, but since amalgamation, I've learned or been told that contract compliance or contract set asides were no longer allowed under the trade agreements we have, uh, either interprovincial or national or international trade agreements. Uh, are these kind of things allowed? So I hope the staff report will clarify in regards to uh, the community benefit agreements um, that there's no uh, trade violations in regards to uh, unfair competition. Uh, so I just want to make sure that's addressed. And, uh, and I also see this quite similar to our, the other community benefit programs where we had, um, for instance, the $1 million fund given to the downtown Halifax uh, uh, area around the Nova Scotia, from around our sewage treatment center. Uh, we had a million dollar benefit fund there. We always had a compensation fund for the Sackville landfill. Um, that's something we need to discuss about in regards to Otter Lake. There should have been a community compensation fund of some sort. So I see a, a community benefit uh, agreement very similar in nature to those type of uh, arrangements. So I'm hoping the staff report will address those matters as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mason. Uh, thank you. I should have been clearer when I got my name on the list. So I, I actually was against the amendment and I, we didn't vote on it. So I'm not sure if it passed. I'm not exactly sure where we're at procedurally. But uh, as a member of the Halifax Partnership, we outlined uh, in the African Nova Scotian, uh, you know, uh, economic development plan that uh, CBAs are something that was important and needed to be considered and, and, and acted on. And then council endorsed that and passed that. So I feel like we already have, I mean, I'm not exactly sure what the staff report is, especially when we're 
just writing the minister to ask them to consider amending it. Like we, in, until we actually have legislation, you can't get into any detail about how we're actually going to do it because you don't know what they're actually going to enable. So I'm wondering if staff could comment on why we wouldn't just, I mean, this is a letter to the minister here. So why add the extra step? Well, this is a motion of uh, a councillor. We don't normally have staff, but maybe John or somebody might might speak to that. Well, just just speaking to why, you know, Councillor Stoddard said that staff had requested that she change the motion. I'm not sure why we're doing that. I think staff certainly requested it to be a staff report to begin with. I'm not sure about the rest. Uh, is there anybody that can speak to that, Jock or, uh, or John? It's through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to, to the councillor. So when we look at this, there, there are far reaching implications on, on this matter, right? So I think before a council asks the minister or the government to do anything, it needs to know what it is actually asking them to do. Uh, so I think we just need to come back with a more fulsome conversation discussion about what it is, that, what are the possibilities here and what are the options for council to consider and then get that direction from council. That was the conversation we had at the staff level, my, my recollection. Thank you very, thank you very much for that, Mr. Sierra. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I guess I still have concerns about that. I feel like if if that is a concern, then then uh, you know it should have been. I, I feel like that should have been illuminated in, when the African Nova Scotia Economic Plan came forward. I mean, this is something that Council has already said we were going to do by endorsing that. So I, I guess I'll support the motion as amended. But I, I I I still feel like we're making more work for ourselves than we need to. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And just we are on the amendment. Uh, uh, that's what we're debating now. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cuttle. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I want to thank uh, Councillor Stoddard for bringing this forward. Um, I, too, am a big fan of community benefit agreements. Um, I see them as fantastic vehicles for engaging the community and addressing concerns of employment, small business development, and community equity. Um, I would ask that we consider that, you know, if we're going to ask for an amendment to the charter, that we look at applying for community benefit agreements that can benefit low-income communities across the municipality, um, not just with the African Nova Scotian communities. Um, you know, there's strategic vehicles for community improvement. And well, you know, um, I, I can see there's a historic need for community benefit agreements within African Nova Scotian communities. I also feel that as a vehicle for community improvement, they would be great for low-income communities that have a um, statistically overrepresented population who are experiencing poverty or precarious employment. Um, Vancouver, when they implemented their community benefit program, um, benefit agreement program, um, it was a measure of a, one of the measures was um, if communities were below the low income threshold. And so um, I, I would see no reason why if we're gonna go forward and, and bring community benefit agreements into the charter, why we wouldn't make them available to um, a wider selection of communities. Uh, if you take Spryfield, for example, it has been recognized as a low income community. Um, it has members of the African Nova Scotian community who live there, um, but it also has other people as well. And it wouldn't be considered an African Nova Scotian community, a historic one at least. So um, I think these are wonderful things and I would love to see the ability for us to um, have this this tool in, in our tool bag for working with communities and creating opportunities for communities, but I wouldn't want to limit it, it limit its application. Thank so you, I'm Councillor Kent. Councillor Kent. Sorry about that, Mr. Mayor. I was just trying to do a little bit of math on something here. Um, so I would like to, uh, so I want to support this for sure. I think that uh, the, uh, we're on the amendment, right? On the amendment, yes. So I, I would like to certainly support this. I think that this is an area uh, that, that I've certainly heard in the past as well, and I'm happy to support that. What I'm a little unsure about is um, 
what do we what do we identify i guess in the way of community impact and uh, because i feel like you know with the unprecedented growth that were happening and and, and that's certainly identified here in the in the uh, motion document that came to us is the unprecedented rate of growth and we and i think about the uh, task force at the provincial level that has identified the nine upcoming um, large growth areas potentially should those go forward um, at such a rapid pace and should there not be an opportunity we don't know what the public engagement would be is there an opportunity for some of this to apply that to to those as well and so um, while I certainly support the the intent of the motion that the amendment um i'm a little concerned about the limit it, it's limiting it only to the african nova scotian um challenge and 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 context so i'm happy to support that but are we missing the vote potentially not having it more open to more opportunities in the future especially given the uncertainty of the task force and potential decision making happening at the provincial level if I could answer, uh, Mr. Mayor, please. Um, That's what started. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to um, enlighten our council uh, just a little bit about something that I read in the Community Development Agreement. It says, Council has also endorsed the African Nova Scotian Road to Prosperity, Economic Road to Prosperity Collaboration Plan developed and owned by the Black, sorry, by the African Nova Scotian community to advance economic development and community priorities. So this has already been ad um, addressed by council and endorsed. So this is um, from what I can see the next step. Okay, thank you, councilor. So uh, <clears throat> this is a motion of, of, a, of, a, of a councilor on a specific issue. Council can certainly bring forward other motions uh, around whatever they wish, including community economic benefits, I would uh, suggest. It's a good conversation to have. And if this passes, it will come back and there will be uh, more information in front of us to consider these. Anybody, uh, anybody else? Speak, uh, Councillor, uh, sorry, Councillor Outfit and then Councillor Connell. Thank you, Mayor. And just very quickly, if uh, John Traves is on, uh, it just sort of begs the question, and I haven't heard an update in a while. You know, will we continue to have to go and write and for amendments to the charter, et cetera? But where are we with the all encompassing, I call it peace, order, and good government, POG uh, endeavor that we had, that we could sort of bring some of these decisions back into our house without having to run to mom and dad? uh for permission where are we john with the uh, there's another term you use but i call it peace order and good government there's another team you term you use but where are we with that it's it's personal powers kind of personal control. powers yeah uh, mr mayor to you to council so um you know the the government of the day considered the request and they sort of landed somewhere in the middle. They provided some broadened powers. There was uh, fiscal capacity and, um, and essentially have given us something close to peace, order and good government powers. I haven't looked at how that might in, uh, currently um, permit us to engage in, in CBAs, but I, my understanding is it's the enforcement which, uh, which may be the problem. And I think that's part of why a staff report may assist in terms of do we actually need to change the legislation or not? And so we can look at that as part of, of a staff report coming back. Now that makes sense to me. So my suggestion is we do get the staff report, but we don't start writing letters yet till we know a little bit about what we're looking for and if indeed we need to look for it. Is that fair? It tends to be the enforcement is the is the issue. Right on. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Diego Gavin. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm also in support of community benefit agreements, uh, especially with my background. But um, one of the things that I'm just wondering, because it, it will be a staff report, maybe the staff report will be able to come back with what those options are, whether or not it's generic language around community benefit agreements or those that are specific to a population. So uh, perhaps we'll get that answered when we see the staff report, because it would be an inclusive of all of the things that might need to be considered. Thanks. Thank you. 
Councillor Cuddle. Oh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Daigle Gammon uh, very nicely said what I was going to say, that I hope in the staff report um, we consider the application of community benefit agreements across the municipality and that um, I wouldn't see being able to apply them to other communities beyond the African Nova Scotian communities would be in any way, um, you know, a detriment to to what we're hoping to achieve uh, through the road to economic prosperity um, and support of our African Nova Scotian communities. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the amendment is on the floor. We're we ready for the question on the amendment. Question. Yeah. Beginning with District 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Councillor Outhit. Yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gowan. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Query. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. Thirteen, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. And Fourteen, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. Thank you. Okay, so that was an amendment. So now we will... If there's no discussion on the main motion as amended, we'll vote on the main motion, Ian. That's correct, Mr. Savage. Question. Question. Beginning with, beginning with District 16, Councillor Outhead. Sorry, should have been ready. Yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Well, Councilor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. And 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. Thank you. Okay, that motion carries. Thank you, Councilor Stoddard. I think that brings to an end those items we're gonna discuss before going back to pick up 15.1.9. Uh, there is a presentation for that, but we're gonna take a break. I'm just trying to gauge the, I was gonna say the room, but the screen. Um, do we wanna take a half hour break here and come back at uh, five o'clock and give people a good chance to stretch their legs and then maybe go to at least six if we need to go further, but, uh, or do people just wanna take 10 minutes? Uh, take a half hour, sure. My okay, yeah, that's my information. So we will come back at uh, five o'clock, uh, colleagues, to pick up 15.1.9. Uh, we also have in camera. So uh, we'll take a half hour, come back at five o'clock. Thank you. We'll be muting microphones and cameras for the duration of the break. We'll be returning them right at five o'clock. Thank you.
Good evening. The time is now five o'clock. We'll be taking down the holding screen or returning microphones and cameras to all meeting attendees. Mayor Savage, you can call the main order. Okay. All right, folks, let's uh, recommence here. So um, we're going to do item 15.1.9, homelessness and encampment approach. And um, we're going to have a presentation, I believe, from Max Chauvin, perhaps others, and uh, then Councillor Smith will move uh, the motion. Uh, Max, is it you that I'm going to, or is it Maggie? Uh I am, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Welcome. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And yes, I will be uh, doing the presentation. Okay. I, um, there we go. Now, now you can see me. Uh, I, uh, so Mr. Mayor uh, and council and, and those watching online, if uh, the clerk could pop up the presentation. Okay, so uh, we'll go to the first slide. So this is a uh, interim update on the municipality's approach to homelessness, encampments and affordable housing. This is based on the last six weeks where we have reassessed the approach that we have taken so far and looked at uh, new steps and new ways to move forward. This reassessment is ongoing. So we have talked, as, as I'll update you on to a number of people, we will continue those conversations uh, and learn from a variety of folks. And there will be another report that will be coming to council uh, in the summer. That report will have more of the consultation information. We'll talk about a couple of other things that will be included and it will include a, a, a longer term strategy. Uh, these are immediate or short-term actions that uh, we're recommending to, to move forward. And we can change the slide. So we're in, I don't think this is a, a surprise, but we're in the middle of a housing crisis. Currently, the municipality is growing faster than the market can build housing. We've seen and reported from a number of sources that the vacancy rate is down to 1%. There is uh, on the AHANS website, they keep track of a, of a recording of the number of homeless. Currently, as of April, that number is 547. And this morning, they published an update on May the 3rd, which is now 568. And it's important to realize that all of those who are homeless are not sleeping outside uh, in a park, there are a variety of options. Some folks are in shelters, obviously, but there are those who are sleeping rough in cars, uh, recreational vehicles. There are a lot of people who are sleeping rough in a friend or family member's couch or in their basement, so that that number reflects the people who would say, I don't have a home, but is not reflective necessarily of the number of people who are sleeping in a park or a doorway or something like that. There are approximately 200 shelter beds. Uh, minimum wage right now is 1335. And if you work uh, 2,080 hours in a year, that would come out to $27,700. And based on advertised rent, the average rent is uh, around $1,600 for a one bedroom which would total in rent to 19,200. And probably most everyone is familiar with the, the approximation of that you should pay a third of your income in rent. And so you can imagine what that generally requires as an income to be able to afford that. And the prices are higher if you're looking at a two bedroom or a three bedroom. 
we can switch slides. So it was important to recognize some of the things that we've done in the past two years. So we have two modular sites with a total of 64 people able to live in them. The uh, Dartmouth site is open and has been running and has been running well. And the Halifax site uh, is completed. We uh, have turned over the keys to the province and uh, occupancy permits have been issued. The uh, province is working with Out of the Cold, which will be their service provider. And they are in the middle of staffing up and, and getting ready. And as soon as they're ready, they will open those units and invite uh, residents to come in. We know they are also beginning the screening process for residents. We have funded six affordable housing projects through the Rapid Housing Initiative, which is federal funding. Those units will provide another 157 options for people. They will not all come online at once, but some of them are ready to come online in June and some will be delayed until December. And they're in various phases of construction and so on. And those units will provide a variety of options, including housing for some of the most difficult to house, as well as uh, housing units targeted to indigenous uh, members of, of the community, as well as people who identify as transgender. We've provided the province emergency shelter space for those experiencing homelessness, uh, specifically the Gray Arena and the George Dixon Center that they have used. We've provided funding for hotel accommodations for 140 people. We provide $6 million annually to social and not-for-profit housing. And we've worked with the Archdiocese of Halifax Yarmouth to approve 17 emergency, uh, safe emergency shelters. And in discussions with the Archdiocese, those have gone very well and are well used. And uh, the residents in those are well supported by the congregations. Um, in those units. So that's sort of a, a quick overview of some of the things that we've done. We can move slides. So sleeping rough. So it's important to realize that there have been people sleeping rough in our community um, for decades. And uh, we've talked about that before in various uh, meetings and forums. And there always will be some people who wish to sleep and have to sleep rough in the community. People sleep rough for a variety of reasons. Uh, at times, the existing shelter space is full. And we have over the past, and that is tracked by the shelter community. And there are nights where there hasn't been any available shelter space. There are some times and, and people who feel very unsafe in a shelter or another housing option. They have experienced traumas uh, or have mental health issues that simply make that untenable for them. There's also been uh, residents who have been banned from a shelter or other housing option for behavioral issues. Uh, and there are also times when we have people who would like to be housed, but they, we haven't been able to create the wraparound services that somebody needs to stay housed. So there are some people who remain sleeping rough by personal choice, and there are some who sleep rough who have no choice. And one of the really important things that we need to consider when discussing sleeping rough is to ensure that people do have some personal choice. Uh, it's an important part of, of people's ability to feel that they have agency in their own life. So we can again move on. So community consultation. So we've reached out and talked with more than 20 groups and numerous individuals, including staff, both at the provincial and municipal government level. We've talked to political representatives. We've talked to advocates, service providers, and community residents. We have had the opportunity to speak to uh, a limited number of folks who uh, would identify as having lived experience, having been homeless. Uh, and we'll talk some more about that as we go forward. These conversations are continuing. So we have some folks that we've reached out to to gauge their interest in being part of the conversation. They're excited and we've scheduled them for in the coming weeks. And there are people who reach out and there may be folks who reach out after this meeting, having seen this, 
who want to be involved in the conversation. And certainly we will reach out to anybody who'd like to be part of that. And as we mentioned, there'll be another report coming in the summer that will give you more information and will provide the, the, the continuing conversation will evolve. As I've said to everybody so far, we've talked to, every time we talk to somebody, we learn more. Um, and, and we understand issues from different perspectives. So that will be coming. We can move on. So these are some of the things we've heard. You have more details on these items in your appendix to the report. People have told us that at the core of the housing and homelessness crisis is a lack of suitable housing stock. And it's not one type of housing. There are folks that a rooming house type situation is something that they can manage well and they're comfortable with. Other folks need supported housing, which comes in a variety of levels. And some folks simply need a place that is affordable with their income. And the secondary, or not secondary, but the second core issue that people have told us about is poverty. And more and more service providers are telling us they're having people coming looking for housing support simply because they don't have sufficient income to afford a place to live. Um, and we know from some of the existing supports, for example, the uh, the Archdiocese has told us that in their units, they have somebody who works full time and they have a full time student, both who simply can't find um, a place they can afford to live. We've heard from service providers and others in the community that there's a range of feelings about the municipality's history with dealing with homelessness. And it ranges from optimism. There are people who are very excited that we are out in the community asking new questions and uh, considering new options, it, that it, optimism is, is cautioned because they are waiting to see what we do, how we move forward, what changes we make. Uh, there's disappointment in how long it has taken for uh, some things to be addressed and to move forward. And there's frustration and there's anger still, uh, a lot stemming from the August 18th uh, actions where we moved people on. Uh, people have described traumas that, that they suffered through that, that time period, and there hasn't been a, an acknowledgement of that. Uh, everybody has told us that there have always been rough sleepers in our community, and there will be. Uh, it is never the goal to have somebody sleeping rough in the community. Uh, and I think one of our goals long term has to be to continue to explore innovative and cutting edge ways to try and support someone to, to give them a place to live where they feel safe and they're stable. Um, so we will continue to do that, but almost, most service providers have told us, they've told people, given them a tent and said, I'm afraid your best option right now is to go sleep outside. So we know that's happening. We need as a municipality to provide an option uh, for those people. There's a crisis for people in care. So we heard from a variety of stakeholders, uh, children coming out of care, so they've aged out of the child protection system, uh, people coming out of inpatient medical care, mental health care, and people coming out of incarceration, all come out in, in some cases without a housing plan, and they end up in our shelter system. Uh, and people have suggested, you know, we should be able to do better for people who come out. We can move on to the next slide. Other things that we've learned, the mental health supports for people are insufficient. We can't get to them fast enough. We can't get them enrolled quickly enough. And even when they do get enrolled, the amount of support that they need can't be met. So it's not frequent enough. The duration isn't long enough to make real substantive improvements in mental health for some people. We know that racism and bias are significant barriers for some residents to find permanent housing. Uh, racism, but also ableism and other issues um, are out there. And we do know of two service providers who have done tests where they have sent um, two different clients into uh, a possible place where they, they could find um, housing. And 
Perhaps the, the person who is a, from a more marginalized community gets told there is no housing available for them. And minutes later, a young um, Caucasian female, well-presented, goes in and they are told there are vacancies. So we know that that is a challenge for uh, some residents in our community. We've been told that we need to engage experts and in being included in the discussions on housing and homelessness. So the municipality in some ways is relatively new to some of these discussions that we're having now. There is incredible expertise in the service provider community. We need to connect with them. We need to be at the tables where these conversations are happening. Uh, so we need to make ourselves available for that. But we also need to realize that the most expertise on living rough, on being homeless, on being precariously housed is the people who are living that experience right now. And while we've talked to a couple of people, um, we need to talk to more. We need to involve them in the longer term strategic conversations that have to happen. And this is so important to our long term, even medium term success is to find opportunities to engage with those those residents. And it takes um, it takes work to do that. It's we need to uh, set those meetings up in a way that is supportive, that's trauma informed. We need to provide the level of support that those residents will need to successfully be able to contribute the kind of expertise that they have. And uh, you'll see we have a recommendation specifically around that. Uh, in every conversation we've had, people have said, how can we improve communication? That can be with a resident uh, in, who's sleeping homeless, that can be with a resident in the community who has questions and want to know what's going on. It is between service providers. It is between three levels of government in the reaching home conversations. The federal government is there. The provincial government is there. The municipal government is there. The service providers in the middle and is trying to pull all three together. Whereas they say, can we come in one room and, and align better? Uh, some of the, the navigators and uh, workers working directly with folks have good communication networks with, with each other, but could there be better resource sharing and things like that? So opportunities all over the place. And the community has identified many opportunities where they feel the municipality can make a difference. Uh, quite frankly, some of those opportunities are things that we can't easily action. They really belong with the provincial government or with the, uh, with the federal government, or they belong with a service provider who's providing a service. But there are certainly things that we can do that uh, can make a su substantial difference, uh, including just working with some of those folks. And uh, we've also identified that we don't, in most cases, believe the municipality should become, as what I've described, the 57th service provider. Uh, in most cases, we can come alongside those that are working in the community now, doing great work, have the connections, have the systems, and help them be more successful. We can go on to the next slide. The ultimate goal that we need to remember is that every resident of our municipality has a safe, suitable, supportive, and sustainable home. Uh, that's what we want for everybody, and uh, that's where certainly long-term strategies need to focus. We can go on to the next slide. So pending your discussions tonight and approval, uh, what happens? We need to finalize the details and the conditions for some designated spaces. As you can imagine, one of the challenges is, is if we walk up to somebody who is in a space that perhaps is not suitable. And while there's nobody in this space, let's say it was somebody in the public gardens, which is an ornamental garden that we've said is probably not suitable. The moment we walk up to that person and ask them, you know, we need to move on. This isn't a great spot. One of the first questions they will ask is, where can I go? And if we don't have a place that somebody can go, we essentially have to tell them, well, you can't be here but there is nowhere in our municipality that you're allowed to go. And so that is problematic. 
Uh, we need to post signage in those locations that we are going to say, these are places where you could go to sleep rough. Uh, we need to prepare maps and other materials. So we know from other communities that have done similar initiatives, uh, we need to produce maps that would produce a map of the park and would highlight in that space, where could you go? So we're not saying necessarily that you can go everywhere in a park space. We would designate very specific locations. These We could give these maps and information to residents who are looking for where can I go, but we also can provide it to navigators and staff that are supporting uh, people who are homeless so they can help guide them, help provide transportation options um, and make sure that it's very, very clear. Some of the sites that we've suggested in this report will require some light preparation, uh, some cleanup. Other sites are, are more ready to go. We would need to arrange washrooms where required. So some of the sites washrooms are available. Other sites we would need to provide porta potty. Uh, we would need to arrange for potable water. Um, and we are there are a variety of ways to do that. If there's already washrooms, there's already water. And in some cases, we would need to look at providing water in different ways, possibly in some other ways that we provide water during an event. Uh, we would need to do some further planning about compliance and enforcement. So obviously, the first step uh, when uh, the, when we if we move forward is education. The first approach is to go out, talk to people, help them understand where we want uh, people to go, uh, provide support to get there, and then how do we, we take steps beyond that. And we obviously need to meet with service providers, navigators, and engage their help in this work. Um, they've, all stated, you know, they've all stated to me that if there's something that needs to be done, it will go much better if... Um, navigators and are part of the solution and are part of the approach. So uh, those are all pieces there. And we can go on to our final slide, which is the recommendations. So recommendation one is that we is that you direct the chief administrative officer to con continue to support the province and other partners to ensure that individuals have safe, supportive and affordable housing. So that is not only the actions we've taken now, but that as we look to new opportunities uh, to support people who need affordable housing, uh, that we look to be, to be a partner in those initiatives and contribute where we can. Uh, direct the CAO to continue efforts to increase the availability of affordable housing, as described in the body of the staff report. Uh, this includes things like zoning, uh, bylaws, pieces that incentivize developers to create affordable housing, um, and a variety of other, other means such as that. Number three is to direct the CAO to formalize criteria and locations for the designation of overnight sheltering and parks consistent with the criteria and locations described in the body of the staff report uh, dated April 28th. Uh, number four is to direct the CAO to continue to review options to add non-park sites to the inventory of outdoor sites available for outdoor sheltering. So currently we are looking to use the mechanisms that exist to provide options for people to sleep rough and, and shelter, but there are a number of other options we could consider. Uh, vacant land, and if you look to the available land or land that's owned by the province and by the federal government, there is considerable land that perhaps could be used to provide options for sheltering that would not be in a park. And so uh, number four is to direct, uh, direct that work uh, to help us find other locations as well. Uh, number four is to authorize the chief administrative officer to negotiate and enter into a contribution agreement with the United Way to convene a lived experience committee to advise staff. Um, so that is this, let's bring in and support experts who are living this experience to get their understanding and to, to understand their needs, their wishes, how it should be delivered. Uh, and that would include um, a lived experience committee that we would envision would work over time uh, so that we could bring information to them, gain understanding, come back with proposals and continue that. We would hope, uh, based on your support tonight, that we could have the first of those meetings uh, in June. Uh, 
In addition to that committee going forward, we also would probably, through that committee, empower community talking circles where we would gather with groups of, of perhaps like-minded uh, individuals around an issue, which perhaps could be uh, racial bias, it could be issues that are particular to youth, could be issues of people who are sleeping rough in a vehicle. Uh, and we would gather with those, bring them together, have a conversation about that, and that information could feed into staff and could feed into the advisory committee. And then the final uh, recommendation is to direct the CAO to return to council with a subsequent report for additional analysis and recommendations for your actions. So Mr. Mayor, that is our presentation and uh, thank council for their attention and certainly open to questions and comments. Okay, Max, thank you very much uh, for your work uh, on this and the conversations that you've had. Um, I'll go to Councillor Smith with the motion. Hey, Mr. Mayor, I wonder if Ian can put the relevant motion in the chat, because I know we have one because uh, it's the committee as a whole. Can we do that now? Oh, yeah. Okay. So we need to, uh, yeah. So, Ian, what do we need to do to make this a committee of the whole? I have posted the procedure of motion in the chat, and I can post the remaining motions that need to be put on the floor after that is made. All right. I'll do this first. Uh, the Halifax Regional Council waived the rules of okay. order section 831 and 3 to permit committee of the whole speaking rules. Second. Second by the deputy mayor. We can just vote by hand on that in. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So we're in committee of the whole. Councillor Smith. Just, just making sure the motion that is on the agenda is the motion that I'm reading. Nothing has changed with that. That is the motion that I have. That is the most recent motion I have, Councillor Smith. All right. Uh, so I move the Halifax Regional Council one direct the Chief Administrative Officer CAO to continue to support the province and other partners to ensure individuals have safe, supportive, and affordable housing. Two direct the CAO to continue efforts to increase availability of affordable housing as directed in the body of the staff report dated April 28, 2022. Three, direct the CAO to formalize criteria and locations for designation of overnight sheltering sites and parks consistent with the criteria and locations described in the body of staff report dated April 28, 2022. Four, direct the CAO to continue to review options to add non-park sites to inventory of outdoor sites available for overnight sheltering Five, authorized chief administrative officer to negotiate and enter into a contribution agreement with the United Way to convene a lived experience committee to advise staff and six to the CAO to return to council with subsequent reports with additional analysis and recommendations for action. I so move. So was that seconded and by Councillor Stoddard? Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Max, for the presentation and for taking on this work. I, I know we brought you to retirement, but we appreciate you taking, taking it on for sure. And really quickly before I share some comments, I also just have to thank all the staff, the community, the advocates, everyone that's been in the last year and a half, and before that, but definitely the last year and a half, really put this issue on the forefront. Uh, so, you know, I think none of that goes unnoticed and appreciate all the work that, that's happening and led us here today. So because this is Committee of the Whole, I won't say everything that I have to say, and I'll probably ask two of my questions and hear from my colleagues and come back. But, you know, one of the things I, I, I want to say before I ask my questions is really, if we just think about, and Max, you kind of alluded to it, just think about just over the last year, what HRM has been able to do in the, the, the world of housing um, um, and not just housing, like even social policy and really looking at how we support residents in different ways that we haven't done before. I think it's commendable. And sure, most, most folks that, that we might hear from might say that we're, we're muddy, muddying the water and, and other places that we shouldn't be. But I think it's important that we put our hand in, in the social issues and housing and homelessness and et cetera, et cetera. So 
you know, being able to change bylaws quickly, being able to broker deals to have more hotels and spaces that um, weren't initially uh, made for, for folks to stay, being able to use federal money and get those in the hands of nonprofit organizations in all of this during a pandemic, I think there is important that we, we commend the work that we've done. But we also understand that there's been some difficulties along the way and some issues, and, and we, can't, we can't shy away from that. It's also important that I'll, uh, to highlight the, you know, the role that the province plays and just for some context for, for folks. So the Office of the Municipal Affairs, their budget uh, is 400 million. The Office for Addictions and Mental Health, their budget for that office is 250 million. The Department of Community Services budget is $1.2 billion. HRM's total budget is $1.1 billion with, with 180 going to the province. So looking in the last year with a fraction of the resources that the province has to deal with these issues, we've been able to make some, some pretty good strides. So I just think it's important for folks to remember that when we say it's not our mandate, it's not because we're trying to pass a buck. It literally and legally is not our mandate and we're doing the best we can with the resource we have. What I will say around the, the homeless encampments and, and then I'll ask a question and I'll save some comments for later out there from colleagues is we, for me personally and, and from, from research, uh, we, you know, encampments are not a solution for homelessness. It's, it's the goal is for for people to have roofs over their houses over their heads and if they need they need supports then we find out a way to get them those supports if we are involved as government service providers etc cetera, etc cetera. and what we have today is uh, encampments because of the situation we're in are are becoming the solution where we don't want that to be the solution we want to figure out how to support individuals in, in ways they need them and what we're doing today and in, in why I support this approach, it's because it's looking at the holistic way of how can we not only support individuals uh, that are on, at encampment sites, but how can we as HRM really put into policy and how we operate, how to do this properly. I do got concerns with some of the things that are in here and I'll speak to those later. Um, but I just really, I really think that this approach and what we're trying to do is very, very important. And we need, we, we need to start to, to really put that down the paper. What, what I want to say, uh, with the question that I'll ask, and I'm going to talk about my concerns when I come back later, um, I just want to know in terms of the next step of the, the reports that's coming forward. So we adopt this. Obviously, the, 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 the motion clearly says some of the actions that will take place. But what do you envision that next report having in it? Is it going to talk about how, uh, how and if we, we, we move folks from um, certain areas and how we integrate it, how we work with service providers? I know it's gonna have more on the engagements. So just really uh, maybe a better understanding on what the next report might look like. Uh, and I'm gonna come back afterwards with some further comments and questions. All right. I see Maggie's uh, joined us as well. Is it Maggie or Max? Who wants that one? Uh, thank you. One of you needs to mute, the other can talk. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, my apologies there. Um, and I, I had my video working and it doesn't seem to be right now, but I'll, I'll start and I'll ask Max to, uh, to continue. In terms of the final report, um, Max has certainly done uh, a great deal of consultation in the first uh, sort of six weeks of, of his work with us, but there uh, definitely remain quite a few um, folks that we need to, to continue to speak to. And I think now that, uh, that this report is public, it also, as he mentioned, may uh, engender more, more questions. So, uh, and it, it makes the discussion a little bit more, more public as well. So we'll, we'll follow up with some additional consultation. But in terms of the, um, the final report, I think what it gives us the opportunity to do is at least an, an initial uh, analysis on, on the success or, or some of the challenges that we're facing uh, should Council approve our, our next steps uh, as proposed today. Um, also, obviously, the, uh, the lived experience piece um, is an important component that we've only really uh, scratched the surface of so far. So that, you know, there are a number of pieces that we would need to look at in order to um, 
and to come back with a more fulsome report in this in the summer to uh, to council. Um, but I'll hand off to Max so that he can uh, can fill in as well. Uh, so Max, show my special project manager uh, for Parks and Rec. Uh, so Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. I think what we'll see in the next report is also some longer term. Um, how do we how do we proceed through? So some more strategy um, pieces. Uh, how do we work with the province? Uh, to, I also think we're going to spring, summer, sort of September is one time of year. We have to have a, a, a strategy that will take us into winter as well. So there'll be those components. And uh, we'll also, I think, be considering how do we align with the work of service providers? Uh, what are their plans? All of those other supports that are gonna come online, such as the, uh, the Overlook, which is uh, scheduled to come online uh, sort of September. Um, we'll, as those, all those resources come on, things will change and what we may need to do will change. And so we'll articulate all of that in the next report. Thank you, and Mr. Mayor, you can put me back on the list. Thank you. Um, just for those at home, the Overlook is the uh, the building in Dartmouth that will accommodate a number of people. Uh, I don't think it's a secret any longer, the, the former motel. Uh, Councillor Mancini. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Uh, Max, uh, first of all, thank you for your work on this file. Uh, I know that you've been a long time advocate for housing. And so I was very excited to hear that you were taking on this file and I appreciate your work. So uh, there's three items I wanna bring up right now and I'll come back afterwards, but I wanna talk about the wraparound services. I wanna talk about the overnight uh, camping areas you've identified in your report. And I also want to expand upon the uh, consultation that you've done in the community to bring us to this point in time. So my first question is, Max, and uh, you know, where are we with the wraparound service in our conversation with the, pro the, the province? Because in your report, you talk about if we allow uh, tenting uh, in some of our parks, that one of the first things we should be doing is engaging with one of our navigators, have conversation. But what about the wraparound services that is needed uh, that we all know and we talk about? Because uh, allowing uh, a tent uh, at a park and someone have somewhat of a shelter is very short term, they really need those wraparound services. How do we guarantee uh, that the province is part of this? Because they have the expertise, they have the resources to do that. And my next question is around the uh, overnight camping sites you've identified. I'm trying to understand why is the overnight, just a one night uh, uh, camping location required? I understand why the long-term camping uh, locations are required, but it's puzzling to me why we need that overnight site. Because my, my opinion, having uh, an overnight camping site and then having someone, uh, police or bylaw or whomever, uh, knock on that, shake that tent and say, okay, you gotta leave, it's 8 a.m. 8 a.m. is problematic. It's gonna, uh, potential for a conflict is gonna occur. So I'd like to understand about that overnight, what's your rationale behind that? And the third item, if you could expand a little bit in your presentation, you showed us in slide five, you talked about community consultation, like we're more than 20 groups and numerous individuals and so on and continuing our conversation. And I, I, I'm really pl pleased to hear about the, uh, the Voice Advisory Committee, or as you mentioned in your presentation, uh, creating that lived experience committee that would get together and meet right away. But you know, up until this point in time, were there conversations with those that are actually living rough? So those are my first three questions, and, and then I'll wait for your answers and I'll come back later. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mayor, if I may take the first uh, sure. question, then I'll hand off to Max. Maggie McDonald, Executive Director for Parks and Recreation. Councillor, in terms of uh, service provision, we've had discussions with the province. The province currently um, supports us when, uh, for example, new, uh, new shelters or tents pop up in, in parks. We do inform them and they uh, support us with um, by sending out service providers and have committed to continue to do that uh, with this uh, new proposed approach, but also they're looking at whether there are other ways that we can, they could provide uh, additional supports uh, and sub wraparound support services um, given this, uh, in this new proposed model. Um, and then I'll hand it off from so to Max. Cool that, Maggie, thank you for that. I mean, so, so is there a time frame with that? So all of a sudden we have a, a tent that's new to a site 
uh, the navigator, I assume, so it goes in, but based on Max's uh, uh, report. Uh, but then how soon is the province stepping up to get in there? Because our challenge here is where do people go? What help can we have uh, help, uh, offer them? Is that, is that really defined? I'm glad to hear they're saying they're willing to do that, but I've heard in the past that can be a length of time. Is there any assurances that's going to happen immediately? Uh, through you, Council Mayor, to the councillor, the uh, what the experience we've had lately is that it's been fairly um, they've been fairly responsive, but the, the, there are certainly limits to the capacity of service providers as they as it currently exists. So um, it will be uh, will be governed a bit by uh, by capacity as well. Well, they're limited. We have none. So <laughs> just to be clear on whose role that is, thank you, Maggie. I appreciate that. Okay, Max, you got the other questions. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, through to the, the councillor on the other questions. So the overnight option, we do know uh, that there are people who do not need to sleep rough on an ongoing basis. Uh, there are people who need, uh, because the shelter was full, uh, or in some cases they got to it late, um, they just need a night and they'll be able to have another option. After they could that, there are people who they could go to the other site that's longer term, right? It doesn't have to be a designated just overnight. I mean, they could join uh, another group that's there for a longer period of time, right? Yes, they could. Absolutely. Um, that's something that we can do. Uh, and we've taken some of that also from some of the municipalities that we've seen have dealt with that, who have created overnight options um, that work for some individuals. Uh, but you know, Councillor, you're absolutely right. They could easily join into an overnight uh, piece. There's no issue there at all. And you wanted uh, to talk a little more about community consultation. Um, so what we did uh, was we reached out to sort of any of those community organizations that have participated with HRM. Uh, we've reached out to people who they have recommended we've talked to. And uh, that list just continues to grow. So Max, uh, sorry again to interrupt, but dear, so are we having conversation directly one-on-one -on -one with those that are living rough? We have had conversations with two people um, that have identified that they have lived experience of sleeping rough. Uh, but what we really want, and why it's sort of the most, why it's the recommendation, is that that is that's so essential to our success, especially as we develop a longer term strategy as, as I described to uh, Councillor Smith. And that's why this lived experience committee is so critical. You do need to remember, and we need to remember as we ask those folks to come and participate, there is a lack of trust that will take time for us to build. We need to have a trauma informed facilitator who is able to hold that space. Um, and there will be a number of steps, which is why uh, that is in the recommendation today as it's so important and we need to get it started right away. Thank you, Max. Mr. Mayor, I'll come back. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to say, folks, because it's community of the whole, people can speak a number of times. I'm going to be a little tighter on the time. That was uh, seven minutes. So I'm just going to try to, as much as possible, let Max answer the questions. You can come back as many times as you wish. Yep. Councilor Mason. I feel seen that you said that right before I spoke, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, I think colleagues uh, and, and to the many members of the public and, and our staff who are watching, it's pretty clear that uh, status quo is not an option with uh, encampments in parks during this housing crisis. And I think that what's been presented to us, while there's things I don't agree with, and I've, I've already signaled with some members of council, there's amendments I'd like to make. I think it's the least worst option. I think this is, uh, uh, you know, starting to bring uh, a little bit of order to enable us to better provide services, uh, you know, human rights based protections and services to folks who find themselves in this uh, critical bit of need uh, that uh, no one should find themselves in. Uh, I've said to a number of councillors and, and to folks in the community, uh, you know, I too am worried that the province isn't engaged, but we have a role. We've always had a role. Municipalities are the first responders. We're the first on site. I remember shortly after getting elected, they had the train derailment over the Bow River Bridge uh, in Calgary. And Mayor Nenshi went on at length about what that means when you're the municipality and you've got to actually coordinate that response uh, to keep your community safe. And often, 
you can't even get the people at the federal government or the company to tell you what's in the train. Our job is to make sure there's police and firefighters and that we are ready when there is a natural disaster. And I think the report, we're going to focus mostly on tenting and camps today, but Max, you did a great job talking about things like supporting MOSH and uh, Housing First, potentially, uh, you know, how are we going to support the navigators? Uh, we're already through the defund report talking about mental health response and supports uh, because of Councillor Mancini. We've already talked about a sobering center. You know, these are all the kind of thing where you like when we find someone who has nowhere to live and nowhere to go in the street and the shelters are full. We need to have a plan for that. That's a first response plan. The problem, of course, will be that just like when the police take someone for a mental health uh, consultation and possible admit at Abbey uh, or Nova Scotia Hospital, that sometimes the police end up spending 12 hours there waiting to get them through the admit because the province doesn't have the resources they should deal with those things. But our job is first response. We need to get that in place. And I think this is one of those things. Uh, you know, I want to emphasize to the public, it's not an unwillingness on the part of council. And I think uh, Councillor Smith already laid this out when he talked about the money. It's about the lack of fiscal capacity to build housing. If the Liberal government hadn't cancelled the NDP uh, government's proposal to build Bloomfield, we'd have 451 bedrooms and bachelors right now. And that would have cost $130 million to build. That That is a lot of money. We can't do that. That's more than Cogswell. And Cogswell is going to pay for itself by and large through uh, taxes and sale. It's beyond our ability to, to, to solve these problems. But we can play that first response role and support the province and our partners and, you know, making that rapid housing stuff happen. Uh, but the province has to lead. So to get to the point here, I think we do need to have designated sites. We absolutely do because, you know, we want to provide porta potties or have them near toilets, have hand washing stations, um, you know, ensure that there's potable water, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, we need to uh, make sure that those encampments are in a place that they maximize uh, safety for all. So, you know, I'm not in favor of the overnight camping, the one night camping. And I also think that we need to outline really clearly in our direction to the CAO that we don't want the police involved in enforcement because that's mostly what we're hearing from our community and from even my own colleagues is we're worried this is going to turn into another uh, major action. We want this to be, as Max just said, trauma informed. We want to take our time. We want to work with our partners and we want to try and transition people to sites that can be properly provisioned and are safe. Uh, and, and finally, and I won't make those amendments now because I want to hear from my colleagues, you know, this is just a step on the journey. We are going to have to iterate. This is not going to be a perfect solution. We will find out where it doesn't work as we go and we got to be ready uh, for that. But again, status quo is, is not good enough. So my questions for staff are, uh, you know, do we feel that we could just have camping sites and then add more camping sites as we go? Because one of the big criticisms we're getting is not enough sites for the, you know, I know that when they do the count, that's between 20 and 80 people who are sleeping rough. We need to make sure that whatever the number is, we have a supply. Will we be able to do that? Uh, will uh, uh, we be able to convert or come back to council with a dip for a further discussion about converting the overnight camps to full night, full time camps? And what are your thoughts on alternative enforcement or not even enforcement support? How are we going to do this? We only have one social worker. How are we? Who's going to go and have these conversations and work with these folks and our service providers to try and make this transition? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you, Mayor, to the Councillor, in terms of the uh, conversion of sites from overnight to uh, multi-night site, um, we would want to go away and look at the sites. The sites um, that we've uh, identified may not be appropriate for multi-night stays. They may need other supports or, or may, not, uh, may not sort of fit what we think would be um, suitable for uh, multi-night stays. But um, so we'd recommend that we would come back uh, if we if Council's uh, feedback was that uh, to, have, to convert some of those overnight sites into uh, multi-night sites. Um, with respect to enforcement, um, that's we have the uh, we have an outreach worker, we have the the navigators. That's they're not enforcement. It's important that we not rely on them for enforcement. They need to be able to provide supports to people and be uh, viewed as supportive um, resources to those who are experiencing homelessness. 
Uh, we do have compliance officers who uh, we have three compliance officers and a supervisor uh, who are focused on, on, on parks, not on parks solely, but who are focused on parks and are currently um, out in parks every day. So that would be our sort of our, our first um, approach. As you note, Councillor, though, this is uh, this is new and we expect that we will have to iterate and we will have to to learn as we go, um, but certainly the, the initial um, piece is a, always around voluntary compliance and education as Max mentioned, uh, and that would be our first sort of approach would be through those compliance officers to, uh, and, and information and education to encourage people into, into those sites that we've identified. Great, thank you, Meg. Councillor Purdy. Thank you, and thanks, Max. It's nice to see you again. Hard to believe, first time I met you, I was a crazy out of control teenager starting my fitness career under Debbie Murphy. So uh, good to see you. Thanks for this report. Thanks for the work. Um, before I begin, I just want to say that I know I am privileged. I don't know why. I sure know I don't deserve it. But when I look back over my life, that could have been me. I could have ended up on the streets very easily. And I don't take it for granted that phrase that says, there go I, but for the grace of God. So I just wanted to preface what I'm gonna say with that acknowledgement. When I read the report, I was shocked. Basically the proposed solution as I understand it is to spread and repeat what has been happening in the urban core parks to residential parks outside of the urban core where there are no support services, no transportation besides Metro Transit, no amenities for the homeless. I can't speak to the flag parks in other districts, but I can speak to the potential use of the Coal Harbor Commons in District 4. This park space is not a viable, safe, or sustainable area to place an encampment. This commons is sandwiched between two local high schools. It is the hub of an interconnected trail system between communities, schools, Coal Harbor Place, and the library. It is a sports heavy commons with multiple baseball fields, soccer and football fields, tennis and pickleball courts, a skate park, a duck, con a duck pond. It is heavily used by youth. One question I had while reading the report is, who did staff consult with about this space? Our CMP, school principals, Coal Harbor Place, the library? Was there any input from these important stakeholders as to any ongoing concerns around that space already that may be exasperated by the placement of an encampment? The Coal Harbor Commons is a dedicated planned floodplain. It becomes a lake where ducks swim during moderate to heavy rainfall events. The ground around the flooded portions is soggy and not fit for camping. Did the report take into consideration that the washrooms are not accessible to the public, but are run by the Baseball Association in agreement with HRM operations? Does this mean I don't want the homeless pop population on our doorstep in District 4? No, it's already here, but it just happens to be more hidden and more youth centric from what I've heard. Last year, I was asked to try to find solutions for homeless youth who are underserviced on this side of the bridge. I spoke to anyone who would take my call from here to Ontario, and I was told by every professional I spoke with to not proceed with any good intention shelter space unless it was headed by a professional. They all said that the ramifications of any well-intentioned help would be bad. Yet, I can't help but think this is exactly what we are proposing to do with this report. Who will be responsible for security? Who will enforce the rules? Are we just setting everyone involved up for failure with this plan? These are serious concerns. Residential parks, especially those utilized by kids, youth, and adjacent to schools should not be considered at all. This may sound gullible, but we have commercial space for lease across the municipality, easily accessible by transit. We have some space here in Coal Harbor. We can get cots, dividers for privacy. We can house guests. 50 per location. We could hire trained staff and recruit volunteers. We could use the space for community outreach during the day, roll all the cots away and offer life training skills, uh, group therapy sessions with professionals, partner with groups like Solutions Learning Center or others for work training. This would be available for all who want it. 
Homelessness is a symptom of many different issues. The real solutions are affordable housing. And ironically, at the time that we desperately need affordable housing, house prices are skyrocketing, rents are increasing. Even if people have jobs, there's still no affordable place to live. We need rent subsidies, public housing. We need transition housing, which is an important component for finding that middle ground. We need community outreach drop-in centers. We need real collaboration between all parties. One of the recommendations from the report said that HRM wasn't even invited to some of the tables where these important issues have been discussed. Why and what needs to change? In the meantime, have we considered an advisory panel? We have a motion on the floor here for a panel of those with lived experience, which is good, but we also need a panel of those directors and leaders and professionals, both inside and outside of HRM, perhaps even NGOs in the field who have experience and can advise and inform council. It is not good to be reading the report in the paper today from a leading professional in the city who did not seem to be informed or consulted with the recommendations of this report. I will not be supporting section three of this report. I strongly oppose the use of any residential park for encampments and especially the Cole Harbor Commons. There are other dignified alternatives, which I just mentioned that we could do. So I would like to propose an amendment to this motion, if I may. Councillor, can we hear from everybody first and then come back and do the amendments? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. So I'll put you down for a second time. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Councillor Blackburn. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I love uh, Councillor Mason's assessment of this situation because uh, it reminds me of uh, my favorite line from the movie Argo. This is the best bad idea we have, sir. Um, thank you so much, Max, for this incredible report. Um, and uh, thank you to the number of residents who've reached out over the past few days to express their concern. And I think based on that feedback, I'm gonna go back to basics for a minute. And if, you're, if you will indulge me, uh, I'm gonna sort of channel my inner uh, Republican or uh, Representative Katie Porter for a minute. This is HRM. This is what we do for a living. We got potholes, transit, library, building permits, community planning, traffic lights, garbage collection, uh, building sidewalks, and a dog license if you need it. That's what we do for a living. Now, a little further down the street, we've got our friends, the province of Nova Scotia. Don't forget Here. police and fire. Oh, well, that, that's you know not an exhaustive list by any means. Here are our friends down the hill province of Nova Scotia. They look after things like nursing homes, recruiting of doctors, rent control, emergency shelter beds, setting the minimum wage, provincial gas taxes, affordable housing, and fishing licenses. So I think with that, I think we're coming at this from an agreed set of facts. And first of all, I do not envy our staff at all. They have been asked to do an impossible task with no background in housing and homelessness, but we're running out of spare millions that we can dig out of the sofa cushions to dedicate to this issue. And the level of our expertise is reaching its limit. Um, I think I need some more information before feeling comfortable with this approach. Like I'm really concerned about the enforcement piece and how that is going to play out. Uh, I don't want to see August 18th recreated in 16 different locations. And I'd also be interested in a jurisdictional scan. I mean, Toronto tried this, Vancouver tried this, and they both had disastrous results. Uh, and I don't know why we think the outcome here would be any different. Uh, Fredericton, they thought they had a solution. They went down that path, but they abandoned it. And so let's find out why. And so finally, I got to say, where is the province? I mean, they get barely a mention in this report. This is not our Halifax urban issue. This is a social services issue. Emergency shelter beds are their responsibility. And you got to help me understand here because the province had no problem dipping their fingers into our water glass when it came to development and setting up the housing task force. 
but they seem to have forgotten the emergency shelter beds. And I just, I can't understand why we're twisting ourselves into pretzels looking for municipal lands for this purpose. Is the province looking at crown land that can be used for this purpose? And if not, why not? Uh, I mean, if, if tents started to pop up under the statue of Joe Howe or over in the backyard of the Lieutenant Governor's house, the province would be moving pretty, da pretty damn quick. So I guess, you know, the one request that I have, is it possible to have the minister brief us on the, the number of emergency, sh uh, the number of emergency shelter beds that they are creating, where they are creating them, and when they're going to come online? Because I'm telling you, it's getting right some frustrating being the safety net for the social safety net. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Austin. Was there a question there for Councillor Blackburn? I didn't hear any question. Oh, well, I, okay. about the minister and the briefing. Where is the province? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's not really a question. It's a point. It's a point. <laughs> <laughs> Rhetorical question. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just didn't want to jump the queue here. Um, uh, I want to thank staff for the work that's been done on this. Um, you know, I, I, I am supportive of the general idea here. Um, I, I, on principle, I just like that we're looking at designating outdoor spaces at all. No one should be living outdoors. We're a wealthy society. We can and should be doing better than this. Uh, and a big part of our the current moment that we are in, in my opinion, it stems from 20 years of basically failed provincial housing policy. Uh, 20 years ago, governments, and this wasn't unique to here, um, we stopped building affordable housing. We just stopped. Metro housing is the same size as it was 20 years ago, but yet we have 150,000 more people in our municipality. And it's kind of like, well, no wonder we're in the situation we're in. As much as I hate normalizing shelters outdoors, we are in a crisis situation and there simply isn't enough space available. There are lots of additional units coming, but even if we get to a place where we have enough units for the need, something that is by no means guaranteed to happen, even then there's still gonna be people who are going to be outdoors. And that means to me that we have to approach this from a practical and pragmatic perspective. People are going to be looking for shelter in our public spaces and we should give some thought as to how that works. What rules and supports do we put around that? Sometimes colleagues, all our choices are awful. And this is definitely one of those times. I think Councillor Blackburn said that well in terms of this is the best bad idea we've got. The choice before us, and this is what I wanna emphasize, isn't people living in parks or no one living in parks. That's not the choice. Our choice is we either designate some places outdoors for people to shelter at, or we continue the current situation where shelters appear in places with no planning or support and where there is going to be heightened conflict with others. There is no third option available to us in the here and now that is getting everyone in, uh, you know, out indoors. Our choice is planned and supported encampments or any park anywhere encampments. The whole situation is complicated further by the fact that we have a third party group going around dropping not to code shelters wherever they want with no concern for anyone else that might be impacted. There is zero discussion right now about whether a specific site is appropriate or not. There is no discussion with anyone else at all and I don't think we can allow that to continue. A lot of the advocates, uh, you know, I won't say a lot, but some um, dismiss the perspective of neighbors and of other park users who end up not being able to use public spaces when there are encampments in them. And I don't think that's fair. Certainly there is prejudice and nimbyism in the mix out there, but the concerns of others, you know, it's more than that. It can't just be dismissed as, well, I don't want homeless people near me. There are impacts. I was struck by a CTV interview, uh, I think it was CTV, um, Jeff Carbono uh, from Dallas was speaking and he said that, that no one should have to sleep in parks and that it's unfair for those sleeping rough. And it's also unfair for those living around folks that are sleeping rough. It's just a dynamic that's unhealthy for everybody. He is absolutely right. And he's also right that the real solution is more housing, but that's not what we get to decide right now in the here and now. The terrible choice available to us right now is to continue the current practice where we de facto allow encampments in any park, anywhere in HRAM, any park anywhere, with all the resulting negative fallout of not having any planning around this. Or 
we designate some places and actually plan for the reality of people needing to shelter outdoors. I don't like either of those choices, but I think having designated spaces that have been chosen to minimize conflict with others that are centrally located and that actually have some supports in place is better than our current status quo. The violence at Star Park last week is a tragedy both for the neighbor who was assaulted, but also for the shelter occupant who has clearly not had an easy life and is now facing serious criminal charges. That is the result of unplanned encampments. Not all parks are the same and some are better able to accommodate people sheltering than in other spaces. We need to make sheltering outdoors better and clearer for everyone while we wait for more spaces to become available. And that's what the report in front of us is trying to do. Um, I don't know if I still have any time, Mr. Mayor. I do have some questions. You can ask one question. You're at 454. So just to 454. ask, ask one. I'll squeeze one in then. So one of the things that people have uh, raised is the math just not lining up. Uh, I think Max touched on that not everyone on the list is actually sleeping rough outdoors. Um, could I'm, I wonder if staff can expand a little bit on how they came to this number of sites and what happens if we if there's more demand than there is space? Like, what does that look like? There we go. Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. The math um, is based on what, what, what people have, have generally suggested we need in the immediacy. So there are additional supported housing uh, pieces coming online. Uh, for example, one of them is the modulars. Now the modulars are not suitable for everybody. As I said, no housing option is suitable for everybody. And there are other ones coming online from some of the reaching home funding and so on. In answer to your question, uh, based on what people told us of the number of people who are sleeping rough, who would want to come into the designated encampment, um, this is the number of spaces we, we've created or suggested. Uh, the reality is there could be more and we would have to then find more spaces um, and expand that as we need to, to meet the need. Uh, and there are quite a few variables in what that need could look like. Um, so in short, uh, this is what a number of people I spoke to suggested um, as a starting point. And you are absolutely correct. Um, staff have gone around to look at other sites uh, to have in our, in our inventory some other options uh, as we would need them. And Barrington, I think, is more than just the four. Sorry, Sam, could you repeat that? The Barrington site is capable of holding more than just four if, uh, if memory serves from past discussion. It shows up on the report as four, but it's a long linear place. Yes, yeah, so some of, perhaps language could be a little clearer, I guess. That location is long and thin, as you described, with different sections. So we could actually hold multiple sites. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you. Council, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, boy, do I have a lot to say. <laughs> First, I wanna say thanks to Max uh, and staff who have been working on this. Uh, but I also wanna give a shout out to the Affordable Housing Association of Nova Scotia. You know, they're, um, they post on their website, uh, the by name list, which includes as of today, May 3rd, 568 people. 568 people that are currently unhoused. 100, uh, sorry, chronically homeless is 417. Chronically homeless, it's 470 people in our city right now today. That number continues to grow every single day. We only have 200 shelter beds in Halifax for 568 people. And if we do what Council Purdy is suggesting and take over social services and create shelters, then we're in the business of shelters. We're in the business of social services. We are not right now. And the only way to be in the business of social services is to renegotiate the Halifax Charter, um, to renegotiate the service agreement, uh, service exchange agreement with the province of Nova Scotia, and to actually sit down with the province and find out, is this what they're going to do? They're downloading their roads to us this summer. Are they going to download homelessness and housing and social housing to HRM as well? Do we take that back? Hey, we did that in the 70s. 
So, you know, I think it's important for this council to think what do we want to do and what can we do uh, in this instant? Now, I have to say, I, I can't support this approach. Um, I think any opportunity that we have to communicate, and I put that in quotes, where these designated sites are, will be meaningless because people who need a place to stay and a safe place to stay will go where, the, where they need to go. Um, now, you know, a little bit of background about me. I left home at the age of 16, dropped out of high school. Guess where I was? I was on the streets. That's where, you know, I was couch surfing and, uh, and, and, and living in a cardboard box for a little while in downtown Halifax. So I got to tell you, people will go where it is that they need to go. And whether or not this council thinks, hey, we're going to designate some spots. Mm -mm, not going to work, guys. It really, really is well-intentioned, but it's not going to work. And it's not going to work, number one, because we do not have the right to go up to somebody and say, hey, are you actually homeless and allowed to stay in this park? We don't have the right to exclude someone from a park. We don't have the right at all to walk in and say, I'm sorry, you're tent number five. You have to leave. Oh, you won't leave? We're going to call the police. And there's a conflict. I am completely against any more conflict, totally unnecessary conflict. I think we all need to come together and agree that we have a emergency shelter crisis. And we have that because the province of Nova Scotia has not stepped up to provide the support and the social services and the mental health care and the health care that's required to support the most vulnerable people in our city. We're not the ones here to do that job. But I think it is up to us to lead that conversation. And so when somebody says, where's the province? Well, they're down the street. Pitch your tents at province house, folks. Pitch your tents on, on provincial land. You know, I think that the, 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 the focus has been on HRM parks. It's not just about HRM. This is an issue across the country, across the world. We're in a desperate situation right now. So here's my questions. I'll be real quick because I have no idea how much time I have left, but I cannot support this until staff comes forward with a real detailed plan as far as how these rules and regulations are actually going to be enforced. Because if, if staff are going to come to me and say, well, we want residents to call 311 if they see a tent up in a park that's not designated, that's not going to work. I mean, that is what's happening right now, right? But we can't stop that because people need to go where they need to go. And so we have to be able to work uh, with those who are uh, and that's why I put forward the, the lived experience advisory, because we well, they're not in this report. Their voices are not in this report. Certainly, we have voices for people who were unhoused, but the most important people that we're trying to help, we haven't heard from them. So I think we need to take a step back. We need to hear from them. We need to have an actual working group that's working towards resolving this issue. And we have to hear directly from those. Do they really want to be in an encampment with four other tents? And what size are these tents? Are we talking about a tent for 10 people, a tent for one person? Are we going to start, you know, enforcing what size of tent people can have? Um, so, and I, do, and I don't think we should be calling this camping because I don't think we should encourage people to be setting fires in our public parks and, you know, roasting wieners and marshmallows and so on. So, you know, I, I think there's a lot of problems with this. And, you know, the other thing, of course, is that the, the reason that the pad sites work that, at Mar Park is because there's a community group that's working with the people at the park. There's a caring group of people that are doing what they can to support those people with food and with, with conversation and connecting them. But if you start, I, I think, if you start putting people just in these designated sites without any kind of managerial or coordination or community connection, it's going to be chaos. So I can't support this. But, uh, you know, the, the first one that I can support, of course, the, Deputy, the second Deputy one Man. I can support. Deputy. Okay, I'll come back. Yeah, I'll get you to come back. Thank but you. I do want to know what the enforcement plan is. Okay, so on enforcement, Maggie, or uh, Max? Through you, Mayor, to the uh, to the deputy mayor. In terms of enforcement, as as mentioned, the first uh, the first piece is always going to be education and, and voluntary enforcement. That's what we are, have tried to practice to this point, and what we would continue to uh, to practice. There 
our means um, to assess through our outreach workers, whether um, folks are homelessness, there is a standardized homeless, uh, there's a standardized assessment that's used um, by shelters and, and by others um, that informs the by name list, for example, uh, that allows us to assess that. Um, you're, you're quite right, there, there may be um, enforcement challenges associated with that, given that, um, that there's not a sort of standard application process. So we do recognize there, there are challenges there, but we do have means to assess whether somebody's homeless. I think part of the, the challenge for the municipality is that um, the, the parks bylaw and, and camping is the only sort of means that mechanism that we have at this moment to permit something. And so it's it's not the best fit in terms of for anyone in terms of how we uh, approach this challenge, but uh, but it is sort of the mechanism that we have as as imperfect as it is. Thank you, Maggie. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Ha, ah, there's so much here. Uh, is this plan perfect? No, I think that's already been established. Will this uh, effort solve homelessness? No, obviously not. Uh, as, as a few other people have already described, is this better than the status quo? Yeah, it is actually. So <clears throat> people are pitching tents in our parks now, our parks, not provincial parks, not federal parks. There's no tent on uh, Citadel Hill. The tents are in Mar Park and, and, and other parks. Uh, they do not have the necessary services they need in those parks. And if people just keep uh, putting sheds and, and tents up and they're dispersed throughout, there's no way we or any service provider can provide the necessary services that all of those need. A couple of years ago, we adopted a new approach, uh, an empathy-based human rights approach. And, and when tents, because I've had, since I've been a counselor off and on, tents in Lower Flynn Park, um, but they're hidden up behind the, the trees next to the CN rail cut. No one really complained about them very much, but it became a lot more visible and we, we had to take an, a different approach. Um, you know, none of these places are, are going to be moved or cleaned up uh, unless we have designated sites with porta potties and water and, and hygiene, and you know, they can have access to social services and supports. Uh, the status quo isn't working for the residents that are in the parks. The status quo is not working for the residents near those parks. Uh, you know, when you think about the, the, in the last year and a half, in Cogswell Park, we had one of the sheds burned down. Luckily, no one was in it. But in Bears Lake in September last year, there was a shed that burned down with a person inside it, and he died. Um, you know, the deputy mayor said, Mar Park is, is working. It's not. Talk to the people in the park. It's not. Talk to the residents who live next to it. It's not. Talk to the kids who walk by it on their way to school who are being harassed and asked for money. It's not. Um, I... You know, Councillor Austin already talked about the uh, assault uh, at Star Park, and that's not the first one. Before August uh, last year, remember the safety issues that we had, harassment, assault. Uh, there were, I think, six arrests, including human trafficking at the encampments. The status quo is not working. Um, I have concerns about some of the, 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 the locations here, uh, and I've talked to Mr. Chauvin about this. Uh, I have the similar concerns that other councillors already raised about single night versus multi-night. Uh, I don't think single night uh, to councillor or deputy mayor uh, Lovelace, what she mentioned is true. I, you're not going to be able to get people to pitch a tent for one night and then at eight o'clock in the morning, have them gone. And residents are going to be calling their counselor. They're going to be calling 311. They're going to be calling the police at 801, at 802, at 805 uh, and saying, hey, you said the rule was eight o'clock and they're still there. Uh, so I, I think there are some issues that we need to work through. That doesn't mean it's a bad plan. Uh, it is, as has already been described, the least worst option we have available. The status quo is not an option. Uh, you know, so I, I think we need to look at all of those. And I've already talked to uh, uh, Max about the sites in my area. I've got four of them in District 9, Bai High Park, Saunders Park, Chocolate Lake, and Raven's Craig. And, and, you know, some of them may or may not work very well. Bai High Park is right next to the 102, the on-ramp and the off-ramp. 
uh, it's very public. I'm not sure if anyone's really going to want to be there and, and, and uh, you know, have a, a shelter there. Um, Saunders Park, we had two tents in Saunders Park last year and there were some issues. So distances from residents. Uh, I think we need to do a little more work in terms of, you know, what, what would be the, the distance from backyards and residents? What would be the distance from walking paths? What would be, you know, distances from roads? You know, we need to consider those things. Chocolate Lake, you know, the tennis court, the play area, the beach, that's obviously not good. But across the street at Chocolate Lake uh, Rec Center, there's a, a not very well used baseball diamond that could work. Um, anyway, Max and I will talk about those, uh, details and, and, uh, those things later, but in terms of this approach, is this a great approach? No. Is it better than, than, than just letting people go wherever and not have the services they need? If we're having an empathy-based human rights approach to this, we need to provide them with the necessities and have them in a place and, and not too many of them so that, the, the social workers, the, the income assistance uh, 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 workers, the, the, the folks who are helping them support them to try and get them into shelters or employment or other things, that they can access them. And so uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to what others have to say, but uh, colleagues, the, the status quo can't continue. Thank you, Councillor. Right on time too. Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Oh my goodness, um, I've I've never had to sleep rough. Um, had to maybe in times in my life, you know, call on friends, all of that kind of stuff. But I have supported people who have someone else in their life decide where they need to live, right? And how damaging that can be to the sense of self um, and what that does. I am really worried that some, and, and yes, it's not perfect. I agree with everybody so far almost. Um, but when we talk about trauma-informed care, I've taken lots of training. I am still not an expert though. But I will say that trauma-informed care takes an awful lot of time. And I think that when we decide these things and we say that there's gonna be a lived experience committee, uh, advisory group that's put together, we need to realize that that's going to take a lot of time to actually work and come together. The Some of these temporary band-aids, though, the language that you use, Max, and by the way, I appreciate your work. Thank you very much. But the language, one of the things that you said about, you know, the staff will bring information to the committee, but the lived experience committee needs to be the ones that tell us what it is that is going to make things better for them in their life and the kind of supports that they need. And we will have people that will be very, very challenging to support. Uh, there are other people that it might be a little bit easier, but I am really worried that how is this with the United Way, this contribution agreement that we make, how will, how will that be designed? How will those people be chosen to be in the committee? And there needs to be some fluidity in that. It can't be that, you know, because some of these people might show up to one meeting, but not show up to another, show up to one meeting and not show up to another. So the non-traditional approach to consultation um, needs to be very fully explored so that we support people in the best way possible to be able to, to participate in that. And I think that that's a big, big piece of how we're going to do this well and how then we behave as being a group that is empathy based, right? And that we are um, respecting and doing a human rights approach. So that that is big for me. Um, the single night, the 8 a.m. to eight, you know, snooze alarm and you're gonna be out of there at eight o'clock, that's not gonna happen. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's gonna work at all. I am fearful of the word um, enforcement. I absolutely understand designated spaces with right supports but we also don't want to ghettoize people either, right? Saying you're here, you're there. Um, I will freely say that I don't know. I tried to map this morning all of the different locations so that I would understand exactly where they're at. But the local councillors, like they'll know that. Um, where Council Purdy asked about, you know, who was consulted when the sites were chosen. I think that's immense, right? That's a huge issue. Um, when we're talking to schools, when we're talking to sports groups, um, local churches, all of that kind of stuff about how they're chosen. I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. Um, and I think there is a way that we can maybe even find a hybrid in here 
Because instead of saying, you know, um, enforcement, you can't be here, but you can be here. Maybe what we need to do is figure out how to make locations more attractive because those locations that are designated then have the kinds of supports that people need and they can easily access them so that someone who is homeless will choose. Because when we think that people are going to do it voluntarily, sometimes I think we're being very naive to think that they will voluntarily go to this designated space um, that we're told. And, and we, we can't afford to be naive anymore. Um, and I don't think that we can afford to make the same mistake that happened in August. I I'm, I'm really think that we need to figure out that lived experience committee do their work. I'm not saying that we need to take a, a you know a pause on things. I think there's some things in the recommendation that I hope that we'll be able to approve today. But I also think I'm I'm really open to what those amendments are going to look like that other councillors have thought. Um, but we should actually vote on those six recommendations. I believe separately um, based on on what we're going to hear in terms of some amendments. Don't know where my uh, five minutes is at, Mr. Mayor, but but I think that the final thought. Um, is have we talked about a mobile support team? We've got people in all different areas on, on the urban core. So has the report looked at a mobile support team that could have right a social worker in addictions, somebody that has trauma-informed background and care? And they're going to be hard to find. Um, I need to tell you, it took me three years to hire a behavior therapist that had trauma-informed care. Um, so that, that's not going to be an easy thought. Um, so, again, I just think that we need to be really ready that this is not something that's going to happen immediately. Um, I don't think it's going to be ready um, in two weeks or even in three weeks. I think this is going to take more time than people might anticipate. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We're on time. Did, did, was there a question, uh, Councillor? That you um, I guess the, the final question might be, um, did the report or are they looking at a mobile support team? Thank you. Maggie or, or Max? Uh, let me turn that piece off there. Um, so uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, uh, absolutely, we have had discussions and people have shared with us uh, several models. What you're describing is traditionally called an ACT team, uh, but we also do have a... Uh, we have existing the MOSH team, which is the Mobile Outreach Street Health Team, that uh, would certainly be one of the agencies I would think that would fit into our thoughts around coming alongside and offering some more help to what's already what's already there. Um, but an ACT team certainly is another is another thing people have suggested. So we'll be looking at that, and that kind of a team also could address some of the questions that we've had about how do we support a, uh, how do we support uh, a resident who, uh, who doesn't want to move and perhaps police not being the primary response, but some sort of team like that, that's got those kind of skills and experiences to, to help. And uh, so, yes, we've looked at that and, and we continue to do, to do more research into that. If, if I may, um... <laughs> Just that the mobile support team could be one level above it because then it's the crises one. So there are a few models in uh, the US and Canada to look at. Thank you. Yeah, there are also some good models in the UK. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. And um, they'll be repeating some of the things that uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon just said. I mean, the reality is, regardless of this report, and whose responsibility this is. You know, the housing crisis, the shelter crisis is here now and it's in our face. You know, we know we need mental health supports, addiction services, social work workers, um, affordable living spaces. I mean, this has all been well documented, um, but there's currently like no indication that these needs are being addressed by the people who are responsible for them. So, um, you know, it's most certainly like this is not going to get fixed overnight, but people are going to need a place to stay tonight. Taking time is is not an option on on some of these actions, um, you know, and while I recognize that more consultation is needed, um, 
and I, I'm glad to hear that staff is going to continue to pursue this. Um, you know, we also need to be agile in our response to dealing with the situation that's currently on the ground. Um, I just want to take a second just to say that I, I realize that staff have worked hard to come up with, with this timely response, and I want to thank them for that, and that it is a work in progress. I think everybody needs to recognize that. Um, out of this report, there are some things that I'm going to echo that have already been said. One is about the management of these sites. Um, when you think about a campground, the way they work is that you have, you know, several campsites in a large area where there are rules and where the, the campground manager can kick you out if you if you don't abide by the rules. Um, but it's in a contained area. I mean, I think what we're talking about is um, several smaller sites over a dispersed area. So I, I am not clear on how that's going to be on how that's going to be managed. And if somebody is not abiding by the rules, then what happens and where do they go? So I, I think one of the realities we're going to have to come to terms with is that regardless of whether we have these sites set up or not, that encampments outside of the sanctioned areas are going to continue to happen. And, um, and we're going to have to continue to figure out how we deal and respond to those situations. Um, you know, Kathy said, um, Councillor Daigle Gammon said, you know, you're thinking about a hybrid approach. And, you know, that's exactly what I was thinking. I was thinking about, I, I, I called it a, an agile response team, you know, where, um, you know, that is, is clearly understood and guided by an approach that um, doesn't just address the needs of those experiencing the homelessness, but also the communities that are being impacted. And, you know, we've got to, you know, and I, this is challenging on both sides. Um, you know, there's a, there, you know, there's a situation in, in my, in my district where, you know, there's an individual who has some very specific high needs it's not clear to me who do I call when and for what, and this lack of this lack of communication or having a viable response also impacts the people who live in the area that also don't understand what is happening, who to call, or what they or what they can do. So um, you know, I do think that that having a, a component in our plan that isn't just looking at the management of the sites that are potentially being identified for camping, but also looking at how we need to continue to respond to things that are happening outside of that. We aren't gonna be able to control all of this. And, and, and you know, I, I, we don't know where this crisis, this shelter crisis, this housing crisis is going next, particularly when we can't see, you know, two years, one year, one month down the road of how we're going to deal with it. So um, I do like this idea of, uh, you know, whether it's MOSH, MOSH is a fantastic organization. They're already spread thin. It's not like, you know, it's like uh, MOSH is awesome. I would love to have 10 MOSHs. Um, you know, if that's the case, how do we support that? And how do we work with our partners to, to make that a reality? That's, that's a great example. But also um, identifying those other supports as well, um, you know, as the crisis team or the ACT team or the hybrid approach, whatever that is, I think that needs to be a key component um, of, our, of our plan. Um, I'm just, you know, in terms of a question, I'm, I, the timelines here, because you, you know, there's an urgency here. Um, you know, while we're putting these new plans in place, is there an immediate response that we can have to the situation on the ground? And what is the timeline for this larger plan? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councilor. You, uh, my apologies. Um, in terms of timelines, so certainly now that we have an outreach worker um, with HRM, that's been a great help in terms of working, uh, to your point, with those who are in, in encampments and tents um, throughout the municipal, in, in municipal parks, frankly, um, now. So the, the challenge is um, that's, that's one person. Uh, there's the navigator. There are the navigators as well. Uh, but that's been a, a big help in, in our approaches to um, 
to these uh, sites and to the, the, the persons who are in them and, and trying to help connect them with services and trying to help manage sort of some of the issues that uh, that relate to having um, having folks living in, in parks. So that's um, in place, but uh, but challenging and also time consuming. It takes time to to work on some of these issues. So um, I would say we're it's it's part of what we're doing now and is part of what we're trying to improve as we go. But we we are limited and and you know staff have made the the point in the report and and councillors have as well in terms of the the limited municipal expertise in this area. Um, which is another cap capacity constraint for us. So, so I would say we are sort of doing some of these things, but but constrained by capacity and constraint. And also, it's a it's a question of timing, um, how long it takes sometimes to do some of these things or to get people connected to the appropriate services. So, uh, there are things in progress, but they they don't materialize as quickly as as people would always always hope. In terms of the the timelines for the the sort of we we see it basically sort of a short, a medium and a long term. And there are sort of immediate steps that we're hoping to, to be able to take. Um, and I say immediate, I guess, would be in the next number of weeks in relation to if we if, if council approves and we have designated sites, then, then we would take sort of steps related to those in the next number of weeks. Uh, but certainly Max's work uh, will continue through to early summer and we're looking to bring back that report in the summer to, to council, which we hope will map out a bit more of a sustainable um, longer term approach to homelessness and, and encampments. We know that it's not going to be an issue that's going to be resolved in any anytime soon at all, but, it, but that's sort of our timeline for a bit of a more strategic approach um, is to bring something back to council in the, uh, in the summer on that. Um, and I had one other point that escapes me uh, at the moment, but if I think of it, I will, uh, I'll return. But, um, but no, the, uh, I think it's sort of a, a medium, a long and a long-term piece and, and they have different uh, needs associated with them. Right, yeah, so yeah, my, I continue to have concerns about like what's happening right now. And, and I know, I know you guys are working on it, but it's, it is a, a real concern. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to start with you, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, CAO, deputies, the teams, the stakeholders, the residents who have engaged. I want to thank every single one of you for being part of a, a shift. Because um, I was on Council, Councillor Hensby and I were on a Council years ago where that our Council at that time, they wouldn't have touched this, the 10 foot pole. And yet here we are today, where we, we are, are facing it head on. Um, we have made some significant uh, changes in progress and contributions to solutions. And I'm just really glad that I'm part of that. I'm glad this is before us today. And, and I, you know, I, I last year, you know, fair, fairly newly mented back to council. Many are new, were new then. We, we had a, we made the decision to take some steps um, good intentions for creating uh, other alternative places for people to to be. Uh, you know, we had a what I consider a catastrophic event last year in August, of which I continue to be sorry that it happened. But uh, it wasn't because I, you know, it, we didn't care. It was because we cared, and um, I continue to be in support of doing something. Uh, yeah, it may not be our mandate. It may not be the, the, the thing that we all thought coming into these roles we would be facing to the degree that we can. Nobody in society is, was, was kind of anticipating this, not in our area of the, of the world. And, 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 and why am I glad we're doing that we need to do something? Why do I feel we need to do something? One, because our residents who are living rough and, and, and unhoused, they need us to. Uh, number two, all of the residents within HRM, they need us to as well. We are all potentially one job loss, one paycheck, one eviction, one catastrophic health scenario away from potentially being in the same position. I, I, I take that very seriously. And when I, when I think about 
uh, counselors who have have expressed today, you know, their experience. I I think about my my own sons and some of the challenges that they have had, and the couch surfing and some scenarios that I wish that we not we as a family had not gone through, but but we did. And those those are not to be judged. They are just facts of living in a society that we live in right now. We're also doing it because, frankly, others aren't. And they should be. So we have, uh, to answer Councillor Purdy's question about why haven't we been asked to be at some of the tables? Well, for years, and this is coming from the work that I did uh, in, in between political roles, um, a lot of the tables would not have thought of it because traditionally councils weren't engaging. They were not coming to the table. They weren't being asked because they didn't, they weren't, they weren't projected in the community as being uh, able to find solutions. So, but this council is, this council is different than any that, would, that I've been on before. Um, and then, you know, and this is going to sound corny. I'm right up there with you, Councilor Purdy, on sounding corny, but I have often in situations come back to Joseph Howe. Is it right? Is it just? And is it for the public good? And, and yeah, it's corny, but these are really important pieces to consider when we're talking about this. And we're not doing it, I'm not doing it, and I don't think many of you are doing it because of the lobbying, the aggressive emails, the Twitterverse, the copied and pasted mess. Frankly, my heart and my head and my commitment to the role is to do something. We won't always get it right. Um, we know that, Frankly, I, you know, right is only a moment in time because of the situation. Every situation is a little different for what it's going to take. Um, I'm a little concerned about, I'm a lot concerned about having not engaged as fully so far with those who are living that experience. Why are we not doing it? Because I, I, I think that we, th those folks, and I'm not them, that's why I can say, the folks living that, they need urgent solutions. They don't, they don't need a medium or a long, they do, they need a medium and a long-term solution, but they're living every day in survival mode. They're living every day, rest assured they're living every day, thinking about how can they get out of this? What, need, what do they need to get through this? Most of them, some of them aren't, and we accept that and we, we, we can work with our collaborators to do that. But, but, but a lot of them, they have knowledge and they have insight into what's going to work for them. Uh, we need to talk to them now, not next month. I have as well uh, further concerns as other counselors did around um, what we are considering to be compliance officers. What, what are we calling it? Uh, compliance, um, enforcement, um, uh, 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 addressing a particular scenario in our parks. Well, it matters to me who they are, what they're planned to do, when they're going to do it, where they're going to manage it, and how are they going to go about it. We don't have that kind of detail. To me, that's important because we're not talking about playgrounds. We're not talking about garbage, we're not talking about litter, we're not talking about people feeding ducks. We're talking about more complex scenarios where trauma informed and training in working with housing and homelessness is vitally important. I have concerns about taking our current complement of compliance officers who may or may not have that background. But let's face it, people say every day to me, I couldn't do your job. Well, I couldn't do a nurse's job. I couldn't do a, a, a reverend's job. I couldn't do these other things, but I feel very well suited to this. It takes a special person to work in this sector. And they, they it takes a compassionate, warm, kind, open-minded, collaborative person with training to be able to find solutions. Because compliance, when I think about compliance, I'd rather think about uh, someone who can work with the, the, the folks that are in these, in, the, in these spaces to prevent scenarios that would escalate to create environments where they have the, the, the needs, the, the, the needs so that they're not, we're not getting into a, 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 an a, a untenable scenario where, where 
uh, law enforcement or um, a, a, a aggressive behavior gets out of hand. Um, so we're talking about people with very, very complex situations. I want to find ways to move parts of this particular report forward. I agree with some of the counselors that status quo isn't working. Um, don't know that we're going to get right, but I want to, I don't know how much time I have left, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you owe me three minutes and eight seconds. <laughs> okay. So well, I'm going to get you to wrap up gonna, and come back if you wish. Uh, you know what? I'll leave it there in that I want to hear more from my colleagues. I really appreciate what we are talking about and I have more to say. So put me on the list. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. Um, Councillor Hensby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And a lot of the things I want to say have been said. Uh, I totally agree with uh, Sean Cleary's comments as well as Kathy Daigle-Gammons uh, in regards to, you know, the wraparound services that are needed. And we need to be more site-specific than taking a generic approach. Um, I wish the mapping would have been a little more um, acute. I didn't, I didn't want to go on to Zane Woodworth's uh, Google map just to look at his uh, um, rudimentary mapping showing what the possible sites were. Uh, looking on our own GIS system, and trying to find the maps uh, according to our HRM system. But uh, some of the park names listed in the report are not listed as that on our database. So uh, there's some clarification I'd like to have seen. But in the long run, I think that uh, the first voice committee, we need to uh, hear from them because uh, from my impression is that a lot of this transit community want to be close to downtown cores. They don't want to be out in the suburban or rural areas. They want to be downtown close to areas where they can uh, find services or, 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 or where the case may be. You know, from my opinion, um, I think the two spots we need to identify right away to try to have some kind of action plan is what they, some people describe it as the Barrington Street Park, but it's basically it's the, under, the overpass going to the McDonald Bridge, that, that, that linear green belt that we have underneath that overpass area would be one spot that should be considered because it's close to downtown Dartmouth, close to the turning point for services. We can, as Tony Mancini mentioned, we can talk about our mobile shower system that could probably be hooked up very easily there with the hydrants nearby um, and storm sewers nearby to, to drain. Uh, I think we need to look at a spot across from the Dartmouth Sportsplex to the Dartmouth Common area. There should be enough area there away from the playground, away from the ball field, but it's adjacent to the transit terminal, adjacent to Sportsplex for access for washrooms and shower facilities. Those things we need to look at and make them work. Uh, limiting, limiting it to four tenths of a site, uh, I think that uh, we need to look at, you know, we talk about density for, for housing developments. Well, you may want to look at an opportunity where, where can, you can have a cluster of, of tents put that can, you know, uh, help uh, one another, look out for one another. Um, I'm concerned about if you let, let them go to some of the parks with too many woods and stuff, there might be shelter in the trees in the woods, but you got to be worried about uh, campfires and stuff. You know, technically campfires are not allowed in our municipal parks, but are we going to allow for designated sites to, have, to allow for campfires to have some warmth that during these cool spring nights? We're not into summer yet. So the question is, where are we going to find these spots? I look forward to hear more from council, but I think we need to find two spots, designate them and make them work as the best of our capacity at this present time, as we wait for other units to become available. I still think about the futures in North End Dartmouth. We got a vacant building there with over 200 rooms available. Why can't we make an arrangement with the property owner? You know, back on the time when we had a state of emergency, we could have done that under the rules of state of emergency. State of emergency has not been lifted. Can we find another accommodation? I think we should. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Um, this is a difficult report. Uh, there is no question about it. And I'm going to start off by saying I'm not going to be able to support it. Um, I do appreciate uh, the work that has gone into the report. It, it has been a phenomenal amount of work. Um, I, I appreciate uh, the consultations that have happened. I appreciate some of the research that has been done, um, but I think that more work needs to be done. I'm gonna to touch on a point that uh, Councillor Hensby made about uh, trying to locate um, some of the parks. Uh, I, I wasn't going to, but, uh, but he brought it up, so blame him. Uh, the fifth item on the list is unnamed site number 29. 
Uh, that is actually unnamed Park 29, and it is in Lower Sackville, um, between Downsview Mall and the King of Donaire, across the street from uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, a two-minute walk away from the Sackville Library, a five-minute walk uh, from an Esso station that's always open, uh, a, a two-minute walk from uh, another gas station across the street that's always open, and it says that it's not close to a public washroom. Um, fun fact about unnamed park number 29, it is, uh, there is a street right nearby in the parking lot of Downsview Mall called Unnamed Street. Um, it, it's curious, they are both called Unnamed Something and they are both owned by Crombie. We don't own that park. Um, so I was going to leave all that off the table, but, uh, blame David. I agree with uh, Councillor Blackburn, uh, who effectively pointed out what we do or reminded us of what we do and what we don't do. This isn't what we do. Um, we have done a lot recently that's not in our mandate, and, and so doing something about this uh, does make sense. But I don't think it's this. Um, and I agree that something needs to be done. Um, we do need to consider the enforcement piece. Uh, some people have said that they don't want the police involved. Uh, some people, uh, I, I, can't, I don't think they've been in this meeting, but we've certainly seen an, e an email where they've said police should not be involved in, in enforcement with this. There are some times when police have to be involved. There are criminal activities that happen sometimes, and police have to be involved uh, sometimes. So we can't just say it should never be police. Um we just have to accept that it is going to be police sometimes. Uh, Sean, you mentioned that uh, the status quo uh, cannot continue. Um, the unfortunate thing is the status quo is going to continue. Um, what this report does is provide something of a Band-Aid. It provides um, an option for 64 out of 500 people. Are the other 400 and change people uh, not going to be homeless anymore. I don't think so. They're going to be part, uh, camping or, or tenting or um, sheltering somehow, somewhere in exactly the same situation that they're currently in, just not in these parks that we've said that they can be. And if we go up to someone, we fill up these parks where they've said that they can be, we go up to someone and, and say, uh, you're not in the right park. You have to go over there. We've now directed an overcrowding situation. I, uh, I can't see how that is going to work at all. Um, one of the challenges that I'm seeing that we're going to be doing with this is spending a lot of money and a lot of energy doing something that is new, that is interesting, that has failed miserably in other places, but we're going to be trying it too. Um, and I don't think that's a good use of our resources we have a finite amount of money, money and energy. The first thing that we need to do is what we need to do. We need to do those things that are in our mandate first. The second thing that we need to do is things like this, things that are not in our mandate, um, but that we have capacity to do. And I'm not sure that we have the capacity to do this, but we can only do those second things that we need to do if we have already done those things that are in our mandate. If we aren't able to um, have additional firefighters or buses or get paving done or do whatever the heck else we need to do because we're dealing with this, it's a challenging problem until it's boiled down to one of these things is in our mandate and one isn't. Um, and I think we need to first look at what's in our mandate and make sure that we're doing that make sure that we're doing it well, make sure that we're doing it efficiently, uh, and then do things that are beyond that. Uh, the $50,000 earlier today was, was an example of, um, for Ukraine, was an example of, of funding that isn't in our mandate and that's fairly easy to do. It's not going to take a whole lot of time and energy to say, here's $50,000. Um, but what we're, what we're endeavoring on here is going to take a lot of work uh, to try and set it up, to try and make sure that we've got the right model, 
uh, to try and enforce it. We are going to have to enforce it. We are going to have to to uh, consider those people who are spending a second night in a place that has been listed as it's only overnight. We never did get an answer to why it's only one night um, other than more studies required. I think more studies required, but we didn't get an answer to that question about why it's in this report as that. We've heard a number of people say that just because it's uh, the best of a bad set of options, um, sorry, they, they have said that it is the best of a bad set of options. That doesn't mean we have to do it. It, it means that we have to recognize that it's the, the worst, sorry, the best that uh, we've come up with so far. I think we have to keep looking. I think we have to uh, keep on looking at what other things we might be able to do. I don't think that it is in this report. I don't think we should designate these areas. Um, Kathy used the term ghetto-wise, uh, and, and that is an apt description. If you look up what that says um, about people having fallen on economic hardships, we are creating communities of that instead of what is already happening. I don't think that's something that I can stand behind at all. I do that's think we need to look for additional options. Can you, can yep. you bring it to a close then? Bottom line, I can't support this report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Outfit. Um, thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the uh, report and presentation, Maggie and uh, and uh, Max. The um, the first thing is, and I'm I'm going to wait to hear what some of these amendments are before I make my mind up completely. But it's a non-starter for me is the the one night, and you know. Oops. in theory, putting our compliance officers and ultimately police in many cases, I, afraid, I fear, into the idea of having to move somebody out at eight o'clock every morning. Um, it's just beyond comprehension to me, frankly. Um, the wor the um, I worry, I, I'm actually worried that we're potentially making things worse. And that's why I'm, I'm going to hear more people speak and I'm going to hear more of the... Uh, Amendments. I'm actually worried that we're making things worse because you know we'll be designated areas. How will we control the size, the numbers, the number of tents? Uh, if some people try to make the things more permanent there than in tents, what happens? I remember, Mayor, when I was your your deputy, and this first happened, we had some great group of service providers come together, and one of the things that they pleaded with us with was to get find something indoors find an office tower, find an arena. They don't want parks. They don't want camps. They don't want encampments, be they large or small, because it's harder for them to provide the services there. And it's harder for the folks who live there as well. And yes, it's hard for the people around them as well. So I'm a little bit worried that while we have stepped up to do some really good things, like the, the arena, like the... Uh, the modules, like helping pay for hotels, etc. I'm worried that in our haste to be able to refer people to somewhere so we can go in and remove the tent or the shed, that we may be, I, I literally worry that we could be making things, things worse. Um, I don't think we should use the term camping. We'll come up with a better term than camping. Um, I am also a little bit worried that you know, what, what I don't understand is in BC, it went to court. And Vancouver got in trouble for not providing housing for people because it's in their mandate to provide it. It's not in our mandate to provide it. To our credit, we have stepped up to try and make a difference. I don't understand how the province gets off so scot-free on this. I don't. And it's not just their land. And it's not just where the camping should be, as some of my colleagues have said. But why? Why haven't there been legal challenges just like there were in BC? to say you've got 200 and you need 500. Oh, well, well good old HRM, well, we'll come along, we have reserves, we have whatever, we'll just take it over and do it. And hopefully they'll provide the wraparound services. So I wanna hear the, the uh, amendments, I wanna hear some more, but I am truly very worried that by calling 
congregating people. I mean, we've had hopelessness for so long, and I can tell you, and Paul, you probably can as well, where they, I almost said camp, where they live in the woods in Bedford or in Sackville, et cetera. Never just bother anybody. Nobody bothers them, they don't bother anybody. Am I worried? Yes, I, do. I think it's disgraceful that they're there in the winter. Yes, I do. And, and I'm not that hard on mutual aid in some of these other groups because I think they did bring attention to this by trying to give something better than a tent to these folks. I did, we need to keep working with the province to even bring them something better than a shed or a tent. So we'll see what others have to say, but I am quite worried that we may be making this inadvertently worse trying to set up designated areas so we have the legal ability to redirect people to other locations. I, I'm a little worried about that. Here, let's we'll see what others have to say. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Morse. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, everyone. I think we're actually making progress here. I'm encouraged. I think we're getting somewhere. Um, I, I basically think uh, I agree with having designated spaces, um, not because I like these options, I think they're all terrible, <laughs> but I think having designated spaces and providing the basics of water and washrooms is just the minimum that needs to happen. Um, I think it's better to know where people are, where the majority of people are who are sleeping rough than to not know. And um, at least it provides some possibility of linking people with the services that they need. So that's why I'm, I think that's probably the best option. Um, but I, I really think we're gonna have trouble <laughs> managing these sites, all kinds of trouble. Um, my, my question is um, about whether the risks were considered when, when choosing the potential sites. Some are more visible than others, and I think we'd be better off to have visible sites. Um, there's one at the mainland common, for example, that concerns me. It's near a high school, and it's not very visible. If I have, if I know exactly where it is, it's not going to be visible from the road. It's a it's a pathway where the students use a pathway to get to the high school. If they're going through a camping area, it's just not very visible. So I, 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 my question is just around what what risks were considered and was visibility part of choosing the locations? Thank you. Maggie or Max? You want to take that one, right? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, uh, certainly visibility was something we considered. Uh, one of the things as we selected locations for consideration was to provide uh, some variety in locations so that some were um, more visible than others and they because we know that one size doesn't fit all. Uh, I believe it was uh, Councillor Outhit who mentioned there are people who live sort of deep in a wooded area in not just in Sackville or Bedford, but all parts of the municipality. Um, so there are those folks who want to be a little more isolated, a little more further away uh, versus some that do want to be downtown peninsula, able to walk to such services as Hope Cottage or the Brunswick Street Mission or Direction 180. Um, so we certainly did consider visibility and we considered trying to provide a, uh, a variety of options uh, so that people could make some choice based on preference. And di we did look at things like distance from schools uh, and uh, a variety of other factors I think we listed in the, in the report there. So uh, hopefully that answers the question. It does, thank you. And I, I have a lot of concerns about the sites that are less visible. So, th but thank you very much. I appreciate that response. Thank you. No, and, and thank you for that, that, that those thoughts, uh, Councillor Morris. Thank you, Councillor and uh, Max. Uh, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is a tough decision to make. And I can understand wanting to separate the different um, clauses and numbers here, because it would make breaking them out a lot easier. Um, I am not, as some have said, I'm not in favor of the eight to eight suggestion. I mean, we only have at this time, three compliance officers and a, a supervisor. And I think 
that they would be in risk, especially if eight of, like someone always already said, but I just wanted to reinforce it. Um, if somebody doesn't want to leave at eight o'clock and they have nowhere to go in the first place, um, where are they going? Are they going back on the streets? Are they going to be going around the corner and waiting for, for the compliance officer to leave? You know, it's, um, it's a touchy situation. And as far as the um, open parking, um, open, sorry, open areas, um, again, you have to limit the amount that are out there. You have to, you know, you don't want it to be a place that gets crowded or, you know, again, they're, you know, too close to each other and they can't, you know, there are homeless people, like you said, that want to have their space. They don't want to be right on top of each other. That's the reason some of them go back in the woods is because they're by themselves or isolated and that's what they want. I mean, I can remember years ago, um, there was a gentleman on Spring Garden Road and he was homeless and he sleep on this particular bench. Any hour of any day, any month, any year, you'd see him on this bench and there could be snow piled up like a like a. <laughs> like a hill or a balloon over him but you know everybody knew he was okay they would check to make sure you know he was we gave him a little um rub on the arm that he was you could find his arm <laughs> you would find that you know he was still alive and and breathing and he was doing fine and when he got up he just shook himself off and carried on you know but he specifically wanted to be homeless he wanted to be there and there are going to be there are going to run into situations where that happens um, and as said, you know, there are people that are living from pay to pay um, that have to go from overdraft for 24 hours and go back into overdraft, um, single moms, and they're all close to being homeless and uh, couch surfing, living in your car, they're not as visible, but they still are homeless. The only other thing I wanted to mention is um, I had a resident that was a homeless person and he was trying to clean up. The unfortunate thing is he suffered from depression and he, was, he suffered from schizophrenia. Um, I made calls, there was no clinics available to him. The schizophrenia, schizophrenia clinic, clinic was um, to capacity. They couldn't take him in and it just, you run out of places to go. Um, and it's heartbreaking because you see somebody who really wants to get help, but there's nowhere for them to go. And I hope when we work with our partners and uh, our staff, they've done a wonderful job. I hope we can work together to try to get some ideas for these homeless, you know, no, make them feel like they're in the forefront and we're not ignoring them. Anyway, I thank you. Thank you very much. Uh... Councillor, we, we have heard from every councillor on this issue. I don't remember the last time that that's uh, happened. And so a lot of the things I would have said have been said. I won't go back into a lot of those things, but I will make a couple of points. And first of all, I want to echo something Councillor Kent said and Councillor Smith referred to, which is, you know, how far we've come in terms of taking on this responsibility. And some people don't like it. Some on the council probably think we've gone too far, but... Uh, you know, when I was elected in 2012, Councillor Mason and I bought up housing when we had our first strategy session of council. And what was the reaction? It was not our issue. We don't talk about that in any way. Um, and bit by bit, we have um, come a long way. You know, if you look at some of the things that we've come up with, the uh, giving land for not-for-profits, multi-year tax relief for people who provide housing, um, affordable housing grant program, secondary backyard suites, uh, waiving of construction fees, um, we have taken this on. And I'm proud of that fact. That doesn't bother me. I think it's the right thing, you know, to do. You know, um, there, we did provide indoor, you know, we did provide something indoors for everybody, uh, the gray arena, uh, when, when, when we were trying to deal with the folks who were living at Mar Park. But there are some people who didn't take it. They don't want to take it. There are some people that will live outside. You're not going to put them, everybody in a house. Some people, it's not going to work for them. So, you know, we have to deal with the specific circumstances that, we, that we're dealing with. Um, and I do believe, um, Councillor Clary said, uh, and Councillor Mason both used the word iterative. It is. Guys, to, if you're waiting for the report that comes back and you go, oh, my gosh, that's perfect. That's, that ain't going to happen. There isn't anything out there. Nobody else has found it. 
Um, but what we have to do is look at each of these recommendations and say, does it make it better than it was? And I think a lot of these recommendations do. I agree on the eight to eight. To me, that seems a little unworkable. Um, not sure that that you know makes uh, you know makes sense. Um, Councillor Austin always sort of struggles to get my uh, my uh, saying down, but let's not let perfect be the enemy of better. Like there isn't, there really isn't a perfect solution. And I know that people don't like some of the recommendations, but we just can't. We're ignoring the problem if we don't do something. Um, you know, people talk about creating conflict. This conflict now, we've seen it in, in, in neighborhoods. We've seen conflict. Um, and, and our whole point in this work that Max has done and that we've done and staff have put a lot of effort into in the last, you know, nine to 10 months, we, we didn't have anybody on this. And now we've got people working on this. The whole point is to try to give people a better circumstance for success. And we have, to, and it's not just us telling them, this is your chance. We need to listen to what they need. And we also need to make sure they have the support that they need. And um, so I think we're trying to do that. And I think that, you know, we should try to do that. Is it a reach on our mandate? Probably. Um, but that doesn't bother me that much. Because you cannot be the governors of a municipality and say housing is not my gig. No matter, it, 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 is, it is the most important thing for human beings is having a roof over their head and a chance to achieve their potential as human beings. So um, I wanna thank the staff for the work they've done. I know there's work left to do on this and there'll be some amendments and I think we should you know, take our time and recognize that it's, 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 uh, it's not perfect. There's things like, you know, Councillor Mancini and I have talked about this. I wish there was a, you know, a number like you have on your furnace. If you have a problem, call this number. We need that number. We need to know who do we contact. You all get calls from people who say, I, I, there's somebody that's living rough in the street. What do I do? We need an answer to it, and we need to know it's going to be taken care of. So that's, those are things we need right away. We need more supportive housing, no question. Um, but, you know, um, you know the, the, the Rapid Housing Initiative which has been renewed will be 200 units of housing just on one federal program supported by the province and supported by the municipality. Um, that's, that, that's, that's a step forward. And, you know, we all have issues. I've said many times that successive governments of all political stripes in this province have not taken affordable housing seriously. I have seen efforts from this new government that are better than I've ever seen. And it's a crisis situation. And maybe that's why, uh, but I appreciate some of the efforts that they do and some of the stuff they can't even talk about because of the secrecy, the, the privacy and the dignity of the human being. We need to lean on the province for sure. Uh, we also need to work with them. And uh, as uh, Councillor Mason often says, our, our job is to support those who have the mandate and we're doing that and we need to do more uh, to make sure. So um, yeah, it's a tough issue. It, it, I just know there isn't an answer. All there is is making things better step by step and giving people a chance to be successful where they have better amenities to live in areas where they would uh, uh, have those, those circumstances, which they don't have now. Um, and and, and you, you, it's not right to say that everybody who opposes encampments in their neighborhoods, you know, hates poor people. That's not the case. You know, we have to find a way to bring people together um, and, and not keep driving everybody apart to people saying, you know, you guys aren't doing anything or, or other people saying you're doing too much for the, you know, we have to, we just simply have to be good public servants and balance the needs. So I think that there's some very good things in this report. There's some things that can be improved, but I want to thank everybody for taking part. So I have on the list for a second time, I have uh, councillors Smith, Mancini, Mason, Purdy, the deputy, Austin and Kent. Should we take five minutes and stretch our legs and uh, come back? Is that good? 10 minutes? 10 minutes, I've got 7.13, let's come back at seven. Do you wanna just, do we need to, we're not gonna have a supper break or anything. You've already had lunch and breakfast, so you're good for that. So let's say uh, 7.13, we'll come back at 7.25, okay? Thank you all. Thank you.
Good evening, it is now 7.25. We'll be taking down the holding screen and returning microphones and cameras. Okay. All right, folks, we're good to go, uh, Ian. Yes, Mr. Savage, we are streaming, you are good to go. Okay. All right, colleagues, um, we're going to go to second rounds, which, uh, as you all know, and don't need to be reminded, are three-minute rounds. Um, you can do more than one if you wish. Um, and uh, I, I just want to say, look, the, it's very clear from the conversation that everybody in this, on this council cares about this issue and about the people. We all have different points of view sometimes on how to do it, but um, I appreciate that everybody has that concern. And respects each other's point of view on how the best way is to uh, take on this really difficult issue. Uh, count, I, th so the order is Councillor Smith, Councillor Mancini, Councillor Mason, Councillor Purdy, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Austin, Councillor Kent is what I have so far. So Councillor Smith, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and colleagues, great discussion so far. So I'm just going to speak on some of the concerns I have, which was highlighted by many members. So I, I'm really just gonna to try to lead to the questions, but I do wanna highlight uh, one thing uh, before I ask my questions. And one is we, we all know that council, or council all knows that we received a ton of correspondence and emails in the last week or so related to this report. And one of the things that I've seen that was constantly in the emails that this report speaks about um, policing uh, and it speaks about we are going to be handing out fines and, you know, nowhere in this report does it mention police other than police and fire being stakeholders and nowhere does it mention in this report that we will be handing out fines. It does mention enforcement um, and that's where my concerns are and it's already been highlighted by many members of how we're going to deal with enforcement. But I think it's important just to, to note that that uh, if member whoever's watching, if you haven't read the report, it's very worthwhile reading it before sending us emails with uh, information that's not that's not there. So uh, one thing that the one of the questions is is and it already was talked about is who would be enforcing. I, I wholeheartedly don't support police being the first go to. I think it needs to be um, resident led and community led in, in some short some way, shape or form. And I think that is part of our next steps with the report. And I believe Max, if you want to confirm that the, the enforcement, enforcement piece will be more laid out within the future report coming forward. Um, I, I do wonder also if it's possible as we're developing the strategy, I think obviously police need to be the last line um, and, and even that last line is like the last, last line um, for, for enforcing the policy. I'm wondering what is the plan for creating some kind of, if not it's a guide or information that can be provided to, to those staying uh, at encampment sites of how we will be dealing, supporting, and if need be moving them, if that, if that comes to place and having that in writing so they have information kind of like what the shift does, giving residents information so they know what their rights are. Um, and the, the other question is, I'm just wondering if we talked to the province or thought about asking the province if we can keep some of our contributions that we're sending them related to housing and funnel it back into housing. And if we need to do the same thing we do with our supplementary educational funding where they report to us, like could we report to them outlining how we're spending that money? So I don't know if that has been part of the discussion, but I think that could be a way um, for us to support this. And, and as I mentioned, their housing budget is 400 million. Uh, I, I don't know exactly how much goes right into housing, but I'm sure that, that letting us keep a couple million or so um, wouldn't, wouldn't hurt their pockets and, and it would allow us to do some more work. Um, so if those questions could be answered and there's some amendments, I'll, I'll definitely have comments for when they come forward. So through you, Mayor to the councillor, my apologies. We're all in a room together and uh, we're trying to remember to mute before we speak. Um, uh, through you, councillor, Mayor to the councillor, in terms of enforcement, I think one of the things to, re to reinforce is that the first step is in fact not enforcement. It's about connecting those who are experiencing homelessness with supports. And so that's 
what we're doing now and what we would continue to do, regardless of whether it's people sort of in, in designated spaces or, or otherwise, is to work through our navigators, through the um, our, our the HRM outreach uh, support person uh, with the province, through its service providers to, to connect people to support. So that would be sort of always um, will continue to be our first approach. Uh, in terms of as we move sort of on the spectrum of enforcement, then the next uh, piece becomes compliance officers. And that's um, where we, again, you know, the, the first approach, even with compliance officers is, is uh, an approach around education and voluntary uh, compliance. And then it moves sort of through the spectrum, uh, depending on the response to that. So, um, it, yes, we would be looking, to, you know, as I said, the first piece is always to attempt to work through service providers to connect people to appropriate and supportive and suitable housing. And then, um, you know, as needed, uh, connect, go through, uh, go through more, um, more enforcement steps as, uh, as we go along. Um, in terms of, of police, certainly where there are, it, you know, intense public safety issues, we, we may continue to have to rely on, on police in some circumstances. Um, and and we would you know need on a on a case by case uh, basis to to be able to sort of um, have that uh, have that option and that it's not necessarily sort of our call uh, in terms of the uh, the police action but uh, but agreed you know our, our our first steps around enforcement would always be through other uh, other means um, on the provincial piece I don't know if the the CAO may wish to um, to, to weigh in on that one. We, we have not had discussions with the province with respect to um, retaining some of those contributions related to housing in terms of a max or, or I. I know there are discussions around the service exchange agreements, so um, so the CAO may, may wish to, to weigh in on that piece. And, uh, and following that, Max can speak to the question of the um, uh, guide, the information that we would provide to those new campus. Jacques? Yeah, so thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, you know, no, we have not had a, a direct conversation with the province on, on diverting any mandatory payments to the province related to housing uh, or any other mandatory tax. Where council does have discretion is in the, is in the supplementary and sub-education piece, but that is not a, that's a, that's a, that's a discussion with council. That has to do with council's investments in our youth in terms of uh, music and arts and all that. Uh, but the mandatory piece of education, though, we have not had that conversation. There is, uh, I, think, I believe the Deputy Mayor mentioned it in her comments, uh, you know, there are conversations going on between HRM and the province and all the other municipalities through the NSFM. Uh, and uh, I sit, on a, I sit on, the, on a committee as an advisor to the committee uh, in relation to the service exchange agreements that, that the minister has a mandate from the premier to actually engage municipalities to come up with new service exchange agreements. So... That is all part and parcel of the sort of a go forward plan. I mean, as, as we go through the service exchange agreement conversations, you know, all of these different jurisdictional issues are going to be discussed and who's responsible for what and all that. But I also would, you know, I would have to reiterate and reinforce what the mayor just said. Um, you know, the, the fact is that while there are jurisdictional issues, around housing and, and social services. We're in that business as well. We're partners with service providers, we're partners with the province, we're partners, and we're, we're in the business of, of housing. You know, we've engaged with the federal government on the rapid housing initiative with support from the province, et cetera. So, you know, but it is an, it is an important consideration, but we have not sort of had a conversation yet about, you know, sort of taking monies out of the housing contributions that we make that are mandatory by law, by the province, uh, and uh, for education, uh, yet at that at that point, but those conversations will certainly happen over time as as a result of the unfolding of the conversations around the service exchange agreement. I'm sure, I'm sure, and we're not the only municipality who wants to talk about that. I'm quite certain. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jacques. Um, and. <laughs> And just to, uh, it's okay. Uh, so the other part to uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to uh, the councillor, we would definitely have materials that we could provide to people who are um, experiencing homelessness. It would have 
maps, it would have directions, it would have contact information so that those people could get that. And we wanna make sure that that's in the hands of everybody so that everybody is looking at the exact same piece of information, not, not that there is eight different guides for different folks, it's this is the one piece um, so that everybody's looking at the same thing. Uh, and definitely we would uh, continue to in the next report, provide more detail around all of those processes and they would all be informed by, uh, by first voice uh, participation. So hopefully that answers the rest of uh, Councillor uh, Councilor Smith's uh, question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll, I'll come back just to follow up on one thing. Thank you very much. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, once again, I want to uh, mention, as I, when I last time I spoke, I'm not in, in support or in favor of the eight to eight uh, sheltering. So I believe that Councilor Mason is going to come forward with an uh, amendment uh, and that will pull that piece out of the motion that's in front of us, and, and I will support that. Uh, what I'm really looking forward to, and if this motion does pass today, I'm looking forward to the second report that Maxie you speak of. And there's things I would like that uh, uh, your work to be uh, looked to look at between now and that second report uh, to come back. You mentioned in your presentation about looking at uh, a variety of types of land, including federal government land. Perfect example of my district is Shannon Park. Uh, so that would be, uh, I believe, an excellent location, uh, not only for these, this type of sheltering, but maybe our, our tiny home opportunity. Uh, it's being developed, yes, but we're still two or three years away from anything happening there. And even when it does happen, it can be uh, phased in. It's a large piece of land. I'd like to see, and I don't know, Mr. Mayor, if you had any conversation with the federal government, but the you know, who actually for you to communicate with the Minister of Public Service and Procurement, I think it's Minister uh, Filomena, I'm not sure, uh, Mayor, but you know, to, to speak to that minister, have a conversation about specifically the Shadow Park lands. Right now, I know Canada Lands is the real estate arm of the federal government uh, dealing with it, but I would like to see that explored and investigated. Uh, Max, you also spoke about working with the province uh, strategically, and, and, I, and I agree, but my, my feeling is that the province is doing their thing over here, and the municipality is doing our thing, and then from time to time we, we, we communicate. I know staff are communicating, I understand, daily with the province on this, but we seem to be doing our own strategies and I feel that, uh, you know, we're willing to help uh, the, strat the province to do their work, but it's time for, I feel, uh, we need a homeless summit where we're getting together in a room with the province, with the uh, municipality, with the service providers, with those that live, lived experiences, and work this out and come up with a strategy that's integrated uh, in our efforts and our action, but the province is the lead on it. And we're there to assist the province wherever we can. So I, I don't know uh, if that needs an amendment to the motion that's on the floor. Uh, if someone could speak to that, the, the, those things can be explored. Uh, that would be, a, 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 I really think, a very important, very valuable. Mr. Mayor? Who wants that one? Uh... I can say that I've not had any conversations about Shannon Park with the federal government. I would probably start with the local member of parliament. Uh, I could even introduce you to him, Councillor Mancini, and uh, I, I think that would be a good place to uh, to start. But certainly, I, if that was determined to be a good place for it, um, I would have questions. But if that's determined, then that's certainly a conversation that we would have with the federal government, who have taken a fairly serious approach to homelessness in the last number of years. Uh, so on the other questions, Council, either Jacques or, or Maggie or, or Max. Uh, Mr. Mayor, through you to Councillor Mancini. So we've had, had, we have had conversations with Canada Lands and we've had, we have had conversations with the Department of National Defense. Uh, none of those conversations are, have, have led to uh, inclusion yet. But uh, you know, based on this conversation, we're going to circle back, obviously, and, and have those further conversations. You're right about Shannon Park, and there are other lands that D and D owns uh, that could possibly be a site for an encampment uh, that we've identified. But we and province, we've had conversations with the province on provincial land, which yeah. has not led to a successful conclusion either. But we're going to continue those conversations. On the strategy piece, I can tell you that you know pretty much. 
weekly, if not every second day, uh, I have conversations with my mm -hmm. counterpart, the Deputy Minister of Community Services. I have my count, you know, and uh, I know Denise and her team and Maggie and and uh, Max and others have, and Paul Johnson have conversations with their counterparts at the provincial level. And so there's a lot of coordination, and a lot of conversations happening and a lot of, you know, strategizing between both levels of government. And I understand that, Jacques, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, my, my feeling is that we're, we're, we're strategizing, we're speaking, but there's no overall encompassing strategy that seems to be missing. And that, yeah. that, that's my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, I think that's a legitimate point. And of course we are relying on the province because they're the lead on this. They are the lead. They have a strategy. The minister has a mandate letter. They have a they have the lead on this particular topic. Uh, they are the ones dealing with the service providers. They contract service providers. We provide some support to the service providers, as you know. And um, you know, at the end at the end of the day, it's the service providers that are dealing with the clients. That they're they're the ones that are hearing the voices of the clients uh, through support from the province. That's how I interpret this. But I think your point is well taken. I think if there's a there's a way we'll, we'll certainly engage with the province in terms of looking at a perhaps a strategy that everybody could endorse uh, going forward, and that would be something that would be useful probably. Yeah. yeah thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll come back later. I do have another question around the shelter sites and uh, looking for mapping and the change to the, uh, the motion. Thank you. Um, thank you. Councillor Mason? Now, the thing about the MP for Dartmouth is he had candies in his desk, and then you know the new guy in City Hall just doesn't. <laughs> so, you know, he, he, he's got that against him. Well, they had cut very, oh, very quickly. Don't take my time, Tony. Very quickly, um, you know, I've heard some councillors talking about how you know, even if we do this, it doesn't address the 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 entirety of the 500 people who are homeless. But again, we've heard from staff, and you've heard from councillors who deal with this on the daily that the, uh, you know, they do a point in time count where they go out and the number of people living rough is between 20 and 80. And it will probably be more this summer, which is why we need to respond to that. But it's not 500. It's never 500. That's people who are experiencing housing precarity. And, uh, you know, so right now, that's what we're dealing with right here, right now, 80 people in our parks that we need to talk about. What are we going to do this summer to handle it? None of the other solutions, building things and new programs and new buildings, now that's going to be done this summer, as we learned with the modulars, which are still the fastest thing, you know, both sites are done now, we're just waiting for the operators to take over the Halifax one, but nothing's going to be faster than the seven months that it took to do Halifax and the four or five months it took to do Dartmouth. Uh, also, as far as the idea of convening a expert panel of locals or people in Canada or internationally, we already had that panel. It's the Housing and Homelessness Partnership. And we already brought everybody together with the United Way. And we already have a report. And honest to God, I would say probably one of the most naive things I've ever done in politics is I remember talking to the mayor about it when that report came back and being like, all right, we got it done. The province is going to build housing now. And no such thing has happened, right? I mean, like we identified the need. We talked about how many thousand units we needed. And, and you know, we're still in a position where there, you know, CBC is reporting there's 400 units unrentable that are built in the old stock of Metro Regional Housing Authority. So we have a problem there. But because we have 80 people in parks right now, let's say 80, because that's probably what it will end up being in short order. Uh, that's what we have right here, right now. And our options are three options right now are allow people to camp in any park anywhere and do whatever they want, right? Like, and then we have to decide what do we mean by do whatever they want? Is it build any structure, right? And, and then at that point, you start to run into a place where it's not just about housing anymore. How do you discriminate? How do you decide between a uh, truck convoy person and a homeless advocate when they want to build a structure in a public place? Or we can allow none. We can go full enforcement and we can send in the cops and we can do August 18th over and over and over again until there's nobody in any of the parks. Or we can have some kind of plan to rationalize this and deliver good services and have good spots and try and make sure that we've got uh washrooms and water and all those things those are our three choices we don't have any other choices right now those are the choices that we have right all the other stuff is long and medium term stuff like i will say you know pam distributed the uh, uh the talking points that uh daniel barkhouse had distributed and you know it's good to see that options for new rooming houses and uh providing targeted resources and supports to vulnerable and underrepresented communities is on the list for medium term but medium term is 2022 to 2024 so that's not today that's not right now. So let's see if I can get that to actually post. I would like to make the following amendment. First of two, two uh, point three of the amendment. I would like to add after April 28th, 2022, with the removal 
of the one night camping sites and addition of those sites to the list of potential long term camping sites, if required and possible, to ensure adequate supply to meet demand to be brought back to Council for consideration. I so move. Second, Mancini. Thank you, Councillor Mancini. Now I have five minutes to talk about my amendment. Amazing. <laughs> Magic of process. Uh, I won't take five minutes. What does this do? I'll just break it down. I'll go through and break it down. We've all, I haven't heard anybody say the eight to eight one night camping sites make sense, right? Staff have indicated to me as I've been talking about that, I've gotten messages from them saying, we're not sure all those sites are ideal for uh, uh, continuous camping. So, what they, so, so, so what's proposed here is that they go away and as a part of Max's second report, they come back and talk about converting all those sites, which ones are appropriate to have on the reserve list so that we can then add them as needed and then the second piece and possibly the most important piece is where it says to ensure adequate supply to meet demand. Because the key thing here is we keep having people say, well, what happens if there's more people in camping spots? We have a lot of parks and a lot of space. We can make that happen, but I think it needs to happen in a measured and uh, uh, you know, uh, well thought out way where we, with you know, intentionality, have a plan to be able to make sure that there's those key things, water, toilets, et cetera, at whatever site that we set up and authorize. And also to do that really quickly, right? It can't be a thing where it's weeks and weeks and weeks. It's got to be like, we have Royal Flush on commission. And the minute we open up another site, bam, those things are there, right? So so this is my first amendment. I think that it addresses most of the concerns we heard about the eight to eights. It doesn't commit us to turning the part-time or the eight to eight ones into sites, we could debate that today, but I mean, I don't think South and Beaufort makes sense. I would prefer, and I'm going to make that amendment when the report comes back, and I'll just say this to staff now, I think we should have a camping site on University Avenue between the Bethune uh, building and the rehab center right there. That's highly visible. It's got good power and lights. It's near the cafeteria at the hospital, and the province is going to see it every day. I think it's a great site. It's a better site than South Beaufort, but I don't think that's the discussion for today. I think what we should do is give direction to staff to come back with a list, and then we can debate that when the next report comes back. So I ask for your support with this amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, the amendment is on the floor. Deputy Mayor. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Mason. Um, I like your vigor. So I, I, I will say that the, the concept um, of a good spot, of a good camping spot is all about perspective. And unfortunately, this report does not include the voices of those who are unhoused. Uh, it hasn't been endorsed by the Association of Social Workers in Nova Scotia, for example, hasn't been endorsed by um, all kinds of community groups that we really need to be on side with. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned uh, about this, but my understanding from this motion is that this, is, this would then come back uh, for consideration and we can then look at that. You know, I, I, I think that if that report came back with, uh, and this is where I just want to, I don't even think I can amend your amendment, but um, I, I would like to consider what that enforcement plan looks like specifically so that we have a clear understanding of exactly what we're agreeing to. Because at this point, I still don't understand what that enforcement plan is, one. And number two, I don't understand how we can force people to provide us with their personal information and in a sense, register them for this site, um, you know, to determine whether or not they're housed or unhoused actually. So I still think we're in a very precarious situation without understanding how this will be administered or enforced. Uh, but thank you, uh, Councillor Mason, for putting this on the floor. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I will be supporting this one, especially since there will be additional analysis. I mean, the two that I think I've probably heard the most concern about, um, particularly the idea of making them, um, you know, kind of more regular encampments would be the beaches. And I think part of the part of the challenge we have here is um, our site. We've got a list of sites. But um, some of them are very clear, like Crathorn Park. We know what Crathorn Park is. Um, but some of them, it's like Woodside Regional Park. I mean, it runs literally from, you know, the edge of Dartmouth Cove all the way down to the NSCC. It's a huge kind of space. And so, I mean, I, th I think uh, put the 8 to 8, I think, will needlessly create problems for us. I think that this is the right way to go with that. Um, and I think it be, it's it's worthwhile to come back with a, a, a more fulsome look at the sites 
rather than just saying, well, we can convert all of those to um, encampment sites uh, without time limits on them. Some, some will probably work, some don't. So uh, very much support this amendment. I think it's the right way to go right now. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Mason, for this amendment. Um, I I just very much disagree with the idea of sites, park sites, as being a viable solution, even in the short term. I understand having a few, perhaps, but we need buildings, buildings. So, um, and we have we have space in buildings. We just need to do it. We just I, that, I mean, maybe that's gullible and, and silly, but I, I just don't understand why this isn't happening. But I do support this amendment. I do think the eight to eight is just an unnecessary risk and the management of that would just be um, a potential nightmare. So I don't support number three, but I do support this amendment. So I'm going to be, I just felt like I had to explain it. I will be voting yes for this amendment here on number three, but when it comes to the vote for the whole motion, I will not be supporting this, but I do support this amendment right now. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Very quickly, I, I do support uh, uh, Councillor Mason's amendment. Uh, and I think I heard him correctly because what I'm looking for is not including the eight to eight overnight uh, sites, but staff will be, I just wanna make sure our staff will come back with an updated recommended list of sites and then council gets to discuss or debate those sites. I do have a concern for Albert Lake Park. Uh, it was one of the eight to eight park sites that was recommended in the report. Uh, my concern is very quickly is that uh, that's a direct north, north and it's next to a beach. And during the summer months, it's uh, well occupied by families. Uh, I don't think that's an appropriate location, uh, but I'm, I'm welcome to look at other locations in my district. Uh, but I just wanna make sure that uh, staff will be coming back if this amendment is passed and the overall motion is passed with the overall sites uh, recommended. But I also wanna make sure when they come back, I'd like to see uh, a map of each site and where they would recommend uh, uh, the locations of these uh, temporary uh, tents or shelters uh, when they do come back. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Was somebody gonna to speak to that? Or? Uh, yes. yes, yes, yes. Go yes ahead, to both head, questions head, head, head. Uh, through you, Mayor, to the Council. Yes to both questions. Thank you. Councillor Dale Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I, I believe Councillor Mancini asked, asked the question that uh, was on my mind, and that is that supporting this amendment means that we're not going to enact anything in the interim until this comes back so that we do have that list. But adding to that, when we think about what that report comes back, are we going to talk about what is the cost of putting those services within all of these sites as well? Because we haven't talked about the cost yet. Thank you. Good question. Maggie? Through Mayor to the Councillor, in terms of cost, what we anticipate um, based on, on what we um, had proposed was a cost, a sort of upper end cost of approximately $60,000 uh, to service sites. And I, I will note there's uh, an error in the, uh, the financial implications, uh, just it, it references a position, but in fact, that what was meant to be described in that section was supports for those sites. So that would include any site um, ameliorations that would be needed. Um, so we would come back with a subsequent report. We would update that if there were changes based on the on the changes that we're hearing uh, in terms of feedback from council right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just quickly, uh, Councillor Mancini prompted me there. Um, with these whole site approval thing, I mean, like it's part of our motion. But are we actually as council approving these because I mean it's the director of parks in the bylaw that you know waives the requirement and so uh, I mean I know this is a this is a big deal and so we probably want to, to make sure a political and bureaucratic is aligned here but are we actually approving these sites the ones that through the, you mayor uh, to the council the authority in the parks bylaw rests with the executive director I'm uh, coming to council in order to get endorsement of this approach because it is such a significant uh, change in approach. And so would you know commit to come back uh, for that same endorsement that we've described in, in the um, recommendation section of this report. 
Thank you. Councilor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, to you, Maggie, I, I guess I just further to Sam's question. So endorsing, you, uh, uh, um, supporting this amendment, we are not signing off on the list as it presents. We are signing off on the feedback that we're saying you need to bring us more information before we'll make a final decision on the list. Correct? Correct. Yeah. We're coming back uh, with a, a sort of new proposed set of, of, of sites and support. Okay. Um, yeah, was, I'm, I'm happy. I think I can support the amendment. Um, uh, I, I do have some concerns about the distance away from services and such that has have been raised here, certainly by Councillor Purdy. And I have similar um, questions around the Woodside Park area. This, and I think um, want to you know support Councillor Mancini's uh, articulation of s something coming back with a better understanding for each of us to understand where we're talking about. Um, the, uh, I'm glad to see the overnight is uh, being taken off the table in this motion. I do have a procedural question in relation to the way that Councillor Purdy sort of positioned her, her, that if we support this motion, would it not then render the number three that's in the recommendations um off the table that this one would replace that yeah so uh, is can we have confirmation of that would amend uh, motion number three so motion number three would be then read as amended to the proposal. yeah okay so it would be it would be ways motion should this one uh pass that number three would be replaced with that. And, and have we, did we come to a, a place yet where we are going to ask for a, a, um, a vote on each one? Council Purdy indicated that was the intent. Really yeah, well. okay. All right, um, thank you. Thank you. Council Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just one final question here. Um, so when this comes back, I'm wondering if staff's intent would be the looking at the entire list or just the list as it relates to the places that were previously looked at as short term. Would it be looking at the whole thing? Because, uh, you know, that, the, the Woodside one is the one that I just don't have much info on. So I, I find it hard to say, yes, that it, it makes sense or no, it doesn't. I think uh, through you, Mayor, to the Councillor, we would look at the whole thing and, and to the point of uh, Councillor Mancini, for example, come back with a map, a little more detail, a little more information for, for Councillors to be able to, uh, to assess. So we'd be looking at the whole thing, not just the short-term ones. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I wonder if the mover and seconder would consider a friendly amendment to this amendment, which is to include uh, an enforcement plan. Um, so it would be direct the CAO to formalize criteria and locations and enforcement plan for the designation of overnight shelter. I'm wondering if, uh, how you feel about that, Councillor Mason? Uh, so that's the next uh, amendment, which I was gonna make, but the mayor tells me I'm out of time, so. Uh, I, amendment to item six. I put it in the chat for the sake of argument. So I, I would hold off on that, but I think that's the next thing that absolutely has to be addressed. Okay. Deputy, you're good? Yeah, that's cool. Good. Thank you. Um, Councillor Purdy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I just wanted to clarify that if I vote in favor of this motion. I'm not voting for the list of parks. I'm, I'm voting to get rid of the eight to eight criteria. That would be my, that would be correct. Uh, we're replacing number three with the motion of Councillor Mason, which takes out the eight to eights and that the list would come back uh, in Max's second report. And we would look, as I understand it, we would then look at the list of parks. Is that correct? Uh, uh, way? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Councillor uh, Mason. Sounds like uh, 
somebody's not on mic, uh, mute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So very briefly, uh, as I've joked to some of you before, and I think I might even said today, but it's already been a long day. If I had my druthers and if Lowen wasn't building the press block, I would make a motion to close Granville Street and make a camping site in front of the legislature, because I think we need to keep it front and center uh, with the people who are truly responsible. Uh, I would ask staff to identify more sites in addition to the ones that are there to have that dialogue. Deputy Mayor Lovelace talked about with those uh, providers and, and, and experts, uh, you know, as possible, but not to slow it down because we can change the list. We can keep amending the list, but we need to make some decisions really quickly. Summer is coming. Uh, I would say uh, we need to talk to the other, you know, to the CAO. This is, we've got to talk to the other orders of government. We need more sites, uh, not just with us. Uh, and, and, and to the comment that why aren't we just doing buildings? Well, sure, we should do buildings. I mean, ultimately, no one should be in a park and all of this should end. But none of that's going to happen in the next week. It's not going to happen in the next month. It's not going to happen in the next year. We're learning that with the overlook, right? We had the very optimistic people at the province in Ahans telling us the overlook would be open in a month. Now it's going to be open in the fall, you know, and, and that was that that'll be over a year by then. So we can't like converting a space takes work, takes people, takes time. And so until then, we need somewhere for people to go. And again, we're back to those three choices. Allow it all anywhere, all the time. Allow none. Not OK. Allow some and have some kind of process around it. So I ask for your support. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. OK, I'm assuming that Councillor Austin has another question. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'll call the question. Ready for the question on the amendments? Beginning with Mayor Savage. In favor. One, Councillor Daigle Gannon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Perry. Voting yes. Five, Councilor Austin. In favor. Six, Councilor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the amendment. Seven, Councilor Mason. For the amendment. Eight, Councilor Smith. Four. Nine, Councilor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councilor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councilor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councilor Stoddard. In favor of the amendment. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. 16, Councilor Outhead. Voting yes. Thank you. Okay, that motion passes. So number three has been amended with a whole new number three. Uh, yeah, and I'm sorry, Councilor Mason, but you were right past your three minutes when you put the amendment on the floor, so I'll have to come back to you. Well, somebody else puts that one in. Uh, I have Councillor um, Purdy uh, next on the main motion, as amended now. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, everyone. What a great discussion. Uh, it was very rousing. Um, I have an amendment, actually, to suggest. But uh, before that, just on the building piece, if, if we're saying to people, just sleep outdoors in all weather and I, I really don't understand the building piece. If, if there's a dry and safe place, it can we not put cots, dividers? Like, is, is that not just a simple solution? But anyway, um, on that, my amendment, actually, I think we're missing a very critical piece with, with this. And we talked about the, this, I think Councillor Mancini suggested a summit. I, I think that's like on the right track. We need professionals to be informing us as well as the lived experience um, panel uh, to inform us. We, we need to hear from people who have a track record of success in the housing crisis realm. And I think we should be looking outside of HRM, inside of HRM, but also outside of HRM, maybe outside of Canada, like to organizations who've done this well, who have a good reputation, who have good track records. I was wondering, like, is it possible even to look at perhaps working with the province to contract in uh, directors who've done this well in crisis situations to come and inform us, the province, us, HRM, and how to do this? Like, why would we reinvent the wheel when, when there are people who know this 
well and are trauma informed and and educated. So this is my amendment. I would like to propose that the CAO engage with the province because I think that is a really crucial component here, which it's obviously it is happening, but could be improved um, to convene an advisory panel consisting of mental health professionals, social workers, shelter directors, and NGOs regarding homelessness, both within and outside of HRM and possibly even Canada, who will advise council and the province on an ongoing basis regarding best practice housing solutions for our homeless population. Okay, thank you. Second for that. Can we, see it? Can, can we see it in the chat or somewhere? Yes. Councillor Hensby seconded that. Uh, Jacques, you had popped up. Did you wish to speak to that? Yes, sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Councillor Curry. So, what you, the report that you have before you has been informed by expert opinion uh, from other municipalities, from uh, the Shift in Toronto, which is an internationally renowned uh, organization that advises uh, organizations like ours and other not for profits associated with this particular matter, right? So, we have done environmental scans, we have engaged with experts, we've engaged with our service providers uh, here in HRM. And we've gone out and, and spoken to and looked at research um, across Canada and, and in fact, uh, globally. So we, we have a lot of information at our disposal now, so does the province. Uh, all of this has been shared amongst you know, ourselves and the province, et cetera. And you know, there was a homelessness partnership that has, has been created. Uh, and that, that and, and through United Way and the mayor's office, and the mayor's leadership, uh, in the past, and that has uh, informed a lot of what is before you today, and will continue to inform uh, what we're what we intend to do going forward. But we are always on the on the lookout for best practices. Uh, talking to others across the country and other parts of the planet uh, in terms of what we do, not only in this file but other files as well, right? Uh, so yeah, we you know I, I believe that we've covered off on that to the extent that. You know, we're even considering bringing in the shift uh, you know, at some point. We haven't finalized that yet, but we are considering bringing in uh, some expertise to help uh, on the communication side. Uh, there has to be a robust communication strategy around this particular matter as well. Uh, that's going to, you know, that's going to, going to roll out as part of this initiative. We will be you know, informing council as to what what type of communication will be happening. We're going to need specific expertise. Uh, we may need to reach out into into the private sector uh, communications world to get some, some of that expertise as well. But I can assure you that uh, none of this that's before you today is was was was, was, was you know crafted uh, based simply on our own internal conversations or our, our conversations with the province. It was, uh, or even service providers, it was informed uh, by a large outreach of, of uh, information. It was led in part by uh, our, our, our government relations external affairs uh, folks last year and into this year. And then, of course, Maggie and, and, and uh, Denise and, and the team and uh, Max are, have been further engaging with folks as we go forward with the plan. So that will continue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I understand that, but this this is the best practice that we're now being suggested to do is is to increase the encampments across the municipality but that doesn't seem to make sense to me well look, the, uh, ship, the, the the i'll tell you that this the you know we we have been speaking with experts in this area and there's a there's like any other issue there's always a difference of opinion as to what the best practice is right and what what works in what in what kind of community um, certainly, there are some folks out there that do not support the idea of encampments. Period, right? They would they would rather see something else happen. But you know, I think as Councillor Mason has pointed out, there's right now we're looking at three options. Uh, we really have three or four options that are at our disposal, and doing nothing is is not. And having you know roofed accommodations on a temporary basis uh, are something that we're pursuing aggressively. Uh, for example, you know we had we had a warming center this winter that we had up. Uh, 
uh, up at the common. Um, but that, and we've had, we're now having conversations with the provinces about, about having, you know, a more permanent uh, warming center. And we're gonna have to look at uh, currently built accommodation for that, uh, whether it's, and it has to be in the downtown. So we're, we're actively looking at things like that. So, you know, your point is not lost on us. I mean, we, there has to be, we're gonna have to take advantage in some cases of or warming centers, for example, but to fit up in the short term, uh, a full, fully blown uh, facility that meets code and that has a service provider is not something that can happen overnight. Right now, we're dealing with the crisis issue, and the, and the only way to deal with that, in our view, is based on based on advice we've received, is is by having a controlled uh, short term uh, accommodations facilities where we provide some basic services uh, as we described in the report. Okay, the motion is on the floor from Councillor Purdy, seconded by Councillor Hensby, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. So I think the CAO just said uh, a lot of what I was going to say. I don't believe that this is necessary. I think a lot of the work uh, that we're doing with the service providers and with the problems of Nova Scotia is happening. And, you know, many thanks to everyone uh, who's been engaged uh, in doing this work, and in particular, uh, AHANS, um, the Affordable Housing Association of Nova Scotia, which brings all kinds of people together um, from all over. So I, you know, many, many specialists and experts that are doing this, this work. So I'm not going to vote uh, in favor of this because I, I just, it is redundant. Um, and I think that uh, the work that we're doing, um, we're already doing, but I will be for, uh, bringing forward an amendment uh, that looks at a MOU with the province. And so I'll, I'll bring that back when we go back to the main motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, some of it's already been said, but I mean, you know, no, you can't just rent a building and put cots in. It, it needs renos. It needs to meet code, especially if we're having anything to do with it. It has to have a service provider in the province, as far as I know, hasn't agreed to any more other than the modulars. Um, and to Deputy Mayor's point, you know, an MOU would be great, but the province has to be a willing partner so far. And don't forget, they just set up and sent a NSFM a letter because uh, they have to give notice to municipalities when they're gonna do things that are gonna take money away from municipalities. They're renegotiating the service agreements with us, uh, service exchange agreements. And I fully expect given this large deficit the province has, we're gonna get downloaded on. Uh, they're not gonna be helping us. We're gonna have to help ourselves. Um, and engage with the province is great. And it's already been done as Councillor Mason said, the housing and homelessness partnership. Uh, that the mayor and, and Councillor Mason were, were big parts of. Um, the Poverty Solutions Task Force that the mayor and Sarah set up and I was uh, a part of. The province set up in January, don't forget, because it seems like forever ago now because the change in government, but in January 2021, the province set up the Nova Scotia Affordable Housing Commission with experts, doctors Paul LaFleche and, and Ren Thomas, uh, Deputy Minister and Planning Prophet Dow. They had folks from... Uh, um, uh, housing, they had developers, they had finance people, they had uh, social workers, they had everyone on that panel. And uh, they have, I think it was 56 or some odd recommendations, some of which are being implemented. The province has already done this with experts. We've already done it with experts. And to the point of increasing encampments, what staff have proposed and what I'm supporting is not an increase of encampments. It's, I think what we're trying to say here is, we're hoping to move encampments to more appropriate places that can be well serviced because people have dignity and, and we have empathy and we want to provide those services. When sheds and tents just pop up everywhere and they're so dilute, no one can service them properly. And these folks need and deserve services. And so that's why I'm supporting this and why I can't support uh, this particular amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, Councillor Othit. Sorry, uh, just very quickly, and I, I can't support this, but I, I would like some clarification. I think what, what Councillor Purdy may be a little bit misunderstood here, because I think, you know, we, we know how long it took to build the modules. We know how long it took and it's taking to convert the motel. But we also knew how quickly we took an old arena and got people in there. And it, and, and when the rain starts pouring this summer, people are going to say those poor souls living in tents, 
isn't there a building for them somewhere? So, you know, so I, I don't think we should be too dismissive of this. There's a, there, there's a, a very big difference between building something and using something. So what I would like Maggie or Jacques or somebody, have we, in addition to what Max and everybody did here, to, I understand the consolidating and locating the campsites and whatnot, but in an ideal situation, we would like these folks to be under a roof rather than a tent. So can somebody address that? That's not taking a year to build it. It's not spending $5 million for 78 of them or whatever. It's like we did with the arena. Did we look at that in addition to consolidating campsites? Through you, Mayor, to the Councillor, uh, certainly something that I know um, we've looked at on an ongoing basis, certainly before I was on the file, there were lots of discussions. That was what the hotel um, yes. stays were, were about. Uh, spaces become increasingly difficult to predict, on the hotels, for example. They're, they're simply not available um, for uses other than, than tourist uses or the, or the becoming unavailable for, for uses other than tourist uh, uses. So. Uh, I know there's there certainly has been lots of that work done. We're continuing to um, sort of refer sites that we see to the to the province um, for that reason. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely something that we continue to to explore and, and try and advance. And I don't doubt that, but I think it was important that we say that, and rather than saying it would take a year to do possibly anything. If you find an empty community center, if you find a former school, if you find a former office building, whatever, it's nice to know that we are looking at that, and maybe that's a way of getting them out of the tent in, in pouring rain. Is that, is that a fair comment, Maggie? Or Jacques or somebody? Yeah, correct. All right, thanks very much. That was helpful. It is, but, but there are some people that just wouldn't take that option. And in the case of the Gray Arena, that was the issue. And I do understand that. Yeah. No, you're Jacques? right, Mayor. I understand that. Jacques, did you? Yeah, so I, I, no, I, I, I can assure you, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Odit, that, yeah, we're actually having ongoing conversations, as Maggie pointed out, that we're referring. We're, we have a real estate team looking at these things and looking at this on an ongoing basis, trying to figure this out. You know, the warming center is a critical issue going into the winter. We need to have a warming center. We don't, we can't have the same place we had because the, 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 the place up at the commons is going to be gone, right? So we, we need to find a solution to that. And we're, we're working on that and seeing what we, whatever solutions we can. The other issue is labor. Uh, and it's not labor in terms of construction. It's labor in terms of managing the facility once it's open, right? So uh, as you can appreciate, you know, we're, we're fortunate that we have out of the cold to manage the facilities here in Halifax and in Dartmouth. But, you know, they too are struggling finding workers, right? So when, as we try to find other locations, we have to, you can't just think about the location and the fit up of the location, you have to figure out who's gonna actually provide the service on the ground. So that's the consideration that plays into all of this at, 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 every, at every turn. Right? And I do understand that and appreciate that. And that's one of the things that Worries me about the campsites too, because there's going to be labor to keep those running smoothly too. But uh, but I take a point taken, job. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dale Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, so you know, I'll, while I I can't support the amendment, I do understand the intent, and I think that um, if it's possible. You know, there's been so many advisory panels, so many commissions, and so many reports that sat on a shelf. And understanding where and how some of the recommendations have been enacted, I just wonder, perhaps, um, in one of the reports that comes back to us, would be able to see just a list of all of those uh, reports that have been there so that there is clarity around all the work that has been done. And I sincerely appreciate the work uh, of our staff and the outreach that they have done across Canada. It's, it, it, is, it is very impressive. Um, I've been on a lot of these provincial and national advisory panels, and sometimes it's an awful lot of work that people give off the side of their desk, and it becomes a report that sits on a shelf and is disappointing. So to bring them back to life for some of us that might not have been involved and have not been able to see them. I think that would be appreciated. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, we're on the uh, motion of uh, Councillor Purdy. Uh, Councillor Purdy, you. any last words before we go to the vote? Thank you, Councilor yes. Purdy. I have some last words and that's very appropriate um, saying, I guess right now, but 
Um, yeah, I certainly didn't mean to offend the amazing staff who've worked very, very hard on this. Um, I guess from my point of view, just reading the report, I'm just thinking this is, it seems just more of the same. I understand why we're getting such volatile emails of people who are just disgusted because like it, it doesn't seem like there's any forward motion. So um, I, I don't know, like what, what do you do? I certainly am not suggesting we get buildings in space without service providers. That is not at all wise or recommended by, by anyone. Um, but it, it, it feels very frustrating, the, the lack of, and I understand there's been a lot that we have done, I guess, and that has not been done before by council. So that apparent, that's a big, that's a big deal. So I don't know, what do you do? We just throw things out there that we think could be beneficial um, and see what happens. So thanks for your indulgence. Just, this is a big problem. It need yes, we need solutions ASAP. So. Okay, ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Beginning with District One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Uh, voting not in favor. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. Opposed. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councillor Austin. Against. Sorry, Councillor against. Thank you. Against. Six, Councillor Mancini. For voting against the amendment. Seven, Councillor Mason. Against. Eight, Councillor Smith. Eight. Sorry, Councillor, can you repeat that? Okay. Thank you. Nine, Councillor Clary. No. Ten, Councillor Morse. Against. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. No. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. Against the amendment. Thirteen, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting no. Fourteen, Councillor Blackburn. Voting against the motion. Fifteen, Councillor Russell. Against. Sixteen, Councillor Outhead. Voting no, but very nicely. Mayor Savage. Uh, opposed. Thank you. Okay, so the motion is defeated. Uh, thank you, Councillor Purdy. Deputy Mayor Lovelace, next on the main motion as amended once. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I just want to say uh, thanks to staff for hanging in with us. It's 20 after eight. And, you know, I really appreciate uh, all the work that you're doing. So uh, I'm hoping uh, that staff can kind of help me understand the administration of this. Um, you know, earlier when, when I asked the question about enforcement, um, you know, and it was, it was discussed that, you know, education is the first step. Um, I just that don't see that working. Uh, obviously, if we're going to limit uh, the number of people and the number of tents in a park site, then we're going to have to do that uh, by requesting private information from people to be able to actually, you know, in a sense, register them at that site. Um, and so I'm, I'm trying to understand how uh, staff envision that's actually being administered in a way um, that doesn't infringe upon uh, people's rights. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad to see that we've removed the one night stay, uh, but I'm still trying to understand, you know, how it is that, that, that this is going to be not only rolled out, um, but the envision for the actual administration of it. And as Councillor Daigle Gammon pointed out, you know, there's, there's no costing associ associated with this either. So that's my first question, if I can get that answered, and then I'll put a, an, a, an amendment on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, Mayor, to the Councillor. I mean, certainly um, similar to the situation that we have now, we, we have uh, staff, uh, either our own outreach staff or navigators who go out to sites and who request information from those who are experiencing homelessness and who are in our uh, parks in order to connect them with support. So this is consistent with the approach that we will be taking um, now, but the enforcement piece comes uh, in relation to 
should they refuse or be unable to be housed, that we would be looking to direct them to a different site. So, um, you know, there, there is a consistency, I think, in terms of what we're doing now um, related to collecting information um, in, for, of, of people who are, are housing or sheltering in parks. Um, so that's that remains consistent, um, but but it is about being able to redirect people um, to to designated sites. If, if um, wish, not to suggest to that go. there won't be compliance yeah. challenges. Um, right. Okay. No, I, I I thank you for that. And then you know I I did note earlier when I said that Mar Park works, and as uh, Councillor Cleary said, it doesn't work. I think what works is the community group that is actually working, uh, the, the community members who are working with the unhoused individuals and connecting them to resources, that's what works. And so I think, you know, my understanding from this report is that the hope is that staff is going to be, have a, be able to have a stronger understanding of what it is that those community supports could be or should be for those individuals who are staying in the park. Um, so, you know, and I just wanted to raise the point where the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing sent out his letter to the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities regarding, um, you know, the next 12 months uh, for their hope of what they're going to be doing through the service exchange um, uh, agreement and renegotiation and various other things. What wasn't in that, however, was anything to do with emergency shelters or housing or any kind of um, recognition uh, that we don't have enough emergency uh, shelters. So I would like to put an amendment, this would be number seven to the main motion that's currently on the floor. And that is, and I'll post it in the chat. And thank you for your indulgence colleagues. Uh, to direct the chief administrative officer to negotiate a memorandum of understanding with the province of Nova Scotia on supporting unsheltered residents in HRM and return to council with the MOU defining the roles of each order of government and specific actions to support and prevent homelessness in Halifax. I'll second that. Thank you so much, Councillor Cuddle. So we don't have anything like that right now. Uh, while I recognize that we've been working quite closely with the province, um, the deputy minister, you know, this is a new minister, a new deputy minister, a brand new government. I think this is the time right now is a great opportunity for us to actually get an MOU with them to formalize what those roles are, who is responsible for doing what, how we're going to prevent homelessness in the future, because keep in mind, those numbers are continuing to go up. Vancouver right now is at over 2,000 people, almost 2,100 people homeless living on the streets by count, right, by, by count number. Um, and to councillors, uh, Councillor Mason's point, yeah, there's, there's 80 right now, but as the weather warms, there will be more. Um, and as more people come in to Halifax looking for work and moving to Halifax from Montreal, from Toronto, from Cape Breton, and from what Yarmouth, uh, we're going to have more people struggling to find housing. So I think this is a good opportunity for us to formalize this relationship and get an MOU on paper uh, with this provincial government. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Before I go to the councillors, just want to see if CAO has any thoughts on it. You're muted. You're on mute, Chuck. Jacques. Chuck, you're muted. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Sorry about that. Um, so that conversation is going to happen in the conversations of, around the service exchange agreement. You know, our, our, at least my intention at this point is to have a separate service exchange agreement with the province of Nova Scotia, um, unique to HRM. Now that has not been decided at the provincial level, but that has been conversations going on between at, at a senior level and myself about this, right? So at the end of the day, there's gonna to have to be either a separate service by service uh, service agreement or MOU uh, that's, that, that affects HRM. Um, and there's gonna to have to be a service exchange agreement with the other municipalities uh, and or one that includes both HRM and all the municipalities that, that gives municipalities the opportunity to opt in or opt out of various subjects. So there's a whole, there's a lot of conversations that are that have to happen on that as to whether we need a separate one for HRM, whether it's one global one with municipalities, 
is opt-in, opt, up, up, you know, notwithstanding clauses, et cetera, right? So, you know, your point's well taken. There has to be some agreement there uh, that is going to deal with this because, you know, go back in history, this, you know, the service exchange agreement was premised originally on the on the basis of the problems of takeover housing. Well, we know where that's how that's evolved over time, and there's an, there's always an evolution in these things, right? When it comes down to provincial municipal relationships, there's always an evolution based on time uh, and based on growth in various areas. So, uh, absolutely, we need to have some kind of an MOU, um, and uh, that'll that will likely come through the 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 work of. Uh, the province and municipalities around the service exchange agreement, in my opinion. But, uh, you know, we could always try to get a separate one outside of that, but I doubt it would work. I think we'd have to follow the current process that governs all the embarked on. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Actually, I was going to say pretty much what the, the CEO just said, because I know he's sitting on the uh, on the committee, uh, looking at a new service exchange agreement with the province. So, you know, it would be more encompassing than just looking at homelessness. Uh, it would be housing in general. It would be all the other things. Uh, and, and if Jacques can get uh, the province to actually agree to that, uh, I'll buy him whatever his favorite bottle of scotch is. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, and that's on the record. Councillor Austin on the amendment. Uh, I mean, I kind of, uh, some of that's now been kind of answered there. Uh, I feel like this is jumping ahead a step. I mean, if we're going to go off to the one thing that, you know, we, we sometimes do a poor job of, if we're going to go ask the province for something, we should have a very clear idea of what we're asking for. And so I think that this, you know, if this was more an amendment to request a staff report, on what we would want to get from the province on this, I think that would be a better starting point rather than jumping to the to the step of like, well, let's run down the hill and see what we can get. Um, so uh, I think I won't support this, but uh, if it was amended, I I I, I could come around. Um, so that that would be my feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cuttle. You unmute, uh, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I, th I think this is something that needs to happen. And, and to your point, Sam, it would be nice to um, see a report on that so we get an idea of what would be contained in that MOU and have a second set of eyes on it, um, you know, from what we're experiencing in our own communities. But, you know, this whole issue of homelessness is something that continues to fall through the cracks. So even though, you know, we, they might be at the table talking about housing, homelessness becomes this, it's, it's not tethered, it's, it's kind of, nebulous in, in where homelessness happens, who it happens to, how it happens and how it is supported. And so I think having something specific that addresses homelessness, because we know that it ends up impacting our communities, it impacts individuals, um, it impacts our city, our city as a whole, our businesses. Um, and in this case, you know, what we're doing here at council, the amount of time, money, effort that we're putting into talking about an issue that seems to have no clear um, solutions. And as well, you know, this passing of the buck back and forth between whose responsibility is this? Where is the funding going to come from? Um, it, it's just, you know, we're going around in circles. So, um, you know, as a, you know, as a starting point, I think um, I, this is a great direction to go. Um, I do agree. And I think, um, like Councillor Lovelace, I don't know if you'd come back and consider that a friendly amendment to um, put uh, in a, having this come to us first as a staff report. But um, I am I am happy to see something with some clear direction well, that will help us help us get to a point of having some clear direction on um, homelessness in our city. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, um, I don't have a challenge with the, the amendment. I, I just think I have a challenge with being a part of this motion. Uh, I'm concerned uh, if staff could speak to it. If this is part of this overall motion, does that slow down getting this uh, next uh, phase back to us? This, uh, so that's my concern. Uh, I'm feeling it should be a motion of itself. And as a couple of my colleagues have already said, maybe entertain a staff report, but it, 
rather than being an amendment of the existing motion, should it be separate? So the staff would speak to that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Who would like that, Jock or? Uh, well, look, if the motion is, as presented passes, then it would be dealt with separately anyway, to the extent that it's not on the same timeline as we're talking about. Right now we have a crisis and we have an issue that we have to deal with in the short term. Um, so, you know, something like some, an MOU of that nature would likely take uh, about the same time as it's going to take to get the MOU, the, the service exchange agreement, <laughs> negotiated with the province, right? And that could be a year, it could be two years, who knows? Uh, and somebody said to me the other day, they're likely, it might be longer than that. But anyway, we're going to try to get it done soon, but it all depends on, on the willingness of both parties to come to an agreement. And, and the fact that, you know, we have a lot of municipalities, a lot of voices involved in the selection on service exchange agreement, which which causes causes a little cause delay, so it's a separate kind of a separate issue anyway, uh, and would likely be dealt with uh, uh, separate from some of the and parts of these. This main motion are 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 not on the same timeline either, right? Necessarily. Just want to make sure on that, Mr. Debay. It sounds it sounds good to me. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I I actually agree and hope that the friendly amendment of a staff report uh, might be acceptable to our deputy mayor. But I also have a question um, for you, Jacques, in that should this, and it, Councillor Mancini came close to what I thought I was gonna ask, but um, what is the impact of that on the work that you, if this is, is goes forward on the service exchange agreement and the committee that you're on? Um, does it impact it negatively? Does it put up a barrier in any way? Um, just trying to figure out how your work stays fluid on that committee. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to, to the councillor, um, the service exchange agreement committee, so-called, is, is, is just in its infancy. It, it's, it's had a couple of meetings, one an introductory meeting, uh, and uh, and now there the next meeting there's one other meeting coming up. Uh, there's going to be the third meeting of this group, where the the elected officials who have the deciding you know, or have voting rights on this committee. I'm there as an advisor, as are some of my colleagues, uh, CEOs across Nova Scotia, uh, have decided they want to do a survey. So there will be a certain amount of survey work and all that. So this. You know, this is going to take some time before we, because survey is really designed to try to ferret out what the issues are across Nova Scotia's municipalities. And housing will be clearly one of those things. You know, roads will be another one, uh, recreation. Uh, you know, go right down the list of all the services that are that are uh, provided by municipalities and uh, some of the pressures that we're all facing in terms of cost and revenue. Uh, those, those will all be ferreted out as part of the survey, and then, then, you know, discussion papers and white papers and those types of things will likely be generated and, and socialized across you know, all the municipalities. Presumably, you know, at some point, this committee has to come up with recommendations and advice to the government, and that has to be based on informed decisions and, and actual data and research and, and analyses and, and all that by professional people. So, you know, I, I think uh, at the end of the day, that's where we are, uh, but it's so it wouldn't necessarily delay anything. It's, a, it's a kind of a separate issue, but it's one of the buckets within a lar larger analysis of uh, who's responsible for what in, in relation to the municipalities and their, and their dealings with the problems, right? How does that work and how does it all get funded? Right? So it's just part of that whole narrative and discussion going forward in my view. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Lovelace. Uh, thank you so much. Mayor. Yes. Mayor. <laughs> thank you. Um, so, you know, Jacques, I'm just having a little bit of difficulty um, understanding, uh, uh, you know, your um, approach uh, because homelessness is not a municipal mandate. That is not what we do but it is what we are being forced to do. And that service exchange agreement, if there is a download for two municipalities, I want an MOU. I wanna understand specifically what the province is coming to the table at, to, to do, what their role is, what their commitment is. Um, we're in this mess because the province didn't create shelter beds. And again, I'll reiterate, this is not our role. 
but we don't have a definition of what our role is because we're in uncharted waters. And so I, I'm suggesting that, uh, well, I understand we're doing service exchange and, and I'm having those conversations with NSFM and there's all kinds of information and, and, and detailed analysis as to what's going into that service exchange agreement. And I sincerely appreciate the work that you're doing with that uh, committee. But homelessness, this is, this is a humanitarian crisis right now in our city. And we have to fully understand what the province, what mom and dad over there in province house are expecting us to do, what the residents are expecting us to do, what commercial businesses are expecting us to do. More importantly, what those who, you know, those people who are living unhoused, what they are expecting us to do. And so I'd like to, I, I'm, I'm going to put this forward and thank you colleagues. Yes, I'll put that, that, that staff report in there. It's in there. I put it in the chat. And I do hope that you support this um, because whether it takes a year or 18 months, at the end of the day, we need to understand what our role is and what that partnership looks like with the problems of Nova Scotia. Thank you, colleagues. Okay. So the deputy mayor has a revised her motion slightly. It's in the chat. Number seven, ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Meeting with District Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. Um, against. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. A voting in favor of the amendment. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Sure. And Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the amendment? 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the amendment. 15, Councilor Russell. Against. 16, Councilor Outhit. Voting no. Mayor Savage. I'll vote yes to a staff report. One, Councilor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Thank you. Okay, that passes. So now we have two amendments. We have replaced number three and we've added number seven. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. So just so people know where we are on the list, there's, I have uh, 26 people lined up to speak um, in this order. Councillor Austin, Councillor Kent, Councillor Daigle Gammon for a second time, and Councillor Smith and Councillor Mason for a third. Oh, sorry, that's five so far. Uh, Councillor Smith and Mason for a second time, Councillor Austin, Kent, and Daigle Gammon for a second time. If I've missed anybody, let me know. Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I just have a few questions. Uh, colleagues have been scratching off a bunch of them here for me. Um, so uh, before I start, I want to I want to just uh, in the same way that Councillor Mancini floated uh, Shannon Park, um, you know, in on in my district, a place that I've been thinking about is uh, Dartmouth Cove because it is unused. It's been vacant forever and it's not, I mean, there's nothing immediately happening there. I know Develop Nova Scotia is working on it. Um, the part that I'm thinking, I know that the chunk of it is contaminated site, but there is a hillside there with some uh, that's forested and people have already encamped there in the past. And so it's, you know, if we're looking for lo locations with uh, uh, that other orders of government own, uh, I would plug that one for staff's consideration as they proceed with that next chunk of the motion because there could be potential there. Um, I wanted to ask about the shelter piece. Um, and I know the report indicates there's still work to be done here. Um, I'm wondering if staff have some any indication where we might go because one of the big riddles we're going to have is it's well, all well and good to designate some sites, but what about structures there that um, get put up that don't meet the building code? And beyond that, is there any consideration on our end to whether or not we should provide um, shelters in the same way that the Catholic Church 
uh, has done through that project where they've basically stripped down a, a shelter to its core elements to make to make it safe um, because it is going to be a bit of a challenge at these spots. Through you, Mayor, to the councillor on this on the second question first, uh, that's something that we'll be looking at for, for bringing back in the final report. It's a complicated uh, question. The, the reason the church sites were successful was because they could be considered to be accessory uh, because churches have traditionally had uh, a shelter function associated with them. Uh, and and because of the the supports that the the congregations can can provide, so but that's certainly a question that we're we're interested in in and uh, and looking at to uh, to bring back on the final um, analysis uh, on the question of of shelters. Um, our our position, I think, on that is is as it has been, is that our first effort is still to. Um, try and get people housed. Uh, if a shelter is vacated, then we would certainly move to uh, to remove it, and that's um, how we're how we're, we will continue to to approach those uh, those sites that we uh, attempt to to get people housed or or moved from the the shelters that aren't in suitable locations or that aren't um, and that aren't uh, occupied and and to take them out. But uh, but that will. Um, no question remain a, remain a challenge, but that's that continues to be a place. So. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask about um, site supports. Uh, I know we've talked about washrooms and water, and the report talks about a dry box um, potentially. Um, are we also talking like a uh, garbage removal on a regular basis? And, um, you know, the here, and this one is a bit of a thorny one, but I mean, it's you're talking harm reduction, um, a safe box potentially for needles. Yes, so definitely uh, garbage collection. We um, we 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 would like to engage with. There have been some discussions uh, with Mainline in the past, and we'd like to re-engage there to ensure that um, we're sort of doing sweeps as, as needed, but also uh, to look at safe boxes uh, to get them on on sites. Absolutely. Okay, uh, and my last question: uh, How would we? How, how do we pretend, how does this roll out? Like, I mean, if if we say, yes, this is the way we want to go, we come up with a list of sites that you bring forward. Um, like the next day we don't turn around and rush out to every park where someone's in an on-designated spot and say, you have to move now. I'm assuming we would be engaging with people individually. And if there are moves that we would, that we basically be doing this in a sort of a phased kind of a way. That's correct. I mean, there's a series of, of things, including sort of some, in some cases, some site preparation, there are um, communications materials, there's signage, there's different steps. Uh, so Max sort of highlighted some of those in the presentation. So there are pieces that we need to put in place. I think the additional uh, time to come back to council with um, a sort of a, another iteration of the uh, of the site list gives us the opportunity to advance some of those pieces at the same time, um, and then yes, in terms of how we would uh, we would approach um, sort of actually approach uh, people in parks would be would have to be to be staged um, simply from a, a capacity perspective and and ability to to move folks. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Oh, it's getting late, isn't it? Um, so three minutes. So quickly, just thank you to everybody who has contributed by phone calls and by emails. You know, some of the emails are a little bit difficult to read. Uh, when somebody uses profanity, it's hard to go past that uh, and see it. But uh, for the most part, I would say of the well over 100 emails, and I read every one, um, it's really interesting that there is so much care and compassion for persons who find themselves without a home and that we need to find a plan. And so uh, I wanna say thank you to everybody for all of that. Um, I have a concern around the enforcement and what that means. And so the plan that's gonna come back that's going to outline that a little bit better is appreciated. While I say that, I also wanna say though that we do know that there are things that happened in some of the sites where it did require a police response. And so um, that cannot be um, excused either. So where police response is needed, it does have to happen. And so we need to be patient to understand all sides of what that might look like. So I think that's important. If there's a homeless summit, sign me up. 
I want to come. I think that that would be an awesome uh, idea. I'm really worried about the compliance officers. I'm worried that three compliance officers with one supervisor, is that enough? Once this comes to fruition and we have this, uh, again, I'm going to talk about that trauma-informed care and the time that it takes to do that. So if three is proven to be not enough and it can't meet the demand, we don't want to set up our staff for failure either. How quickly can we increase that to be able to meet the need and so that we don't compromise our staff either? So I, I'm, I'm really worried about that. And I would really like to know um, a little bit more about the contribution agreement with the United Way and what that might look like. Will that be flushed out in the second report that we get? Um, so that those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, who wants that one? Maggie? Uh, through you, Mayor, to the Councillor, on the contribution agreement, we have uh, typically a standard contribution agreement um, that we that we use with organizations. We have uh, an estimate of, of costs from the United Way uh, based on, on uh, a series of, of um, meetings with uh, those who are um, who have lived experience. So we have sort of a, a, a bit of a sense from them as to what that that will look like and what the cost would be and and so it would be a standard contribution agreement that we would uh, that we would have associated with that and that's approximately I think a cost of approximately twenty thousand dollars that I've indicated that's within our budget. Will the report talk about scope as well as procedure and objectives? Um, I, I, standard agreements are all good and well but I am concerned about what the scope is um, and the limitations of what that agreement might be and what the expectations are. We can provide some additional detail when we come back, um, but but certainly, you know, we we want to stand that up as as soon as we reasonably can in order to get that um, that underway. So, uh, you know, I think what we're looking at is to inform sort of our immediate uh, immediate next steps in this area um, through that uh, that group from the United Way. Um, but but certainly, you know, I hope that we'll be back uh, very quickly to council with this, so we can provide some more additional detail if that would be helpful to council. Thank you. And just the question about how quickly we could increase the support to the compliance officers if needed. Um, I'll have to uh, to speak with compliance about that, but they are they have indicated they're prepared to uh, bring more staff on board as needed. They they know that that's uh, something they need to be ready for, um, and so they will they are uh, standing by uh, to understand what the what the needs are there. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I'll get down in the weeds a little bit here. Uh, so with Councillor Mason's amendment, uh, staff have committed to coming back, having another look at those short-term sites, the, 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 what would have been the over, just single overnight sites. But for the long-term sites, because I, I had four suggested in my area, or proposed in my area, uh, and one was a, a long-term site, and that would be the, the Ravenscraig. So it's not the Ravenscraig Park uh, area where the sports field and the playground is. It was the wooded area close to Frog Pond off the Purcells Cove Road. And looking at pages six and seven at the criteria, which I agree with, like, you know, uh, prohibiting placement of encampments near schools, daycares, adult care facilities, sports fields, uh, horticultural displays, cemeteries, uh, environmentally, culturally sensitive areas, et cetera. Um, I might also suggest that we avoid wooded areas. And I'll tell you why. So I, I went down and I looked at this uh, yesterday. Um, and in addition to, I mean, there's some ecologically sensitive stuff. There's snapping turtles in there because there's a small pond on one side and a large uh, lake or the small lake on the other side. And they're vulnerable uh, or actually, what do they, they call them? Species of concern here in Canada. Um, and it is... 500 meters from a school and it is on a, a bike path and a walking path to the school. So, I mean, that's covered in here, but more importantly, as we went in, uh, there's still a lot of uh, downfall from uh, hurricanes Dorian and Juan uh, going that far back. And so open spaces, when we think of the by High Park, when we think of uh, Saunders Park, Chocolate Lake, if it's the, the baseball diamond, if you think of other places, they're more open. Um, going into a wooded area, because there are no clearings that, in that area, I would fear that, A, because they're going to be a little bit of a distance off the road and they're going to be slightly secluded, you know, who knows what they're going to get up to. And, and if you're camping, you're probably going to have a fire. Uh, we could have a serious 
issue of forest fire and, and spread in the community. And down that area, you know, we've got the Shaw Wilderness Park just up the street from that. And then you've got the areas uh, beyond in the backlands that did have a fire. Uh, gosh, I can't remember what it was, you know, 15 or more years ago now. But I would hate to see a repeat of that. So anyway, if staff would, when they're considering the locations and maybe add to the criteria, uh, uh, you know, maybe not in wooded areas uh, uh, for the risk of fire would be something that I would like to see when it comes back in that report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Okay, colleagues. Councillor. Um, okay, I've got Councillor uh, Mason and then Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Mason. Uh, I'm actually, I think we have the amendment on the floor, sir. I'm not on this. I'm on the, when, uh, I'm on a second amendment. What amendment is on the floor? Um, no amendment. Yeah. Did we vote on Pam's thing? Yeah, we did. Sorry. Yes. I'm talking. Uh, yes. you right. You your Wheaties. We voted, uh, we voted on that back That's in the first all right, here's the thing you, uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Lovelace asked us to do. I changed the wording a bit. So uh, we would amend number six, which reads direct the CO to return to council subsequent report with additional analysis and recommendations for actions. Uh, it would emphasize this by adding, including a timeline and a plan for supporting the transition education and implementation that is led and delivered by civilian HRM staff. I so move that amendment. Second. Second by Councillor Cleary Lovelace, uh, so, Councillor Mason. So the intention of this, I mean, part of it is is probably pretty self-evident. We all know that when crime happens, when criminal code stuff happens, the police are going to get involved, and and that's just how it is. And I think that's appropriate. But you know, because of August eighteenth, we have a lot of people in the community who are understandably concerned that we're going to be uh, leading any enforcement actions. Uh, as we transition to this new uh, uh, procedure that's outlined in Max's and, and Parks and Rec's proposal uh, by going straight to policing. And, and what we've heard over and over again today is that's not the case and that's not the intention of staff at all. But I feel that it's, it's worthwhile for us to very clearly say that we want a timeline and a plan for, for how this is going to work. I think we're all kind of comfortable with compliance officers, but we all recognize there aren't enough of them. I think we're very comfortable with social workers. We only employ one of them. So I'm really interested to see how we can make this work, how we can bring other resources in. We've said before in other meetings, I don't think in a formal council meeting, we have people with social work background in the library system, in Parks and Rec, and even in other departments. Are there people in the organization interested in a six month or one year secondment to this project? How do we make sure we have enough people? Uh, so, uh, uh, and I am tired. So if council colleagues would like to amend this for clarity, I'm all for it, but uh, I'd ask council to support the motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, uh, Councillor Cuddle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and, and thank you, Wei. I mean, it was one of the questions I asked in my um, opening comments on this was about uh, timelines and implementation. Um, one of the things I'm wondering about in this is that, you know, we're asking that it be led and deliver, delivered by civilian HRM staff. And to your point, um, our capacity in, in this is is rather limited at the moment. And while we do know we have some additional um, support workers, I'm also wondering again about the roles our stakeholder partners um, can play in this. You know, we talked earlier about um, organizations like MOSH, um, but in kind of identifying what stakeholder partners we have and how we can engage them in helping us deliver this work because there's a lot of people out there with the expertise with the experience um, you know I think it was to uh, Councillor Kent's comments earlier around you know it, it's not this isn't um, this isn't a job for anybody and everyone you know this is like um, you know people go to school for this uh, they're trained in this they they have experience um, working in this field and um, you know, I just think it's important that that we, you know, we, we've said we can't do this alone. Um, and what, how, you know, what opportunities are there 
to engage um, with our with our stakeholder partners to ensure this is a success. And you know, I, I think we all admit that you know we're tr- we're we're taking um we're taking a chance here. This is a the, the best of a bad plan, uh, bad plans. But um, but you know, we really it is those partners. Um, I. I think whose experience we need to lean on, um, particularly now, and and see if they're willing to be partners in helping making this work. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Purdy. Thank you. Um, I just want to say how disappointed I am that after all this time, this is the best solution that we can come up with more encampments on municipal parkland close to schools, uh, trails. It's very disappointing. Having said that, uh, I do support this amendment. And I do appreciate everyone's input in trying to make a bad situation better. Um, but I do not support this uh, encampment strategy. It's not sustainable. It doesn't work. I've never read an article on any encampment site across North America that has a good outcome. So I'm not sure why this is, is being suggested other than a crisis situation and it's a crisis supposedly short-term solution, but um, Anyway, I will be supporting this amendment, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm happy to support this. I think that, I mean, we have talked a lot this evening about the detail and really this is getting to the crux of the detail. I believe that it's, it's the, it, there's, there's so many questions I feel like we still have. I, I, I absolutely wanna see us be able to move forward with, forward with creating some uh, immediate solutions, but we need to do it in a way that is um, putting our best foot forward. I don't want it to take, you know, I'm hoping we can have a, a quicker turnaround here than normal, um, not normal, I, that sounds terrible. Then, then uh, you know, we, need, we just need to move on this. And I think we can all agree on, on, on some of that. We'll see in the vote, but um, this kind of, uh, uh, I feel like these, this, this says the opportunity for staff to come back with answering those questions around compliance and, and the, the, the way to move forward in a way that's compassionate and respectful of, of, of the, the residents that we are serving. Also respectful and, and, and understanding for us to get a sense of the, the collaborative uh, bodies that we need to have at the table and that we have engaging with us. It's important to come in with, with a true commitment to, to those and um, to working collaboratively. We're gonna resolve these kinds of situations as, as uh, partners in the community, not in silos. Um, there's no one right answer. We, we need to, to dive into it. We, all, we wanna set this up for success. Our residents need us to, our home, our, our house need us to. So this I think gets there. I'll leave it at that and I'm happy to support it. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, um, Councillor Mason. I just wonder if uh, I could make a recommendation, a uh, friendly amendment to your motion. I'd oh. like to, yeah, oh, thank you. Uh, would you consider the term, uh, just, just changing it a little bit to say transition of people? Because I think we have to humanize this approach, right? We are, we are, what we're talking about is we're moving people. Um, and so I, I just want staff to make sure that, that this is just for clarity. Thank you, Councillor. Sure, that's, uh, that could be friendly for me. Okay, that's a friendly amendment that's amended, that's adopted. So it'll be transition of people. Okay, are we ready for the question on the amendment of Councillor Mason? Question. Beginning with District 3, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the amendment. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the amendment. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Clary. Yes. 
10, Councilor Morris. In favor. 11, Councilor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councilor Stoddard. In favor of the amendment. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councilor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the amendment. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor. 16, Councilor Outhit. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councilor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. And two, Councilor Hensby. Affirmative. Thank you. That's uh... Carrie, thank you very much, colleagues. Um, Deputy, on the main motion, as we've amended it, uh, Deputy Mayor, did you have something good. else? You're I'm good. good. I, I just wanted to make sure that that was initiated and Councillor Mason did a good job. <laughs> Okay, I think, we, uh, I think we're all done. So the question is, how do we vote on this? Um, it was requested that we vote on these individually, correct? So I'm just gonna see if, if we might be able to group some of these. So I want you to pay attention now, folks. I know we're all tired, it's getting close to supper time. Um, can we vote on one and two together? Yes. Uh, or can we, can we vote on, is number, th so number, th Three. Okay, One, just two, go back four, to the motion. Number three has been replaced with an amended motion. Number six has been amended, and we've added number seven. seven. Correct. Yes. So, what is the can I can I just ask? A, I, I was trying to ask about uh, some of those, um, and I'm just wondering if now would be an opportunity to do that. We have three of them that say direct the CAO to continue doing something. And my recollection, and I might be mistaken on this, is that only one of those is something that we have directed. The, other th are, the others are two things that he has initiated on his own. Um, if we direct him to continue doing a thing that we have already directed him to do, does that change anything? Does that need to be in there? And if we direct him, and if we vote against that amendment, or vote against that, that item, item one. Um, what does that do? Does that direct him to stop doing it? Or does that not direct him to continue doing this thing that we've already directed him to do? I'm just, I'm not sure. Okay. I think that clears things up. Uh, I, I have no idea. I don't, I don't know. You're saying that we're directing him to do something he hasn't been directed to do already? I think two and three, if I'm not mistaken, we have not directed him to do. He has taken the initiative and, and, and is doing them. But, uh, um, but item one, I think we have directed him to do. And with this, we would be directing him to continue doing this thing that he has been directed to do. Or we would be not directing him to continue doing this thing that he has been directed to do. So I'm just not sure about the logic of that. Rejecting the motion is what you're saying. We're just reaffirming uh, to request him to do the work that we've already asked him to do for number one. Let me ask, yeah, let me just ask if, John. If, again, if the, look, look, folks, if, we're, the motion we're not arguing about the, if, we're, if we're not arguing about the content, just arguing about the language. Let's ask John or Jacques. Does, do, you, do you get Councillor Russell's point, and is it something we need to worry about at this point in time? Yes, I know. Probably not something we need to worry about. In Who's that? Still can't hear you, John. Okay, sorry. Is sorry, that John talking? Yeah, sorry, it's me. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think the fact that we're all very tired and hungry at this point, and most of the, most of the people on my staff have, <laughs> have not had, even had, uh, had, had their supper yet. But notwithstanding that fact, I think, I think we could debate whether or not this direction should or shouldn't happen now. But I think in, 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 the, in the interest of simplicity and, and speed, I would suggest you leave the motions as they are. You know, simply reaffirm some of these things, reaffirm council's direction to the CAO, it makes it crystal clear as to what you want me to do or continue to do. And you have um, the other um, the other amendments that are added to that. So I, I think we, I think in the interest of time, I think we just, uh, my advice would be to continue with the motions as finally adopted. Now, I think we have now seven or eight parts to it and um, go, go on that basis. I think councillor, Purdy has asked 
that's item three only be separated. Yeah, no, I'll take that. I'll take care of that. I just yeah. want to. I just want to make sure we're not double negativing something to counter the Russell's point. So I take your point. I think you're probably correct. We are probably tired and hungry, but we all have a place to sleep tonight, and there are some that don't, and that's why we're uh, taking care of all of this stuff. We're trying to do the best that we possibly can. So, um, what I'm is anybody opposed to me voting on one, two, four, five, six, and the new seven all together, and just voting on three? separately is that satisfy everybody in the in the room can i see thumbs up or thumbs down i'd like so to see two and four done separate i'd like to see two and four done separately so from my perspective it can be three two and four and the rest of them okay that's your that's your right as a counselor so we're going to vote on one five six seven then we're going to vote on two and four and then we're going to vote on three Thank you. Okay, is everybody understood? So we'll start off by voting on, uh, and Ian, if I'm wrong on this, you tell me, but we're gonna vote on one, five, six, and seven right now, all together, the new seven. That is correct, Mayor Savage, I've posted that in the chat. Thank you, that's what we're voting on first of all, one, five, six, and seven. Everybody cool? I wanna make sure nobody's, that I haven't lost anybody. Okay, let's go to the vote on that, Ian. One, five, Strength. six, and seven. Beginning with District 4, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Tuttle. In favor of the motion. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Councillor Outhit. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. And three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Thank you. So that's carried. We'll now vote on two and four together. Are we ready for the question on two and four together? Question. Beginning with District 5, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Ten, Councillor Morse. In favor. Eleven, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. Twelve, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. Thirteen, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. Fourteen, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. Against. 16, Councillor Outhit. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. In favor. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. And four, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. Thank you. So two and four have passed. We will now vote on. Number three. Are we ready for the question on number three? Question. question. Just give you a chance to get organized here. Beginning with District Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor of the motion. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. Against. 16, Councillor Outhit. Voting yes. 
Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gannon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Curdy. Voting no. And five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Thank you. Okay, so colleagues, that's passed. Items uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the seven have passed uh, colleagues. Um, and I truly appreciate uh, the respect that everybody has for everybody's opinion and the respect that people have to try to do the right thing. I want to, we, so we're in committee of the whole, we're gonna go back into regular council. I, I'm, I know it's getting late and um, I'm wondering if we need to go in camera on some of these items, whether we can pass any of them without, I don't want people to go, I don't want people to just vote for them because they are tired. I want you to look at the in camera and see if this, these are things that we can pass without going in camera. I know it's been suggested a 10 minute break. I'd like to see if we could just kind of keep going and uh, either finish this off or if we can't get it done tonight, we'll deal with it. Um, can folks, right. can, what, what do I need okay. to do to go back into, um, back into regular council, uh, Ian? Mayor Savage, that procedural motion that was passed was just for that item. We waived the rules. The item has been voted on. We are in regular council. There is no motion that is required. Oh my gosh, you're some good, Ian. You're some good. All right. Um, <laughs> Keep going, Mr. So, Mayor. Keep going. <laughs> let's see what we can do. I've, uh, does somebody want to move uh, Count Deputy Mayor on 17.1? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I move uh, that the in camera in private minutes of February 8th, 15th, February 23 and 25, Budget Committee, March 22nd, and April 5th, 2022, be approved as circulated. Second. Seconded. Second by Councillor Cleary. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That is carried. The Deputy Mayor, you want to try to move 17 2? Certainly. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential report dated April 25th, 2022, and 2 direct that uh, the report and confidential uh, report dated April 25th, 2022 be maintained private and confidential. Seconded. Second. Seconded by Councillor Blackburn or Russell. Right. Ready for the question on 17.2? Question. Question. Be beginning with District 7, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Sorry, Councillor. Yes. Thank you. 10, Council Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Councillor Oathit. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor. Two, Councillor Hensby. Barbara Neff. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. And six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Thank you. So I, I see somebody wants 17.3 in camera. So um, let's see what else we can do. We, we uh, And then I'll ask the CAO or somebody how urgent some of these are and whether we could do these at the next uh, council meeting. Sean, go ahead and move 17.4, Sean. 17.4, who wants to move that? Uh, Sean, uh, Councillor Cleary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll test my colleagues on that one. Um, so I move that Halifax Regional Council one adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential report dated May 3rd, 2022, and two direct that the private and confidential report dated May 3rd, 2022 be maintained private and confidential. Second it. Second that. Yep. Okay. Ready for the question. Question. Beginning with District 8, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. And Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 
14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Councillor Othit. Voting yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councillor Daigle Gannon. Voting in favor. Two, Councillor Hensby. Absolutely affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. And seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Thank you. That motion carries. I see that uh, Councillor Austin, you're going to move 17-5 if nobody needs to go in camera to discuss. Uh, happy to try my luck, Mr. Mayor. Thank uh, you. I move that uh, Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential report dated March 9th, 2022, and 2 direct that the private and confidential report dated March 9th, 2022 be maintained private and confidential. Second, Nancy. Ready for the question, colleagues, on 17.5? Question. question. Beginning with District 9, Councillor Cleary. Yes. And Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor of the motion. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Yipper doodle, voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. In favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Councillor Otit. Yes. Mayor Savage. Yes. One, Councillor Dagle Gannon. Voting in favor of the motion. Two, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. Voting yes. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. Voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. And eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Thank you. That uh, carries. Um, Clerk, you might be the best one. 17.3, we need to deal with that tonight. Uh, it would be very appreciated if that could be dealt with tonight. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Probably we do need to do that. Do we need to ratify what we did in Committee of the Whole, or was that just on the uh, speaking rule? So? It was just for procedures for the debate, of, for the purposes of debate, we were still in council. I'm going to, was there any other, is there anything uh, added that I've missed, uh, Ian? There is no added items. We have one remaining in-camera item and notices of motion. I'm going to go to notices of motion. Um, uh, 17.3. Uh, notices of motion, Councillor Russell. No, we need to do 17.3, do we not? We're going to go in camera for 17.3. Okay, sorry, my apologies. No problem. Councillor Russell? Thank you. Take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move amendments to Administrative Order 2014 015-ADM respecting uh, reserve funding strategies, the purpose of which is to update the reserve business cases to best take advantage of and respond to future growth issues and other housekeeping amendments. And secondly, take notice that at a future meeting, meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move first reading of proposed bylaw P509 respecting parking meters and pay stations for the regulation of parking of vehicles left standing in the Halifax Regional Municipality, the purpose of which is to increase the parking ticket fee fine amount from $35, $30 if paid in seven days, to $45, $40 if paid in seven days. Thank you. Councillor Cuttle, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I propose to request a staff report with corresponding amendments to Administrative Order 2018-003 ADM, the Private Road Maintenance maintenance cost recovery administrative order, the purpose of which is to include procedures for private road area rates to be approved in instances where the road ownership cannot be determined. Thank you very much. Deputy Mayor. Oh, that's awesome. Good one, Councillor Cuddle. 
Uh, take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to propose amendments to one, Administrative Order 2018-003 ADM, respecting private road maintenance, and two, Administrative Order 2019-005 ADM, respecting the establishment and use of community area rates in HRM. The purpose of which is to approve area rates and uniform charges for fiscal year 2022-23, including community area rates, private road area rates, and business improvement districts. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Take notice at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to propose amendments to for approval to Administrative Order 12, respecting the appointment of traffic authority, the purpose of which is to repeal and replace the appointment of the deputy traffic authority. Okay, colleagues, thank you very much. Now we're gonna, we do have one item to go do in camera and we, it is time sensitive. So we're gonna do it tonight. If somebody wants to move that we'll go in camera. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry. I had a notice of motion as well. Okay, Councillor Morris. Thank you. Take notice that at a future meeting of Halifax Regional Council, I intend to move a motion to rescind item 11.9.3 from the August 17th, 2021 Regional Council meeting, which requested a staff report as follows, that Halifax Regional Council direct the CAO to write a report, which will recommend the optimum percentage of HRM's annual budget to be dedicated to climate mitigation and adaptation measures for a minimum of the next three years. The report will provide recommendations to prioritize the most cost-effective municipal investments in net zero infrastructure, including but not limited to transportation, forest and land conservation and other nature-based solutions, conversion of public buildings to low carbon heating and cooling and related HRM staff positions. The report will also include a range of financing options, tax implications and timelines for achieving HRM's climate goals. Thank you. Thank you. Does somebody want to move to go in camera? Move. I so move. Councillor <laughs> Kent, seconded by Councillor Stoddard, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Aye. colleagues, we will uh, go in the other screen, right, to Ian? Yeah, you have an in-camera Teams appointment. We will be returning to this meeting for ratification after the in-camera session is over. Thank you.
Good evening, Council will be returning from the in-camera session and we'll be joining this Zoom meeting momentarily. The holding screen can come down and mics and cameras can be returned to all members. Okay, looks like we're okay to go, maybe. Mayor Savage, you are good to go. Okay, colleagues, we're gonna ratify the extensive work that we did in camera. I'm gonna to go to Councillor Cleary to put 17.3 on the floor. Happy to, Mr. Mayor. I move that Halifax Regional Council will adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential report dated April 25th, 2022, and two, direct that the private and confidential report dated April 25th, 2022 be maintained private and confidential. Second. 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 Deputy Mayor, ready for the question, colleagues? Question. question. Beginning with District 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. In favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. In favor of the motion. 13, Deputy Mayor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 16, Councillor Otit. Mayor Savage. In favor. 1, Councillor Daigle Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. 2, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Three, Councillor Kent. In favor. Four, Councillor Purdy. In favor. Five, Councillor Austin. In favor. Six, Councillor Mancini. We're voting in favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. And nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, that uh, motion is carried. That brings us to. Um, yeah, that brings us uh, to the end of, uh, of our agenda. Well, thank you all uh, for your contributions today. And uh, I'm prepared to accept a motion to adjourn. We'll meet again in two weeks. Let's adjourn. Councillor Purdy says adjourn. We adjourn. Thank you all very much. Have a good